Pastor. The House will come to order. Please join Representative Bacon in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mr. Sheeble, please call the roll. Representatives Amabile, Bacon, Baisley, Representative Baisley is excused, Benavidez. Was there else you Rep. Benavidez is excused, Burnett. Representative Burnett is excused, Bird. Bockenfeld is excused, Basenecker. Bradfield, Caraveo, Carver. Catlin, Cutter, Doherty, Representative Doherty is excused. Duran. Okay. Where is that for? I'm a state legislator. Duran. Oh, okay. Esgar. Exum. Good morning, sir. Froelich. Geithner. Uh, Rep. Geithner is excused. Gonzalez Gutierrez. Gray. Representative Gray is excused. Hanks. Herod. Holtorf. Hooten. Representative Hooten is excused. Judah. Kennedy. Kip. Rep. Kip. Oh, Larson. Lindsey. Lantine. Luck. Lynch. McCluskey. Is here. McCormick. McKean. McLaughlin. Michelson. Janae. Mullica. Representative Amulica is excused. Neville Ortiz hey! Pelton Pico Ransom Rich Ricks yeah. Roberts Sandridge Sirota Snyder Soper Representative Soper is excused. Sullivan. Tipper. Representative Tipper. Excused. Titone. Hey. Valdez A. Is excused. Valdez D. Van Beber. Van Winkle. Weissman. Will. Williams. Woodrow. Representative Woodrow is excused. Woog. Young. And Mr. Speaker. Yeah, Doherty, Burnett, Baisley. Benavides. Fifty-six present, nine excused. We have a quorum. Representative Bacon. <laughs> Representative Bacon. Mr. Speaker, I move that the Journal of Tuesday, April 26, 2022, be approved as corrected by the Chief Clerk. 
Members, it's Wednesday. You've heard the motion. This is a very important motion for those in the gallery. <laughs> that the journal be approved as corrected by the chief clerk. All those in favor say aye. Aye! All those opposed, no. No! no. Looking to the gallery, I think they agree with me. The ayes have it. The motion's approved. <laughs> Representative Weissman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, judiciary members, this is just a reminder that because of the modified calendar this week, we are not meeting in judiciary uh, today. Uh, however, if anybody would like to get together later and talk about the rule against perpetuities for a couple hours, we could arrange that. Thank you. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you. I have a couple things today. Uh, first of all, House education. The calendar is correct, so I will see you there. Um, second of all, I... Um, I have permission to be excused um, Friday afternoon and Wednesday morning. And third of all, I have a tribute today, please. Uh, members, we have a tribute. Please direct your attention to the well. Mr. Schiebel. State of Colorado. The Senate and House of Representatives convened in the 73rd General Assembly hereby extends congratulations to Julie Pellegrin on her retirement from the Office of Legislative Legal Services. On the auspicious occasion of her retirement from the Office of Legislative Legal Services, the Colorado General Assembly honors Julie Pellegrin and exp expresses its deep appreciation for three decades of contributions and dedicated service to the Colorado General Assembly. Julie began her distinguished legislative career in 1991 as a staff attorney. Her extraordinary, extraordinary writing skills and remarkable ability to transform legislators' ideas into law were immediately apparent. Those talents, coupled with her natural people skills and instinctive leadership style, made her a natural choice for a management position as a team leader and eventually deputy director of the OLLS. Despite her successes as an effective manager, creative pro problem solver, and seasoned expert on legislative rules and procedures, Julie's love remains drafting. She drafts in a myriad of areas, but has developed unparalleled expertise in education law and is lauded as one of the state's experts in this field. Julie is the best example of what her colleagues call a super drafter. <laughs> Over the years, Julie has mentored legions of OLS employees, imparting her understanding of and respect for the legislative process and the complexities of drafting and her love for the institution she takes pride in serving. She has taught countless continuing legal education classes, staff training sessions, national seminars, and college courses. Her love of teaching was tapped for new legislator training, which has led on behalf, which she led on behalf of the OLS for many years. An idea person, Julie's creative spirit and focus on members' service led her to establish the Legal Service Buddy Program that pairs experienced OLLS attorneys with new legislators to help them navigate the complex complexities of the legislative environment. Julie developed and continues to oversee the publication of Legisource, a weekly legislative blog that provides timely and cogent information about the legislative process to members of the General Assembly, its staff, and the public. Julie also serves as the state's title board where she, where her insight, experience, and legal acuity have gained her the respect of her fellow board members. Julie has been an active participant over the years in NCSL's staff section, serving as staff chair of the Education Committee, co-chair of the Research Editorial Legal and Committee Staff Association, and vice chair of both the Legislative Effectiveness Committee and the Legal Services Staff Section. She was awarded the NCSL Legislative Staff Achievement Award in 2018 and the Legislative Education Staff Network Achievement Award in 2004. Over her stellar career, Julie has abided by core values of nonpartisanship and personal integrity while also maintaining her signature sense of humor and unflappable grace in the face of the challenges that overlay the experience of a nonpartisan staff career in the legislature. The members of the Colorado House of Representatives and the Senate honor and thank you, Julie for your faithful service and immeasurable contributions to the Colorado General Assembly and the people of the state of Colorado. We extend our best wishes on the occasion of your retirement. You will be greatly missed. On request of Representative Barbara McLaughlin and Senators Jeff Bridges and Paul Lundeen, given this 27th day of April, 2022, State Capitol, Denver.
Representative McLaughlin. Thank you. I just want to say, um, as chair of the Education Committee, um, you saved my life numerous times. You can explain everything. Um, everything is usually just about perfect. And um, I just want to thank you so much. Um, I know I'm not supposed to officially do this, but this is her husband, Paul, who can't wait to actually spend time um, <laughs> with her. Um, he tells me they might might be traveling somewhere. I don't know if that's possible with you, but yeah, I think it'll happen. So um, I just want to say how much uh, we love you and we love your work, and I think I can speak for um, the world's longest tribute and, um, <laughs> and everybody here to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We really, really appreciate your work. Thank you, Julie. I will just say, Julie, thank you so much for your service. I've worked with you every year that I've been here. There is no better drafter in the United States of America. Uh, to Paul, thank you for always walking over and picking her up uh, and walking her home after long nights. Uh, your service has made the state a better place and we are so uh, thankful and we're so better off for everything that you've done. So thank you very much, Julie. Representative McCluskey. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I am going to um, lay down that Julie Pellegrin is regarded in the nation as one of the best when it comes to school finance. We have, as an interim school finance committee, one last summer to figure out how to redo school finance in the state, making our school finance formula more student-centered centered and equitable. And I have so much faith that Julie Pellegrin is going to help us lead the way in getting this really challenging project done. So Julie, celebrate today, but we have work to do. <laughs> Majority Leader Esco. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I always knew the name Julie Pellegrin when I started here eight years ago. It wasn't until I really started digging into mill levy and uh, things that I may not have really understood being a new legislator. And I met Julie and was blown away not only by her knowledge and her depth of knowledge, but her empathy and her ability to make me not feel like an idiot when I asked any of the ridiculous questions I did. And your sense of, you truly are a teacher to be able to sit down and go through and teach things in a way that really made me not only understand it and get it, I had so many aha moments um, working with you and talking with you. Um, I can't tell you how valuable that would that is, not just to me personally, but to the people of Colorado. You have helped so many of us um, draft and shape so many amazing ideas into real law that has changed the lives of Coloradans. And I don't know if you ever get thanked enough for that work, but truly you have done an, an amazing service to the state through your years of work and you will definitely be missed. But personally, I just want to say thank you um, for all of the work you've done with me and with all of us. Representative Weissman. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And, you know, members, having been on uh, the Committee on Legal Services for a few years and, and chairing it this year, um, I'd known for a little while that this day was coming. I wasn't sure how public it was, so I haven't really gone and said anything. But um, now that it's this public, um, it's kind of that much more sad, even if, um, you know, I and we knew it was coming. It's certainly well earned, um, you know, I guess I've intersected with Deputy Director Pellegrin a couple of ways over on the committee, all the different things that, that run through there. She has been a key role in the working of the Committee on Legal Services for all the years that I've been part of it. And um, I don't tend to do a ton of bills in the, in the education space, but I have done some, and I have one this year where Julie was um, my drafter. And, you know, there are folks um, downstairs where if you have put in a bill request and you find out that you are assigned uh, to a particular drafter, you just know you're going to be okay. Uh, Julie is one of those people. Um, you know, and just recently this interesting thing came up where this bill that I was on um, was surfaced to us that there was this complicated intersection with another bill and um, between Julie and, and our nonpartisan staff with JBC and, and LCS, it was resolved just like that. Um, I think being at the top of your craft doesn't mean that you grapple with hard things and you know you struggle through them anyway. It means that you grapple with hard things in a way that you make them look easy to grapple with. 
And that is how I have seen um, uh, Julia Pellegrin grapple with drafting and everything else that I've seen her engage with. Um, this is a good example of how, you know, some of us are on this board, some of us are in these chairs, some of us have black name tags, but there are a lot of other people who make this place go. Um, and I'm glad that we're stopping to offer recognition to um, somebody in a very key role in our institution. I think we should all try to remember to do it a bit more often. Thank you, Julie. Representative Neville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I've never been lucky enough to actually have her on a dra as a drafter for one of my direct bills. But even that said, it's clear to see the impact she's had on the institution and just watching the impact that she has. And I just have to say, you've been a complete pro and your integrity has absolutely been impeccable. And I am really glad that you are leaving after I'll be gone because I can't imagine this institution without you. Representative Kennedy. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, and to echo what the majority leader was talking about, um, Julie has been so generous with her time, and not just with legislators. When I was a, a staffer for the House Democrats here in 2013, I was assigned to work with Representative Millie Hamner, who that session was working on a, on a gargantuan recalibration of the School Finance Act. It, it ended up being tied to a ballot measure that failed, and so it didn't end up turning into anything. I think that speaks to how long we've been working on the school finance problem in this state. Um, but at that time, you know, I was just learning about these school finance formulas, and Julie was incredibly generous with her time. Every time I stopped by her office, I remember her clearing her desk. I actually have a clear picture in my head of that desk being cleared so we can kind of lay out the bill that we were looking at, and she could walk me through so I can ask one more time, how do the categoricals work exactly? What is going on there? So Julie, thank you so much for all the time you've given to legislators and staff in the way that you've shaped Colorado. Thank you. Representative Kip and Representative Bacon. I'm sorry, Representative Kip. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. So, um, you know, before I got into this building, I was on the school, local school board. I might have mentioned that like three or 4,000 times here. But um, really, um, I had heard during my time there that somebody, I was, you know, working behind the scenes on uh, this um, bill with somebody, and somebody said, oh, yeah, wait, is Julie Pellegrin your drafter? Because she's like the best drafter. You need to get her on this bill. And so when I got here, I said, you know, Julie, I was told you were the best drafter. And, and she said, okay, well, you can be my OLS buddy. You know, we all have, you know, team up with a new person so thank you for that thank you for um, shepherding me through um, at least you know a few challenging bills um, really you know I, I think Jennifer Bacon is going to say it best <laughs> Representative Bacon thank you and I too am a reformed school board member <laughs> we're still recovering but I just want to say that um, you know for us the transition from local to state um, definitely needed particular guidance. You know, there are folks where public education is life, and so when Julie Pellegrin talks to you, she's also giving you some therapy and life lessons at the same time, and it could come from no better person. And so all I'd like to say is I just can't wait to read either the book that you're going to write about... <laughs> Just, you know, like, well, that's just not constitutional. That's okay. Um, and so, and for what it's worth, um, please know that we will just sorely, sorely miss you. I am contemplating if I should come back next year. <laughs> so, um, but thank you again for truly being the glue um, for the state as we talk about these issues all the way on the ground to the littlest learner to our college graduates here at the state level. So thank you so much. Assistant Minority Leader Geithner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just want to say uh, to Julie, thank you so much. Um, you know, I, I remember when I was first elected, uh, former representative, former Senator Keith King said, find Julie, there's no better drafter in that building, uh, and learn everything that you possibly can. So I just want to say thank you so much, whether it was texts uh, at, you know, the late hours of the night, uh, for preparation for a bill that I had or a wild idea or whatever it was, um, you seem to always navigate it. You navigated it with in-depth knowledge and grace and everything else. And I can't, uh, I can't thank you enough for everything that you've, you've done for me as a young legislator and even just in the last couple of days. So thank you so much, Julie, truly. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to thank you 
Julie, for your sweet and humble spirit. It means a lot to me. Thank you. Um, uh, Madam Speaker Pro Tem Benavides. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I just wanted to chime in, Julie, because I don't do a lot of education, so I didn't work with you a lot, but we did work with you on the regulations for remote when it was brand new and having to look at all the states and what was going on. And all of us were trying to figure this out. And I know those late night calls and your stepping up and how you knew these things. Because um, we were all trying to learn it, but you were well ahead of us and really helped us to, to mold the regulations that we use in this chamber and in the other. So thank you so much. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and uh, I'll be I'll be brief and just say uh, that you will be missed, uh, Julie. It has been an honor as a former chair of legal services, but also working in this building for like I don't know 15 years. Um, you're always someone that we know we can depend on to go to. But most importantly, when we're working on extremely complicated issues, you take the time with patience and grace to help help make sure we truly understand the bills that we're proposing and the complicated nuances that lie within all of our lovely state formulas and um, statutes. And so I just want to say thank you. And I'm so glad that you're going to take some time uh, to have some fun uh, and go on vacation. And I can't wait to be able to follow your, your journeys now that you're no longer nonpartisan staff and we be can become the closest of friends. So thanks, Julie. Representative Bird. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I would be remiss if I omitted the opportunity to tell the world about how amazing Julie is. So um, Julie, substantively, I think we've heard a lot about um, how incredible she is with her body of law education. We work together on probably one of the most contentious bills that I'll be a part of during my time here in the legislature related to education. And um, with such grace, and polish, Julie um, addressed about 25 different drafts of this bill. Never a question, um, always, may, maybe a couple questions, but they were thoughtful, helpful questions. Well, I, I see I see sort of what people are trying to get to here, but, but this term, this isn't a thing. So can we work on what this, what this is or what this means? So anyway, um, I don't know if you remember that conversation, yes. Very funny, actually. So um, she is the best to work with. Wherever, wherever you go, whatever you do, um, thank you for everything you've done. The other thing I want to add is it just not your substantive experience, but I feel like um, you also take the time to help grow us as legislators. And I know the time I've spent with you sitting down on ta in tables down in the basement um, sharing with you some of, some of my questions and I wouldn't say frustrations, but maybe being perplexed over how things happen to work here at the Capitol from time to time. Um, you offered so many incredible words of wisdom that I carry with me now and have grown me as a legislator, and I firmly believe that they've made me better. So thank you for what you've done, and I'm so excited for your future. Representative Soper. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And I also wanted to come down and uh, talk about Julie for a second. I, I could have swore yesterday in House Judiciary we said that you couldn't retire for another 47 years. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'm glad someone else heard that. I, uh, I first heard your name uh, from my predecessor, Eulen Willett, who said, uh, Matt, there's one person you need to get to know at the Capitol, and that's Julie. He said uh, she's an incredibly good lawyer, and plus I went to law school with her, is what he told me. And so I just had great accolades to say. And uh, sure enough, um, I found you to be someone that uh, was excellent to work with and always was about 20 steps ahead of us as legislators. I mean, the fact that you had the cheat sheet so that we knew every section um, inside and out uh, of the different bills, especially the legal services bills that can get quite complex, especially when you're dealing with, is healthcare one word or two words? <laughs> but we appreciate your service and we're going to greatly miss you. Your void is gonna be felt, thank you. Representative Sirota. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I don't actually think that I have a, a whole lot to share that is different than the experiences of the rest of our colleagues, um, but I had the incredible fortune of being able to work with Julie over the last two years on this 
project of an entire new department and a universal pre-K program. And I remember back, like it seems like ages ago, when we first started down this path, as soon as EE had passed, um, and I had put in a bill title, and the speaker and I decided to work on this together. And as we were talking, he was like, oh, and um, we've got to get Julie Pellegrin, Pellegrin as our drafter. And I, and I was like, oh, okay, because I hadn't actually had the opportunity to do a bill with, um, with Julie Pellegrin before. And so I was like, well, okay, whatever you want is fine. And I truly can't imagine this, um, this journey without you. You, uh, the depth and breadth of your knowledge and command of the statute. I think I told you uh, at some point during the process that you are part lawyer, part writer, and part magician. I mean, you, you just, um, you are such a treasure to our state and the incredible value that you have um, that you have brought to all of us who have had the opportunity to work on your bills, but really the impact that you've had on the the people of Colorado through the work that you do is unparalleled. And I am so grateful for all that you have done um, um, for for me, for my colleagues, and for the people of Colorado over these years. And um, and you will really really be missed. Maybe we give Julie one more round of applause. I don't know if there's any more work to do today. That was pretty good. Uh, Representative Lantine. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I really hate to follow that. What a beautiful, moving tribute um, to Julie. She is an amazing drafter and a wonderful person. Um, but I'm here to announce the Health and Insurance Committee is meeting this afternoon with high hopes of starting at 1.30. Um, we are hearing House Bills 1370, Senate Bill 120, uh, SJR 10, um, House Bill 1399, House Bill 1401, and House Bill 1403. Um, we are not hearing today House Bill 1384 at the sponsor's request. See y'all this afternoon. Thanks. Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, the State Affairs Committee is equally hopeful today about a 1.30 start in LSBA to hear House Bill 1372, House Bill 1397, and Senate Bill 113. Representative Putin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, uh, Capital Development Committee will not be meeting tomorrow morning. We will meet a week from uh, tomorrow, May 5th at 8.15. Thank you. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Business Affairs and Labor Committee, we are meeting this afternoon, planning for 1.30. Uh, on our agenda this afternoon, we have the Sunset Review hearing for the Division of Gaming, and then we have Senate Bill 140, House Bill 1389, Senate Bill 35, House Bill 1398, and House Bill 1058. Also want to note for the Business Affairs and Labor Committee members, we added a meeting uh, in, for tomorrow, so we are also meeting tomorrow afternoon, and the bills are in the calendar. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members, we will have an appropriations meeting tomorrow. Um, we will let you know exactly what time, but for now, I would say 8, uh, 8 a.m. And the winner of our joke contest is Mr. M uh, Representative Catlin. <laughs> All right, come on down. You run it one and two days in a row. Representative Catlin. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It's an honor to serve with you. Honor to serve with you, too, Representative Callan. Do you have any idea <clears throat> what the strongest days of the week are? I don't. Saturday and Sunday. The rest of those are weekday. <laughs> oh, man. 
Representative Judah and Representative Larson. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, so, members, uh, April 30th is the DEA's National Prescription Drug Take Back Day. And um, I think it's worth noting that the last two years has been a struggle around substance misuse and mental health uh, issues. So, um, we're pleased to say that the um, the Prescription Abuse Leadership Initiative of Colorado has continued their important work in educating partners uh, and community leaders about these important issues. And so please make sure you find your nearest um, uh, prescription drug disposal, disposal site or if you have a safe at home disposal pouch. Representative Larson. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Speaker. And uh, yes, so today is, or this week is National Drug Take Back Day. Uh, you may have noticed Rally had a table downstairs. Uh, they had a, a mock-up kind of uh, trailer that has traveled around the state. It's been to many of our districts. I had the pleasure of touring it in the pre-pandemic era. Uh, but they do great work in raising awareness. Uh, those prescription drugs that you get and you have those leftovers, maybe you didn't do your full prescription, uh, making sure that those are safely disposed of in a way where they don't get diverted into the market is a huge uh, contributor and we can do a lot to uh, take a bite out of the opioid crisis. So uh, just please do find your local event, uh, promote it whenever possible, and thank you again to everyone involved. Representative Montine. Thank you, Mr. S thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, an update I just got on our calendar for today in health and insurance. We will not be hearing House Bill 1401 today, also at the sponsor's request. Representative Hanks. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I have the uh, distinct privilege to uh, recognize many patriotic Americans up in the gallery today from uh, Convention of States wearing some rather uh, uniform T-shirts there be here for a rally and enjoying the efforts that we go through this morning. So uh, thank you for attending. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Hanks, and welcome to the People's House. I hope you have a wonderful day. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to proceed out of order for immediate consideration of House Joint Resolution 1024. Seeing no objection, we'll proceed out of order for immediate consideration of House Joint Resolution 1024. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I move House Joint Resolution 1024, ask that it be read, and then we will vote so we can get it over to the Senate and then we can talk about it. Uh, great. Uh, Mr. Shebo, please read the title of the House Joint Resolution 1024. The House Joint Resolution 1024 by Representatives Esgar and Duran, also Senators Gonzalez and Winter, concerning Sexual Assault Awareness Month and in connection therewith, recognizing April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and designating, designating April 27, 2022 as Colorado Denim Day. Representative Duran. Or Majority Leader Esgar. Uh, let's move it and ask it to be read at length. I moved it. I moved it. Well, we hadn't read the title yet. I move House Joint Resolution 1024 and ask that it be read at length. Mr. Schiebel. <laughs> Whereas Sexual Assault Awareness Month officially began 21 years ago, though the movement to bring awareness to and put an end to sexual violence can be traced back much further. And whereas the first rape crisis center was founded in San Francisco in 1971, the same city where the first US Take Back the Night event was held seven years later. And whereas the following decades it mobilized survivors and advocates to call for legislation and funding that would support survivors, such as the Federal Violence Against Women Act of 1993. And whereas monumental changes like the Violence Against Women Act demonstrated that national efforts promoting sexual violence prevention were needed. Even before Sexual Assault Awareness Month was finally nationally observed in 2001, Advocates had been holding events, marches, and observances related to sexual violence during the month of April, sometimes during a week-long Sexual Assault Awareness Week. And whereas since 2013, the Colorado Coalition Against Sexual Assault, or CCASA, which serves as the collective voice of sexual assault victims and service providers in the public policy initiatives, education, training, and collaborative efforts, has hosted Colorado Denim Day. And whereas the Denim Day campaign was originally triggered by a 1998 ruling by the Italian Supreme Court, 
where a rape conviction was overturned because the justices felt that since the victim was wearing tight jeans, she must have helped her rapist remove her jeans, thereby implying consent. And whereas the following day, women in the Italian parliament came to work wearing jeans in solidarity with the victim. And whereas peace over violence developed the Denim Day campaign in Los Angeles in 1999, and since then, wearing jeans on Denim Day has become a symbol of protest against attitudes condoning sexual assault. And whereas currently every 68 seconds an American is sexually assaulted and one out of every six American women has been the victim of rape or attempted rape in her lifetime. And whereas 35% of black women will experience some form of sexual violence during their lifetime and African American girls and women 12 years and older experience higher rates of rape and sexual assault than white, Asian and Latina girls and women. And whereas native women are twice as likely to experience sexual violence in their lifetimes as any other population of women one in five black women are survivors of rape and members of the LGBTQ plus community are significantly more likely to experience sexual violence than their heterose heterosexual, heterosexual cisgender peers. And whereas statistics from the US Department of Justice show that every black woman who reports a rape, at least 15 other black women do not report and Latina women are, late, are the least likely to report sexual violence. And whereas historical trauma, racism, hypersexualization and feticization often prevent sexual violence against women of color from being reported and believed. And women of color often face both racism and sex sexism when attempting to report. And whereas approximately 90% of people with developmental disabilities will be sexually assaulted, and around 80% of survivors of elder sexual abuse are abused by their caretakers. And whereas these statistics demonstrate that a person's identity can place them at a greater risk of sexual violence and make them less likely to report such violence and be believed, illustrated that denim isn't always denim. And whereas recognizing Sexual Assault Awareness Month and Denim Day and bringing awareness to and putting an end to sexual violence remain critically important. Now, therefore, be it resolved by the House of Representatives of the 73rd General Assembly of the State of Colorado, the Senate concurring herein, that we, the members of the Colorado General Assembly, recognize April as Sexual Assault Awareness Month and designate April 27, 2022 as Colorado Denim Day, a statewide event aligning with Denim Day events across the world. And we are proud to recognize CCASA, Peace Over Violence, and other organizations that work to bring together Colorado communities to support survivors and end sexual violence. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And we will talk a little bit more about this in just a moment, but I would ask that we um, earn your support for your vote today so we can get this bill over to the Senate and we will um, continue to speak after the vote. Um, the question before us is the adoption of House Joint Resolution 1024. Is there objection to a voice vote? Seeing no objection to a voice vote, the question before us is the adoption of House Joint Resolution 1024. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Joint Resolution 1024 is adopted. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to this morning's roll call be added as co-sponsors. Seeing no objection, this morning's roll call will be added as co-sponsors. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, members. You can be seated if you'd like. Um, this, is, this is the eighth year I've been a part of this event, and I call it an event because it's happening across the United States today on the same day. Um, I too am a survivor of sexual violence, and I too am a survivor who's never reported it. I don't think that that makes me uncommon anymore. And for that, that makes me very sad. Um, when you think of the number of folks that you either know, or if you personally have been a survivor of sexual violence, it's something that I feel like, and I've said this every year I've been in this well, we don't talk about enough. We don't talk about why it happens. We don't talk about why it happens to certain people more than other people. We just kind of know it's there, know it's happened to folks we know, and we feel the empathy. I implore us to really think about that. I know a lot of the pieces of legislation we run here helps get to the root causes of many of these issues every single year, but truly, at the end of the day, we have to figure out how to stop sexual violence, not just come to uh, the well to read a resolution every year. 
we actually need to figure out how to make this stop. To those of you who are survivors, I see you. Men, women, children, elderly. We see you, and we stand with you. And we know that healing could be a very slow process, but you can move forward. I think there's many of us in this room who are prime examples of that. So for those of you who took the time to donate some money, put on some jeans today, I hope you thought about why it is that we're wearing jeans today. And we, we make light of it. We make you know, a good time of it. Like it's denim day because we always have to wear suits and dresses and ties. But it really, there's a true meaning behind it. A woman was not believed because her pants were too tight. Her jeans were too tight. That's more common than we know. So thinking about that today, I want to just extend a, a sense of gratitude to you all. When I'm looking at these money boxes that we're going to um, deliver to CICASA, um, some of their members are with us on the floor uh, today as well. When we deliver those boxes to you all, I hope you know that it's not just boxes of money for the incredible work that you all do, but it's actual pieces of our hearts that we're giving back to you all. Thanks for being here today. Representative Duran. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. In the United States, a sexual assault occurs every 68 seconds. The majority of victims are between the ages of 12 and 36. The younger members of our society experience some of the highest rates of sexual assault. 82% of all juvenile victims are girls. 90% of all adult rape victims are women. Young women ages 16 to 19 are four times more likely than the general population to be victims of rape, attempted rape, or sexual assault. Women of color have lower reporting rates and experience a lower likelihood of having their reports believed. They encounter less availability of culturally appropriate and accessible treatment services and are less likely to seek treatment for trauma. In the United States, Latina women are the least likely to report sexual violence or seek sexual trauma treatment services. Culturally relevant and linguistically accessible service options remain out of reach for many survivors within diverse Latinx communities. Many rape crisis and trauma treatment centers do not have Spanish speaking advocates or culturally relevant programs. These services can be critical in creating a sense of safety, especially when dealing with a very personal, personal issue such as sexual violence. You know, Denim Day is a day to show your support, show your support to survivors and really eliminate victim blaming. One in six women and one in 33 men have been the victim of attempted or complete rape. These statistics are startling. But even more startling is the responses that victims of sexual assault receive when disclosing. Sexual abuse crosses all classes, ages, genders, races, ethnicities, abilities, and sexual orientations. It does not play favorites. There is no profile of what a perpetrator looks like. The idea of stranger danger is misleading. Stranger rape is very rare. 44% of victims are under the age of 18, and two-thirds of sexual assaults are by someone known to the victim. Denim Day is a day to show your support for survivors and to eliminate victim blaming. Survivor after survivor that I've spoken to has told me that on Denim Day, they feel heard, even if they have never told anyone before. Sexual assault is a silent issue a very underreported issue and a very difficult issue to talk about. By reporting survivors, you give them a voice, which we all know the stigma that comes with not only um, sexual assault, domestic violence, for all crime victims, right? It's removing that stigma, and that's what we attempt to do each year, every day, on Denim Day. Thank you. Thank you, Representative Duran. Representative Weissman. Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. And you know, having been on judiciary for six years and, and chaired it now for going on four, um, we hear a lot about these issues. We hear and pass a lot of bills to try to address um, address this type of crime. And 
better, better foster survivorship um, on the civil side, on the criminal side, on the provision of care and services side. Uh, we've done some important work on that even this year. Uh, these measures are uh, pretty commonly bipartisan as they should be. I just wanted to comment briefly on two things. I think the first is incidents, and then the second is, you know, I wanted to share some words from Judiciary on survivorship that just came up a few weeks ago. You know, the, the sponsors uh, mentioned one in six women, if you look in certain contexts, like in a college context, it could be one in four, one in three. If you think about anything else that is that prevalent, uh, you know, say the flu, say COVID, for example, um, we would call that an epidemic. You don't have an incidence of one in six, one in four, one in three without rightly calling it an epidemic. Um, you know, I think it was leading up to a bill that we were hearing a year or two ago where something caused me to stop and think just of people, mostly women, but not entirely, that I know in my life who have either survived sexual violence or survived attempted sexual assault. Um, I ran way over the fingers on one hand pretty fast and started getting, I don't know, if I were to sit down and do it, it, it might, might be a matter of both hands and feet, and I'm just one person. That's pretty chilling, and that's before you know, I think about what people were sharing in the peak of the Me Too moment back in 17 or 18, including some people in this chamber. I have spoken before about when we use the term victim or when we use the term survivor and how important I think it is to use the latter term because um, survivor means you have turned the corner, means you are regaining agency back in your life. But a witness on another matter in judiciary a couple weeks ago put it this way. You don't just become a survivor once and done. You work on surviving every day. And this was a woman who survived ghastly things, and she spoke of them in committee. And it struck me that, of course, that's right. I think about survivors um, I know who've shared things with me, and sometimes, you know, just those daily acts of ongoing survivorship mean that when you're out in a restaurant, um, you can't have your back to the door. It means that if you have to have a repair uh, man come over and work on something in your house, you might find yourself a little bit more on guard. It might mean yoga, it might mean um, counseling, it might mean a lot of other things. So um, I agree with the sponsors, this is a day uh, to support survivors of sexual violence, um, you know, through visibility, through wearing denim, uh, through raising funds, through stopping even as we're busy and taking a moment as we are down here. But I think the other 364 days of the year are also opportunities by which we can support survivors in our lives. Um, and I would venture to say if, if all of us did that little thought experiment where we went through how many people that we know personally have had to survive one of these things, I think that's all 65 of us in here. So we all have a direct role that we can play. We have other roles that we can play as policymakers too. And I hope we continue to do so. Thank you. Minority Leader McKean. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, thank you for everything you guys do every year. I appreciate it very much. Um, this morning, just because it popped up, was a message from a friend of mine, Celia Harmonson Nielsen. She has, a, has like three more names because she's Norwegian. Sometimes they do that. But Celia shares the name of my first daughter and is very special to me. And years ago, she was here on a visit. And she was trying to figure out what she wanted to do with her life. And she told me while we were actually out in Pawnee shooting some stuff, she said she really wanted to become a police officer. And so I talked to her about it and I said, what do you want to do? And she said, I want to work with kids. The minute she said that, I was convicted to tell her to guard her heart. Because she, as I told her, you are going to see some of the most horrific things that people do to each other. And that's a lot of what this day means to me, is that knowledge that that's there. Every 68 seconds, it's just wrong. And we know it's wrong, I think, partly because we, we engage just in a normalcy of this world, but then there's this other normal where 68 seconds 
is a part of the life of this world. My thanks actually goes out to you guys for raising awareness, to all the survivors, but also to those people who are the resource to report to, to find help and comfort and rescue from. And, and I think that that's a really important thing to stop and think of, that we have people who go see the most horrific things we do to each other. And yet, they do that, and they go home, and the next day they get up and they go do it again. And those hearts and those souls and that service to our world is enormous. And if you're here today, I would tell Celia, thank you. Thank you for setting out to go do what you know you need to go do in this world. But I'm terribly sorry that you have to do it. But man, am I thankful that people like you are there to help. So thank you guys very much. Thanks to everybody. See no further discussion on House Resolution 1024. We have um, already voted on it. And so I'll call on the Majority Leader to place this in the right spot on the calendar. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to proceed out of order for third reading of bills. See so, no objection. We'll proceed out of order for immediate consideration of third reading of bills. Final passage. Majority Leader Esco. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to labor Senate Bill 9 until tomorrow, April 28th. Seeing no objection, we'll lay over Senate Bill 9 one day. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title of the House Bill 1242. House Bill 1242 by Representatives Kip and Exum, also Senators Janal and Heise, concerning the regulation of structures that are manufactured at a location that is not at the site where the structure is occupied and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Esco. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1242 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1242 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. For those participating online, Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Ricks, how do you vote? Oh, you know that, you know what? Per the regulations, you can do that. So it's cool. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. <clears throat> Please close the machine. With 39 aye votes, 25 no votes, and one excuse, House Bill 1242 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1012. House Bill 1012 by Representatives Cutter and Valdez D, also Senators Janal and Lee, concerning healthy force, standing connection there with making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1012 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1012 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Thanks. Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please close the machine. With 45 aye votes, 19 no votes, and one excuse, House Bill 1012 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title of the House Bill 1365. 
House Bill 1365 by Representative Esgar, also Senator Hendrickson, concerning the creation of the Southern Colorado Institute of Transportation Technology at Colorado State University, Pueblo. Majority Leader Esgar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1365 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1365 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Court. Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please close the machine. With 42 I votes, 22 no votes, and one excuse, House Bill 1365 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Can someone squeeze one of those pigs, please? That's the Majority Leader Escar. Mr. Speaker, I feel the need to clarify that there is actually not a fiscal note attached to this bill. Thank you. I'm shocked. I'm shocked. Please close the machine. <laughs> There's no laughing in this business. Uh, Mr. Schiebel, please read the title, House Bill 1348. House Bill 1348 by Representatives Frelick and Caraveo, also Senator Winter, concerning enhanced oversight of the chemicals used in oil and gas production and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1348 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1348 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion, Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine. Members, please proceed to vote. <clears throat> Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please close the machine. With 39 I votes, 25 no votes, and one excuse, House Bill 1348 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1260. House Bill 1260 by Representative Froelich, also Senator Simpson and Fields, concerning ensuring students have reasonable access to medically necessary services in schools. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1260 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1260 on third reading and final passage. See no further discussion. Mr. Schiebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Williams, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Williams votes yes. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please close the machine. With 61 I votes, three no votes, and one excuse, House Bill 1260 is adopted. Co-sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1077. 
House Bill 1077 by Representatives Michael Sinjane and Judah, also Senators Priel and Hansen, concerning the creation of the Colorado Nonprofit Security Grant Program for qualified nonprofit organizations at high risk of a terrorist attack to apply for but not receive a grant from the Federal Nonprofit Security Grant Program and a connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1077 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1077 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Shebo, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Secretary's discretion. Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please close the machine. With 46 I votes, 18 no votes, and one excuse, House Bill 1077 is adopted. Please close the machine. Mr. Sheeble, please read the title to House Bill 1254. House Bill 1254 by Representative Valdez A, also Senators Winter and Priola, concerning regulation related to the ownership of a vehicle and a connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1054 and third reading final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1254 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. <laughs> Please close the machine. With 37 I votes, 27 no votes, and one excused, House Bill 1254 is adopted. Co-sponsors. <laughs> Co-sponsors. There we go. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1359. House Bill 1359 by Representatives Bacon and Snyder, also Senator Rodriguez, concerning the creation of the Colorado Household Financial Recovery Pilot Program and in connection there with making an appropriation. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1359 on third reading, final passage. The question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1359 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please close the machine. With 40 I votes, 24 no votes, and one excuse, House Bill 1359 is adopted. Co sponsors. Please close the machine. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1361. Majority Leader Esker. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to proceed out of order for the immediate consideration of House Bill 1390. Seeing no objection, we will proceed out of order for immediate consideration of House Bill 1390. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of the House Bill 1390. House Bill 1390 by Representatives McCluskey and McLaughlin, also Senator Zenzinger and Lundeen, concerning the financing of public schools and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move House Bill 1390 on third reading, final passage. Question before us is the adoption of House Bill 1390 on third reading and final passage. Seeing no further discussion, Mr. Shebel, please open the machine and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Williams, how do you vote? No. Representative Williams votes no. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please.
please close the machine. With 44 I votes, 20 no votes, and one excuse, House Bill 1390 is adopted. Co sponsors. Majority Leader Escar, please close the machine. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay over the balance of the third reading calendar until tomorrow, April 28th. Seeing no objection, the balance of the third reading calendar will be laid over until Thursday, April 28th. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the following bills be made special. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Schiebel, committee's a committee reports of reference. Committee on Appropriations, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1149 is amended, 1205 is amended, 1327 is amended, 1345, 1367 is amended, 1369 is amended, 1380 is amended, 1394 is amended, Senate Bills 28 is amended, 55, 57, 147, 150 be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. Committee on Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. Senate Bill 154 be amended as followed and as so amended be referred to the Committee on Appropriations with favorable recommendation. Committee on Transportation and Local Government, after consideration on the merits, the committee recommends the following. House Bill 1363 is amended, 1387 is amended, be referred to the Committee of the Whole with favorable recommendation. House Bill 1388 be amended as followed, and as so amended, be referred to the Committee on Finance with favorable recommendation. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to proceed out of order for immediate consideration of special orders. Uh, we will proceed out of order for immediate consideration of special orders. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the following bills be made special orders today, April 27th at 10.09 a.m. House Bill 1367, House Bill 1369, House Bill 1380, House Bill 1394, House Bill 1327, House Bill 1149, House Bill 1131, House Bill 1119, House Bill 1205, House Bill 1387, Senate Bill 2, Senate Bill 28, Senate Bill 55, Senate Bill 57, Senate Bill 147, Senate Bill 1, Senate Bill 212 and Senate Bill 144. Seeing no objection, the bills laid out by the Majority Leader will be added to the Special Orders Calendar at 10.09 on Wednesday, April 27th. Representative Doherty. As a proper motion, members, you have heard the motion. Seeing no objection, Representative Doherty will take the chair. The committee will come to order. With your unanimous consent, the bills will be read by title unless there is a request for reading a bill at length. Committee reports are printed in your bill folders. Floor amendments will be shown on the screen and on your iPads. Bills will be laid over upon motion of the majority leader. The coat rule is relaxed. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1367. House Bill 1367 by Representatives Lantine and Gray, also Senators Winter and Pedersen. 
Concerning modifications to laws prohibiting discrimination in employment practices and in connection therewith, repealing the exclusion of domestic workers from the definition of employee, extending the time limit for filing a charge alleging unfair or discriminatory employment practices with the Colorado Civil Rights Commission, and repealing the prohibition against certain damages in cases alleging age-based discrimination. Representative Lantine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1367 and the committee reports. To the appropriations report. The Appropriation Committee appropriated money. I ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the Appropriations Report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Appropriations Report passes. To the Representative Lantine. Um, the Judiciary. To the Judiciary Report. <laughs> Um, in the Judiciary Committee, we passed an amendment that allows 450 days for processing a case from the date of filing to the date that the final commission action is taken. Currently, the division has 270 days to process a case from the date of filing to the date that the commission takes a final action on a case. The complainant and respondent can each request an extension of time up to 90 days during the investigation process, which would extend the case processing time period up to 450 days if the complainant and respondent both request 90-day jurisdictional extensions of time. When an extension of jurisdictional time is requested by one party, the opposing party is contacted to determine if they have any objections to the extension time for the record before the request goes to a division staff member, who then contacts a commissioner to review the request and approve or deny it. The parties are then notified if the extension of time is approved or denied in writing, and if approved, provided the new case and date. This was requested by CCRD and Dora, and I ask for an aye vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before no, no, wait, us is the wait, passage. Wait. Oh. Wait. The passage of the of the judiciary report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The eyes the eyes have it. The judiciary report passes. Oh, Representative Neville, I'm going to miss that. Um, to the bill, Representative Lantine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this bill makes three simple change uh, updates to the Colorado Anti Discrimination Act, um, otherwise known as CADA. It increases the time a worker has to file a claim at the Colorado Civil Rights Division from 180 days to 300 days, making it consistent with the time allotted by the U.S. Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, otherwise known as EEOC. Second, it removes the current exemption in CADA for domestic workers. Currently, domestic workers lack the protections of CADA, and House Bill 1367 removes that exclusion and rightfully includes domestic workers in these protections. It brings consistency to the remedies available to workers who are discriminated against because of their age. Um, currently, these workers are prohibited from receiving compensatory or punitive damages under CADA, unlike all other protected classes. Additionally, the standard the individual must prove to receive any relief for an age discrimination claim also differs from those for other protected classes. Um, and, you know, while we were in committee, um, there was an issue raised, um, uh, particularly around moms who were hiring babysitters who uh, felt like they may be forced into hiring a male babysitter. And so I move Amendment 7. The amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. So Amendment 7 addresses this by um, making it clear that parents in this scenario are not engaging in workplace discrimination by making this kind of choice. And I ask for an aye vote on the amendment. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before this is the adoption of Amendment L007 to House Bill 13 or to the committee report. Uh, those in oh, favor no, no, say no. aye. This is to 
to the bill. To, to, the, to the House bill. I'll, I'll rephrase. The question before us is the passage of Amendment L007 to House Bill 1327. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. The amendment passes. Representative Ortiz. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to uh, commend the bill sponsor for their work around this. Um, as you know, those that live with a disability can be uh, especially targeted for workplace discrimination and harassment. So CCDC and myself as a uh, disabled legislator really appreciates the work of the bill sponsors on this. I urge and I vote. Representative Carver. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I voted against this bill um, because of one of the three provisions in the bill. Uh, the, the provision in the bill that would extend um, Civil Rights Commission jurisdiction uh, for uh, various protected classes, including gender uh, and sex, um, for what's called domestic service, which is defined by regulation. So just a little background. Uh, currently, federal employment law, including EEOC jurisdiction, has an exclusion for domestic service. Why? Because it is individuals that you are hiring, by definition. Uh, this, is, this is the regulatory definition of domestic service. Um, it is individuals that you are hiring to come into your home for a wide range of tasks. It might be to uh, do housework. It might be child care. It might be uh, caregiving for another member of your household. It might be lawn care. It's basically all um, services that a private household is hiring and most of those categories is where the individual is going to be coming into your home. So uh, this has uh, always been exempted out and is still. It is not part of federal employment law. It is exempted. It is not uh, part of EEOC jurisdiction. It is exempted. This bill would say that for that area of domestic service as defined in all those categories, uh, that hiring uh, and firing and all those uh, decisions that you are uh, paying somebody to come into your home to do tasks would now be subject to this uh, broad range of um, prohibitions to include uh, sex um, and now you would be subject to complaint and could be hauled before the Civil Rights Commission. So in committee uh, we raised with the witnesses the example of what if you have a uh, woman in the household who is uh, a domestic violence victim and they want to only hire women to come in and do their housework. They don't want a man in their home because of their life experience. Would this bill, with this provision, say that that's employment discrimination? The answer from the witness was, well, it wouldn't be employment dis uh, discrimination if it was a bona fide occupational requirement. But quite frankly, in looking at doing further research into what a bona fide occupational requirement is, there's no specifics on having somebody do housework uh, based upon their sex, that may be the case with personal care, 
uh, if you are needing home health services and that involves bathing and other things, you may be able to limit the sex of who you're hiring that way, but not for other services that you are bringing into your home. And while I appreciate the amendment of the bill sponsor that gives more latitude on the sex of the individual for child care, that does not solve the problem for the woman who has experienced domestic violence and does not want, only wants women uh, to come into her home to do these items. This law would now make her subject to the jurisdiction of the Civil Rights Commission and she could be accused of employment discrimination. Members, why would we put individuals making these very personal decisions on who can come into their home, who can interact with their family members? That's why the federal law has always exempted this out, right? This is not a place of public accommodation uh, where we have uh, through employment law and other law said with certain protected classes you cannot discriminate and and rightly so I agree with those laws but we have never reached into the home and the private decisions that you have on who can come into your home and do these very sensitive uh, I, I care a lot about um, you know, the individual autonomy to be able to make that determination and to protect my neighbor who may have a particular sensitivity. It didn't come out in, in the testimony, uh, but one of the other examples that was raised after the bill is what if you had an immigrant from Ukraine and somebody from Russia applies. Now this becomes an issue for the state in saying no, your personal preferences on who is in your home based upon your life experience and other factors that now you no longer have that right. You will be second guessed by the Civil Rights Commission on these decisions. I support the other parts of the bill on age discrimination and expanding the remedies. That's the right thing. I also don't have an issue with some of the other modifications that are being made. But I simply think that we have not thought through carefully all the implications of making all of these personal decisions on who can come into your home, who can do caregiving and other tasks with your family members. There is also um, a basis that you can't um, have a preference on religion. Well, what if I've got a family member who is a devout Orthodox Jew or of another faith, and it's an aged aunt or an aged parent, and they want somebody of the same belief and faith as they do? Are we now saying, members, that you, can, you no longer have that autonomy to make that kind of decision? I just think that's wrong. Now this is entirely different if you have a company that is providing domestic service. And right now the federal law says that if you have 15 employees or more, that's where the cutoff is. Even if we focused on companies that are hiring and performing a commercial service, that would be so less intrusive than telling these individuals 
hiring for household work or uh, caregiving for family members or other services where you are coming into the home, taking away their ability to say this is the, ki the person, whether it's only females because of sexual assault or domestic violence, why don't they have that right? Why are we taking that away from people? So respectfully to the bill sponsors, um, I don't think this is the right approach uh, to dealing with domestic service. I think there's a better approach that can still protect uh, individuals and their life situations and who they're hiring to come into their home. And for that reason, I'm a no on the bill. Representative Weissman. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And members, just to kind of back up and um, emphasize why this is even in the bill at all, it's because, frankly, there's a pretty ugly history of discrimination and lack of redress for discrimination against people working in this domestic context. Uh, you know, we say in other areas of law, Fourth Amendment and otherwise, you know, one's home is one's castle. Uh, I do believe that the law adequately addresses that concern. I would want it uh, addressed, you know, if I'm making these kind of hiring decisions. In existing law, regs of uh, the Colorado Civil Rights Commission and Division, uh, 3CCR 708, uh, 180, um, there's an example given. Um, a business employing caregivers may employ a staff member of the same sex as the sex of the client. Now, this is a business. I'm going to make a little bit of a broad analogy here, but the, the home is often, uh, in other areas of law, afforded a heightened degree of protection, rightly so. That, that is hundreds of years old in common law. I mentioned the Fourth Amendment context. That's probably the, the most prevalent one, at least, that I can think of. This is in black letter law right now. A business employing care caregivers may employ a staff member of the same sex as the sex of the client. Now, you could analogize the individual in his or her own home uh, as a business. Um, I think you could analogize further and say that if a business is afforded this exception uh, as a BFOQ, a bona fide occupational qualification recognized in law, then a fortiori, the individual in one's own home. We're not now talking about a business employing many people who are going to take on different jobs, maybe on, on different days. We're talking about that more intimate space where I think that this exclusion already in law would apply a fortiori. Other examples in case law, I'll spare everybody the sites. Um, a, a washroom attendant was uh, being hired. Gender was, was upheld as an exception there uh, in that somewhat more sensitive uh, situation. Uh, from another case, in certain situations, the privacy rights of individuals justify sex-based hiring by an employer. Situations where privacy rights have been recognized as a BFOQ involve those occupations which require an employee to work with or around individuals who are exposed in, in varying degrees, as one might be in one's home. Another case. Defendant in privacy rights cases may satisfy its burden of proving a factual basis for sex-based hiring by showing that clients or guests of a particular business would not consent, would not consent to service by members of the opposite sex. Again, that is a business context. I think it is reasonable to uh, assume that a fortiori that preference would stand in one's own home. Um, you know, I, I differ with the idea that the sponsors and others have not thought through the aspects of this bill. I believe they've been working on it for many years and have thought about it for a whole long time. I do believe that there is a valid point that the representative from El Paso County is making that one ought to have some zone of preference for the very sensitive reasons that were just stated in one's own home. I do believe that existing law, both regulatory law and case law, covers that concern. I think it is no reason to vote no on the bill, and I'm urging a yes vote on the bill, particularly with the amendment that even more clearly covers some of the situations that have been talked about. Representative Carver. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, and I appreciate the comments of my colleague, Rep. Wiseman. Uh, but I think that the case law that my colleague cites, as well as the Q&A we had with the witnesses, make clear that your preference on sex, and I, we asked this several times, 
and it was uh, Representative Locke who posed the hypothetical of a woman who was the victim of domestic violence who did not want a male in the house. And she talked about um, her response was, well, with regards to personal care. So uh, what is that? That's like home health. Um, so you're helping somebody go to the bathroom. You may have to help them with uh, their other personal needs. That um, for that, you could uh, require or say, I only want somebody of the female sex doing that, and you would be okay. But it was very clear from the Q&A that that was personal care services in the home. And that matches up with the case law that I've looked at, and I think that Representative Wiseman referenced. But domestic service, by definition, and this is under the Civil Rights Commission definition, why would they have a definition for domestic service? Because right now, domestic service um, work is excluded from their jurisdiction just like it is at the federal level, because it's private households making decisions on who comes into their home or onto their property to do this kind, the various types of tasks. So respectfully, this bill would tell that woman who is a domestic violence victim Despite the amendments done on the floor, despite the bona fide occupational qualifications that's currently in the regulations, I do not see how that woman who advertised for a female-only person to do housework because she doesn't want a man in the home is not going to be run afoul of this bill and be accused of sex discrimination and get hauled in front of the Civil Rights Commission for an investigation. That is just what is going to happen under this bill. And I think that is wrong. I think it is also wrong if I've got an aged relative who wants a caregiver of her religion, her background, her values. The discussion that I had is if you're an Orthodox Jew and you are used to some very detailed rules on food and other things and kosher, and you, you are hiring a caregiver to be with that aged relative during the day and doing the preparation of the food and doing all of that. And you want somebody who understands that culture, that background, those values. This bill would say you cannot have a religion requirement when you're hiring that caregiver for your aged mother or aunt. Why would we do that, members? What purpose is served by taking away the ability to say this in this situation, in this very personal situation, with this individual coming into my home providing this service, why would we make them subject to an employment discrimination complaint under those circumstances? That's what this bill will do. That's what this bill will do. Are we really prepared to go out and talk to our neighbors who had no idea that their personal decisions on who comes into their home is now going to be subject to legal sanction and getting hauled in front of the Civil Rights Commission?
for the most personal decisions they make. That's the result of this bill. Are we prepared for our neighbors, our neighborhoods, our friends and neighbors saying, no, you no longer have autonomy in deciding who comes into your home, who you're hiring to do these personal items. We've taken that away from you. Get ready to hire a lawyer. I ask for a no vote. Representative Holtorf. Thank you, Madam Chair. <clears throat> I, too, share the concerns of my colleague from El Paso County, but I have a very simple question for the bill sponsor and the proponents of this bill. If my 86-year-old mother, who has reached a point in her life where she needs home care, has made a decision that she only wants, oh, by the way, who has been a widow for 16 years and is very personal and protective of her home, makes a statement that she only wants another woman to be employed as her caregiver. Does now she come afoul with the law and have to at 86 or 87 years old sit before the Colorado Civil Rights Commission when somebody may file a complaint against her for her home health care needs. Because if that is the case, this bill has no place in Colorado Revised Statute. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. So. In order to provide some procedural protections around the party that may find themselves on the other side of a complaint, um, I have a series of amendments that I'd like for this body to consider. So if you think of um, you know, a mom who decides, I, I'd like a babysitter for my four-year-old. And so I post on social media a post that says, um, I'd like a high school student to babysit my kid. Anybody know anyone? Or perhaps she belongs to a particular faith community and she posts on the social media faith communities group page um, a similar request, narrowing her search or narrowing her, her terms to a particular religious faith. She may now find herself at the other end of a civil rights complaint. And since this is an area of first instance, really, right, we, we don't really have case law directly on point here in Colorado related to domestic service, so far as I'm aware. We're, we're making analogies to other business communities and, and what has been decided in those business settings. But now we're dealing with individual people, just, you know, f your neighbor looking for somebody to do their gardening or their house cleaning or maybe cooking a particular meal. <clears throat> It, it occurs to me that we need to provide them with a greater degree of notice of what actually is deemed illegal discrimination and what is deemed appropriate um, action. And so in light of that, I move L005 and ask that it be displayed. <clears throat> so what this amendment would do... One second, Representative Luck. Sorry. Thank you. The amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for getting ahead. Um, so all this amendment would do is say to the commission, those records that you maintain, your final determinations on a particular claim, you have to publish that and make it available so that people know what you're finding is appropriate and inappropriate. We do the same thing for case law, and right? This is how we know what how, how the law is adjudicating our statutes. And so I think it's common practice. Um, the division, so you know, they already have to maintain this and make it available if you go into their office or you make a specific request. All we're saying is similar to a bill that I think we passed out of this chamber, if not, it will be coming here soon, about publicizing, publishing cases on the um, 
court websites so that people can easily access them without having a LexisNexis subscription, similar to that theory. And so therefore, I ask kindly for a yes vote. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Lantine. Thank you, Madam Chair. I appreciate um, Representative's luck and attention on um, House Bill 1367. Um, I would like to have some time to um, digest this and talk to my stakeholders, and this is not something that I can do right now or on the fly. And so for now, I would ask for a no vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L005. Those in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed, no. No. The noes have it. The amendment is lost. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, so the next amendment, again, seeks to just protect these individuals, these moms, these dads, these homeowners, um, a little bit more. And so I move L003 and ask that it be displayed. The amendment is properly before us. Please proceed, Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. So this, all this amendment would do would be to say that whoever the prevailing party is could ask for costs. So if a case is made, a claim is brought against this mom, and she's had to put forth all sorts of money in order to defend herself before the commission, if she wins, if she prevails, then she would be able to accept costs in that instance. We, again, we're not talking about a business versus an individual. We're talking about two individuals. And so I do believe that as a state, we have an interest in protecting both of them um, in, this, in this interest. So I ask for an I vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Weiss. Um, thank you. Um, you know, Rep Luck, I, I hear what you're saying. And I think, you know, go back to the underlying substantive conversation. When we look at an area like anti-discrimination law, the reason that we have the kind of existing language that this amendment seeks to modify uh, is to provide remedy for historic discrimination. And we know that that has operated in the space of employment. We know that that has operated in the domestic context. As you know, the, the very section that you propose to amend here uh, rightly calls out that there are remedies uh, for the defending party you know, where actions are brought frivolously, and, and you know, we've talked about all of that in other contexts, and in committee and here on the floor. This actually works a pretty big departure from the substantive law that we have evolved over many decades to provide remedies for uh, parties who've been discriminated against. I don't think it's appropriate to make this kind of quite substantial change, even if it's one word, in, in this way at this point. So I'm going to ask for a no vote on this amendment. Representative Carver. Members, this is one of the key consequences of, this is a huge bill. I hope everybody understands the significance of what we're doing here. Right now, under federal employment law, EEOC jurisdiction, and current Colorado law, The, the substantive law and the complaint process applies when you are, uh, for the federal law, a business of 15 employees or more, but it is within the realm of um, business and public accommodation, right? You are operating a business. You are subject to certain laws. The federal law has never, ever touched upon the private decisions that you make in how you advertise for somebody to come into your home to do the various types of tasks that you, do in, you want done in your home. Colorado law has never touched this. And so now it is one thing, although I, I think it's, it would be much fairer for either 
whether it's the defendant or the plaintiff, whoever prevails, to be able to get attorney's fees. At least under current law, you're a business. You probably have insurance. You probably have other ways to pay for an attorney. Now we are making individuals. That woman who is a domestic violence victim and does not want to hire a man, wants to do an advertisement to hire somebody to come in and do housework, which is not personal care, but does not want a man in her house. Well, guess what? Her, her advertisement for a female to come in and do housework is going to put her crosswise of a complaint. So not only is her personal decision based upon a very understandable sensitivity on who she has in her home going to get her hauled in front of a civil rights commission, she's going to have to hire an attorney, and even if she prevails, she is out of pocket for those attorney's fees. If the plaintiff wins, she gets to pay their attorney's fees, but if she wins, She's stuck. She eats those attorney's fees. How unfair is this, members? You know, I was out walking in my um, neighborhood, as I usually do when I go home for weekends, and um, Generally, I meet other neighbors that are out walking or out walking their dogs, and we kind of catch up on different legislation that's, they'll ask me if they've read something in the newspaper, and, and they said, well, what do you think is the most serious bill that's going to impact people like me? Just regular people living our lives, taking care of our family members, a bill that we've never heard of. And I said, well, what do you think about a bill that is going to subject you to a discrimination complaint and a legal process for making the following decisions about who you hire to come into your home to do the following tasks? And they said, Terry, you are kidding me. I said, no, I am not. No, I'm not kidding you. It passed the committee, and it's coming to the House floor. We didn't get into the part about how they're going to have to hire a lawyer, and even if they win, even if they win, they have to pay attorney's fees. Members, this is a big deal. This is a very significant piece of legislation. This touches everybody, every ordinary person not a person who's in a commercial business. Every individual person who is ever thinking about hiring somebody to come into their home to do anything, anything, they have now been pulled into the legal complaint world on how they advertise, on who they hire, on who they fire. My neighbors couldn't believe it. Number of them are progressive Democrats.
They say, well, you know, Terry, we really don't agree on a lot of your votes. I said, I know that. That's okay. We're friends anyway. They couldn't believe it. They don't agree with this. And we didn't even get to the part where they're stuck paying attorney's fees, for, for heaven's sake. Members, this is the wrong way to approach this issue. If we need to do a provision on domestic service and services being provided by particular businesses, whether we use the something smaller than the 15 person limit that's in the federal law and EEOC jurisdiction, Although I will tell you that in committee, what we heard were historical references going back to the Civil War and not things that are happening right now, particularly in these areas and concerns that we raised about very legitimate reasons for hiring individuals of a certain sex or a certain background or a certain religion to come into your home. And so respectfully, bill sponsors, I really wish there would be some willingness to step back and take another look at this part of the bill limit it to businesses, don't make the individual homeowner who is doing this looking for specific folks to come in and do very personal things in their home and now make them subject to this entire legal process is that really what we want to do? I, I don't think so. I don't think that's what the people of Colorado want. This bill touches every individual in this state. Because at some point, as we age, as our family members age, we are looking to hire folks to come into our home and help us with certain tasks. And now we've created and expanded this whole legal apparatus. So at the very least, at the very least, after we put them through the mill, because of how they've advertised for somebody to come in and do housework in their home, and they wanted a female, they wanted somebody that shared their faith and their values and their culture. After they've been hauled in front of the Civil Rights Commission, had to hire an attorney, and after all of that trauma, they win. They prevail. They don't get attorney's fees. But with this amendment, at least they would get their attorney's fees paid. Won't make up for the unforgettable mis uh, experience they just had, thanks to House Bill 1367, thank you very much. But at least they would get attorney's fees. So I ask for a yes vote on this amendment. Representative Lantin. So, if you are a household that employs 15 or more domestic servants, then this would apply, but otherwise it wouldn't. So I asked for a no vote, and I don't know many regular folks that can afford to employ 15 or more domestic workers to take care of their home. Thank you. Representative Carver. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Well. My understanding, and I uh, seek clarification from the bill sponsor, 
is that certainly the current rules for the Civil Rights Commission is that you get attorney's fees, the plaintiff does. But what we're saying is on this bill, if you are going to expand the jurisdiction to individual homeowners, you are now going to make them subject to Civil Rights Commission complaints and process that if they prevail, if they have to hire an attorney under this domestic service expansion of jurisdiction, that if they have a complaint filed against them and they hire an attorney and they prevail, they should be able to get their attorney's fees. That is my understanding of what this amendment does. I believe that that is right on the merits, and that is why I'm a yes vote on the amendment. It's my understanding that the, uh, I, I don't understand the bill sponsor's reference to 15, a business of 15 persons. That's, that's the federal jurisdiction for EEOC. Domestic service, I'm talking about what's in the bill. We're expanding EEOC, excuse me, Civil Rights Commission jurisdiction and legal obligations on individual homeowners making these hiring decisions on who comes into their home and does these very personal type of services, housework, cleaning, what have you. Anybody here ever do home services for independent living? This whole range of work in college. You are doing a range. It's almost always a senior who is, has mobility issues or uh, maybe some, the start of dementia, but they're with family members and other support services trying to stay in their home. It is very sensitive work. And family members and individuals want the ability to specify gender and who is going to work in, for that particular family member in that particular situation that they're going to feel comfortable bringing into their home, and many times that includes cultural and religious values. But it certainly includes gender. I ask for an I vote on the amendment. Let's at least give these folks reimbursement for their attorney's fees after they've been hauled through the Civil Rights Commission to make decisions they've always been able to make. Representative Locke. Thank you, Madam Chair. I did just wanna make one clarifying point. So while it is true that the, um, the defendant in the matter, the, the, the homeowner in the matter, would be able to acquire costs in the event that the claim was deemed frivolous, the reality is that there could be those defendants who are prevailing, that they win their case, and the action, the underlying action doesn't raise the level of, of being considered frivolous, right? So there might be those instances, or, or will be those instances, where they put forth a valid claim, but they lose on the merits, and so now that homeowner has to absorb all those costs. And again, we're talking about moms and dads and daughters and sons who are trying to provide services for either their home or their children or their loved ones, their, their parents. And so these aren't well-established businesses that have all of the resources at their disposal that businesses have. And so this just enables them to recover those costs in the event that they win that case. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of amendment L003. Those in favor say aye. Opposed, no? No! The amendment is lost. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, 
continuing down this road of trying to shore up process um, for fairness sake for both sides, I move amendment L006 and ask that it be displayed. The amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. So what this would do would be allow the respondent, so that individual homeowner, to take this out of the commission's authority and bring it into a court where they would then be able to have a jury trial. Now, the fact of the matter is, members, that all of us discriminate every single day. It's true. If you are married, you've discriminated against all those people you decided not to marry. If you belong to one of the many caucuses in this chamber uh, that meet based off of ideas or meet based off of identity points, you too discriminate. And we deem that to be appropriate. We deem that to be okay because we like to associate with, with people who share our values or share our understanding, share our cultures. And so it's important to provide these individuals with an on-ramp to present their case before members of their communities and to have a jury trial so that they can be deemed either to be acting rightly or not based off of those community standards. And so I ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Representative Weissman. Thank you, um, Madam Chair. Members, just two things on this. One, at the end of the administrative process that is the CCRD process, you can already get to court. Um, the whole reason that we have an administrative uh, rather than a purely judicial branch method of resolution, it's intended to be easier. It's intended to be a little bit less process heavy, uh, more able to be navigated without representation. You get to court, you have rules of procedure, you have rules of evidence. Uh, it is going to be candidly more challenging for a non-represented party to be there, although again, you have that option already. This is rather a significant procedural change. Uh, I don't think is something that should be done uh, casually um, in the current posture in which we find ourselves. Um, so I, I do ask for a no vote at this time. Representative Luck. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just to emphasize a point that was made by my distinguished colleague, who I respect greatly, um, the current commission doesn't have standard rules of procedure or evidence. So think about that. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of Amendment L006. Those in favor say aye. aye. Opposed, no. no. The amendment is lost. To the bill. Representative Lantine. Thank you, members, for your time and attention. I ask for a yes vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the bill? Seeing none, the question before us is a passage of House Bill 1367. All those in favor say, all those opposed say no. Those in, no. Those in favor say aye. aye. The ayes have it, House Bill 1367 passes. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of House Bill 1369. House Bill 1369 by Representative Sirota and Pelton, also Senators Story and Sonnenberg, concerning support for children's mental health programs. Representative Sirota. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1369, the Appropriations Report, and the Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services Report. To the Appropriations Report. Uh, this report uh, appropriates to, sorry. Um, this report, report appropriates $2 million from the IRTA fund to support the, the grant program. Any further discussion on the appropriations report? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the appropriations report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The appropriations report passes. To the public and behavioral health report. Representative Sirota. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This just added a simple tie to the 
The grant program is going to be living in the Department of Early Childhood, but we want to ensure that the reporting on the grant program happens um, to go to both the Department of Early Childhood and the Behavioral Health Administration. So this just completed that tie. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the Public and Behavioral Health Report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Public and Behavioral Health Report passes. To the bill, Representative Pelton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this bill authorizes the Department of Early Childhood to contract with CARA-based nonprofit entities to provide evidence-based two-generation and home-based prevention, early intervention, child's mental health programs on or before November 1st, 2022. The program must combine comprehensive coordinated services and psychotherapeutic intervention for caregivers and children. Families with children from prenatal to six years old are expect and are expecting experiencing chronic stress and drama are eligible for the program. The curriculum must connect families to needed services through the intensive care coordination. Is there any further discussion? Representative Sirota. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my co-prime uh, did a wonderful job describing what this grant program would do. We know that the pandemic has um, added a significant amount of stress and trauma to our children and our families. And this grant program will direct that um, some support toward our families with young children um, to, uh, with a two generation approach. Um, it is evidence based. It is sorely needed across our state right now. And we believe that a tremendous amount of uh, good can be done with this, not only therapeutic and wraparound services, but really uh, prevention to ensure that we are keeping families healthy and safe and out of the child welfare system. And Represent I ask for your yes vote. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I forgot to mention this is permissive. You don't have to participate in this if you don't want, but if you do, I think it's a good program. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 1369. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. Welcome. The ayes have it. House Bill 1369 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1380. House Bill 1380 by Representatives Gonzalez Gutierrez and Pelton, also Senators Bridges and Corm, concerning creating comprehensive statewide systems to provide improved access to critical program services that support low income households. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, House Bill 1380, the Appropriations Committee Report, the uh, Public and Behavioral Health and Human Services Report, and that's it. <laughs> to the Appropriations Report. Representative Pelton. Thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair. Appropriations gave us some money. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is a passage of the appropriations report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. The appropriations report is passed. <laughs> Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I believe we're on the committee report. I'll just um, note that we did make an amendment in the committee, um, most of it technical. Um, we did have to decrease some funds in one of the grant programs, um, but we will still have um, the amount of funds needed. And we also had to add 10% uh, admin to the Department of Ag. Uh, and we also made sure that the report submitted to the Agricultural Committee on the grant program also included information on the consortium, uh, such as information on grantees and the use of funds. I ask for your I vote on the committee report. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the Public and Behavioral Health Report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Public and Behavioral Health Report passes. <laughs> to the bill. <laughs> Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and, and I want to specifically thank Representative Pelton for joining onto this bill because I think it's incredibly important um, that we ha are coming together both. Um, you know, rural and urban in understanding the issue around food insecurity of our neighbors and folks in the state of Colorado. 
And so I'm incredibly proud to be able to, to sponsor this alongside, um, specifically because this bill actually came by way of one of my constituents who um, brought up a concerning issue that she was facing as a SNAP benefit recipient. We did a whole lot of research, a whole lot of work to figure out you know, what was really the root of the issue, and it really came down to a few things, one of them specifically being around uh, distribution of uh, food from um, whether it's you know, where, where it's coming from and how it's getting to the food retailers, whether it's the big box grocers or more importantly, um, the smaller food retailers in, in communities like in parts of my district. So I'm gonna just go over a couple of things what the bill does. Um, the bill creates the Community Food Access Program. The, it provides LEAP, um, the Low Income Energy Assistance Program database enhancements, and then the EBT integration as well as, as, well as the Colorado Employment First um, provision. And I'll turn it over to my host, Prime. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Madam Chair, and, and thank you, Representative, for including me on this bill. I want to start out by saying at least 30% of these dollars are spent in rural Colorado. We need to make uh, local farms and food systems more resilient, improve food access and flexibility for local retailers to serve their communities, uh, enhance the county systems that help administrate, administer nutrition program benefits to families with low or no incomes, and improve the overall food supply chain that connects Colorado agriculture to retailers uh, then provide food to families. Another thing that this bill does is it helps upgrade uh, the county's uh, work management systems. Uh, in most counties, there are about a 30% compliance rate, and there's a system out there uh, that is showing about 90% compliance, so this gives the counties opportunity to upgrade their work management systems. And uh, again, 30%, at least 30% of the funds will be spent in rural Colorado. I ask for your support. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. My co-prime in his remarks reminded me um, with regards to the work management system that we do have an amendment to the bill. Uh, I move uh, Amendment L2 and ask for it to be displayed. The amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this amendment came by way of the counties. Uh, they requested um, to, to make sure we had language that provided flexibility for upgrading their work management system that you heard Representative Pelton talk about just a moment ago. So I ask for an eye on the amendment. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of L002. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it, amendment L002 passes. To the bill. Wait, I thought we were on the bill. Yeah, that was the amendment. Yeah, we're done. Any, any yeah. further discussion on the bill? Yeah. <laughs> Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 1380. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1380 passes. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I move to lay over House Bill 1394, one bill. That will be laid over upon the request of uh, the Assistant Majority Leader. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1327. House Bill 1327 by Representatives Herod and McLaughlin, also Senators Moreno and Corm, concerning former Native American boarding schools in Colorado. I don't know. Representative McLaughlin. Yes. Um, yes, I move House. Do you want to move? Do you want to wait? Yeah. Okay. We, uh, <laughs> Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move to lay over House Bill 1327. Okay, this is gonna get tricky. I move to lay over House Bill 1327. Uh, actually, I move 
I moved for immediate consideration of House Bill 1149. Upon the motion of Assistant Majority Leader, we will move to House Bill 1149. Mr. Shebel, will you please read the title of House Bill 1149? House Bill 1149 by Representatives Lynch and Byrd, also Senators Rankin and Hansen, concerning the expansion of the Advanced Industry Investment Tax Credit. Sure. Oops. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would like to move House Bill 1149 and the Finance Committee Report and the Appropriations Committee Report. To the Appropriations Report. In appropriations, unfortunately, uh, they cut down the timeline on this, uh, the timeline of which uh, this, this uh, tax incentive would, would exist. But either way, we still like them. And uh, it just took, the, took it from 2028 to 2024. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the appropriations report. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The appropriations report passes. Uh, Representative Lynch to the finance report. Thank you, Madam Chair. So in the Committee on Finance, we changed a couple of the words in there that changed the, the type of corporation that would be eligible for this, this tax break. Also changed a couple of the uh, timelines from 28 to 27, but all those got changed again in appropriation, so that really didn't end up being a big deal. Uh, overall, we enjoyed our time in finance and uh, came out of there smiling. We ask for a yes vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the finance report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The finance report passes. To the bill, Representative Byrd. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you. So, uh, members, advanced industries are prime drivers of the United States and Colorado economy. They include advanced manufacturing, bioscience, electronics, aerospace, energy and natural resources, infrastructure engineering, and information technology industries. The economic impact of these industries accounts for nearly 30% of our state's wage earnings and nearly 30% of the total sales revenues across all industries within Colorado and nearly 35% of Colorado's exports. This bill will strengthen this important sector of Colorado's economy and incentivize investment that is necessary for its growth, growth that will include more well-paying jobs for the people in our state. The bill extends a current tax credit that is made available to investors in the advanced uh, industry businesses and increases the cap on the program from $750,000 to $4 million per year. In addition, the bill increases the tax credit allowed for investments made in rural and economically distressed areas of our state from 30 to 35 percent. The tax credits are not transferable. They are non-refundable, but may be carried forward for five years of the amount of the tax credit. We ask for a yes vote. Representative Lynch. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I, I think my co-prime explained mostly what's going on here, but this is really a good economic driver for our state. This allows us to do things, hopefully, like uh, bring, bring or make sure that the space industry stays in this state applies to those guys and a lot of the, 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 the biosphere, if you will, to give them incentives to come here. This is, a, this is a great bill. I couldn't be more happy to be on it, and I encourage a yes vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 1149. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1149 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1327. House Bill 1327 by Representatives Herod and McLaughlin, also Senators Moreno and Quorum, concerning former Native American boarding schools in Colorado. Representative McLaughlin. Yes, I move House Bill 1327 with the appropriations. And um, who else was there? <laughs> I believe uh, you need to move the State Civic Military and Veterans oh, and State Affairs. Affairs Report. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, to the Appropriations Report. Okay. Um, in uh, appropriations, uh, we got the money um, to go to the History Colorado to um, fund this program. 
Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the appropriations report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The appropriations report passes. To the state affairs report, uh, Representative McLaughlin. Thank you. We had another amendment there that um, essentially moved the program to History Colorado because they have been doing um, extensive work in this area already. So um, we are joining their efforts. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the State Affairs Report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The State Affairs Report passes. To the bill, Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this bill addresses uh, generations of injustice that has happened to indigenous peoples. Uh, it will look into our uh, known uh, Native American boarding schools uh, and find and decide or find um, the remains of indigenous relatives that have been buried under um, places like Fort Lewis College. Um, it will also study to determine how we want to proceed um, in identifying uh, not only the remains but how we want to designate the sites. I ask for an I vote. Representative McLaughlin. Thank you. Yeah, we are, um, this permits the uh, tribes to do the study. It will not be us doing it, but they are going to be working together. Um, millions of children have gone missing, and uh, we need to find out what happened to them. Representative Valdez D. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the bill sponsors for bringing House Bill 1327 forward. Members, this is a good bill, not only helping individuals in our community, but also in southern Colorado from Native Americans to indigenous people here in the state of Colorado and throughout the world. Because we need to find answers. We need to help our people now more than ever and continue to make sure answers are found, but also grow in our communities in more ways than one with heritage, culture, traditions. Traditions that will continue to educate our communities, but the next generation. With that, you have my support. Thank you. Representative Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you. I want to come up and say I'm in full support of this uh, uh, House Bill 1327. I, uh, I've been involved with uh, some of this with reinterments of our Native people in my past job, and this is an extremely important bill, and it's uh, something that needs to be done, and I support it 100%. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 1327. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1327 passes. Please read, uh, Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1394. House Bill 1394 by Representatives Esgar and Roberts, also Senators Winter and Donovan, concerning funding for just transition programs to assist communities with economic transitions. Madam Majority Leader Esgar. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1394, the uh, Transportation Committee and the Appropriations Committee reports. To the Appropriations Report. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the Appropriations <laughs> Committee, they uh, approved the appropriation for this bill. Ask for an I vote. There you go. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the Appropriations Report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Appropriations Report passes. To the Transportation Report, uh, Major Madam Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the Transportation Committee, we amended the bill to be sure that the office had the roll forward authority that it needs. Ask for an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the transportation report. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The transportation report passes. To the bill, Representative Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, very happy to be here to present House Bill 1394, which will add more funding to the just transition efforts happening in our state. When we set up the Just Transition Office in 2019, we were the first state in the country to do so, um, but we did not have the funding available to fully fund the programs of that office. This bill is the continuation of several efforts that have been made since then to make sure that that office has the support that it needs to get into these communities and provide workers with supports to make sure that they can transition into new employment opportunities, but also make sure that our communities across rural Colorado, including several that I am honored to represent who are going 
going through this transition have the tools and the resources they need to diversify their economies and create new employment opportunities for people in the community. Um, this is a very important step forward. We heard yesterday in committee from several people who said this is the exact type of support that they need to continue their work uh, for planning for the future when uh, coal plants and power plants go into retirement uh, it, at the, over the course of the next few years. Um, this proactive measure is very important for rural Colorado and our transitioning communities, and I urge an I vote. Sir, any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the, oh, Representative Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just want to come up and give, uh, give support in this bill, 1394. This is a bill, the, uh, the economic development part of it and the co-worker trans transition part of this. This, uh, this was, I was, when I first came here, it was 19, uh, House Bill 1913 14, which created this. And um, this is a much needed bill. I think, I, I appreciate the 15 million. I know we need more than this, uh, but uh, we're pecking away at it a bite at a time. And uh, this is very important to the communities I represent and a much needed bill. So thank you to the sponsors for this. Thank you. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of House Bill 1394. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. House Bill 1394 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1131. <clears throat> House Bill 1131 by Representatives Gonzalez Gutierrez and Bacon. Also, Senator Gonzalez, concerning measures to reduce adjusted involvement for young children and in connection therewith, focus on prevention and age-appropriate interventions. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1131, the Appropriations Committee Report, the Judiciary Committee Report, and I also move Amendment L27. L27 is a multi-page amendment that was placed on your desk yesterday. And I ask for it to be displayed, even though it's many pages. <laughs> the amendment has been properly displayed. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, Members, Amendment L27, which you all should have received yesterday, uh, strikes, it is a strike below, which means that it alters this bill significantly. What this uh, strike below will do is it will no longer include the provision where 10, 11, and 12-year-olds would have no longer been able to be charged with juvenile delinquency charges after a year and a half of allowing time for a task force to determine how that would happen, how they would receive services, how victims would receive services. So what this strike below does is instead creates a task force uh, that will be made up of many different partners and housed under the Department of Human Services where we will have folks that are coming from the schools, from our treatment providers that know how to work with young people and have been working with young people, restorative justice, we will have law enforcement represented, we will have judicial, probation, and legal folks represented, community members, impacted folks, including youth. We will have our state and county departments also represented as well as appointed elected officials specifically from uh, this body and, and from the Senate. What that task force will be tasked with is to look at how we currently serve 10, 11, and 12-year-olds that are involved in the juvenile justice system and to look, in, to look at what is the alternative how can we serve these young people without involving them in the juvenile justice system? How can we serve their families? How can we serve those that may be involved um, in, in whatever scenarios or situations they may find themselves in? So members, I, uh, you know, this particular strike below came by way of months and months of work 
that we have done with stakeholders. And we have been completely transparent the entire time and have maintained a level of collaboration that I think goes beyond what I've seen happen in other bills. Uh, Representative Bacon. Thank you. I'd like to thank my co-sponsor, um, along with all of the people who helped us in drafting this bill and thinking through these questions. That also includes the young people and the children that we heard from. Um, members, the bill has been shifted to a task force, and that's what we would like to be able to focus um, on and be able to discuss. Ultimately, we have posed the question um, that if we would make these shifts to young people being connected to accountability, as well as rehabilitation, as well as services and supports, um, through existing services that are not the criminal justice system, what is it that we need to understand and identify by way of gaps to be able to make that shift? So this is a market change from the bill as uh, brought forward. However, we're still posing the question and tasking people into being able to answer it. I will also note that the reason why, again, that we did not push this task force towards CCJJ, or the Commission on Criminal and Juvenile Justice, um, is quite honestly because of their own arguments. Um, you may have seen some information or even a one-pager out on this issue. We are making the statement that we need to be able to shift and provide services to young people and to not use the criminal justice system. Um, but they've also clearly and plainly asserted how they feel about the topic and how they feel about kids in this age group. So for us to then send this question to the same group that has made it plain that they don't have an interest in answering it, we feel like is antithetical to what we are trying to accomplish as well. And so again, we thank you and urge support on the task force. We believe that there's so much more that we can learn as legislators and as policymakers from this work as well, including the needs of counties, including um, data and tracking of topics like recidivism on how to separate the notion of victim and offender because they are not two different things. Um, and again, Regardless of where we may feel today, these are questions that we all deserve, we believe, we deserve as a community, as a state, and as policymakers to help us answer so that we are not making decisions down the line where we do not have responses, data, and insights to rely on. So we urge an I vote on the amendment. Um, Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. The last thing I'll add is that this strike below was, um, you know, written in conjunction with the State Department of Human Services. I just want the State Department of Human Services to know that we are committed to continuing to make sure we're crafting appropriate language as this task force would be under housed under them. I will say that in our stakeholding process and throughout our stakeholding process, the counties have indicated to us that they would prefer that this task force live under the State Department of Human Services where you have a myriad of expertise when it comes to child development youth development, uh, and they also do house Division of Youth Services, which is part of the juvenile justice system, as well as the Colorado Youth Detention Continuum, which is formerly known as Senate Bill 94, and does the pretrial services for kids that get arrested or get a juvenile delinquency charge. So all of these entities actually live under the State Department of Human Services, and so it makes the most sense um, from a policy standpoint why this belongs under the Department of Human Services. I ask for your I vote. Representative Carver. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I offer an amendment to L027 and ask that it be displayed. I move 
L029, which is an amendment to L027. That amendment is properly before us. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we had a fairly robust hearing, as you can imagine, on this bill in judiciary. And one of the concerns um, that we had, in addition to you know doing away with juvenile justice jurisdiction, um, is that, which I understand the strike below um, has modified that, but it was not clear in the bill, and I don't believe it's clear in the strike below, L027, that the recommendations that come out of the, the task force, the commission, will make no changes. I mean, it's, it's DHS doesn't get to just implement these recommendations. This must come back to the General Assembly. If we are going to go forward with an alternate system and approach to crimes committed by 10, 11, and 12-year-olds, then those recommendations must be made back to the General Assembly, and the General Assembly must do its full legislative process in studying the recommendations having committee hearings with testimony on the recommendations. The language in the introduced bill, and I did not see clarification in the strike below, perhaps I missed it, but the language in the introduced bill seemed to say that this task force makes recommendations and DHS goes ahead and implements. No. I don't think so. Um, now, the point was made, well, you'd have to come back to the legislature for funding um, for DHS to do this. Uh, now, if we are going to substantively change how we approach criminal behavior by 10, 11, and 12-year-olds, that is huge. It's not just funding. We need the full legislative process with public testimony, public participation in any alternate approach. And so this amendment makes that explicit, that those recommendations, it's, it's not just doing a report to certain committees, which the strike below does have, as did the introduced version. It is what we have, what we do with interim committees, what we require of the CCJJ when they put forth legislative recommendations, is that it has to come back to the legislature as a piece of legislation that gets the full vetting process of the House and the Senate. And that's what this bill does. Um, and it, it does, uh, there'll be uh, actually a series of amendments, um, but uh, wanted to do this in specific parts uh, to deal first with uh, again, the legal requirement to make the recommendations to the General Assembly um, for their action or not, uh, and the report as well to the committees, and ask for an I vote. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Carver. Um, it would have been probably Great for us to connect on this. I will say that if you turn to page six of the strike below, um, 
it exactly says what you're asking for. Um, it says the task force shall create a report containing the examination and recommendations made by the task force to the judiciary committees of the House of Representatives and the Senate and to the Public Behavioral Health and Human Services Committee. So it's not just going in front of one committee, it's going in front of two, understanding the breadth of the particular um, subject matter that we're talking about. I will add that I believe your amendment pretty much strikes the entirety of the strike below. And I cannot support that, members. We crafted this strike below um, in a very meaningful way to do exactly what Representative Carver is asking, which is to have a task force and to bring it back to the legislature. There will not be an implementation of the change of jurisdiction. That is what has been significantly changed in this strike below. And you know, essentially has taken the main component of this bill. It's no longer there, what was in the introduced version. So I ask for a no on Amendment L29. Representative Carver. Um, thank you, Assistant Majority Leader and Madam Chair. Well, the language of L029, uh, we are striking lines 6 through 38 on page 1, and we are doing a substitute. So it is an amendment to the underlying amendment, strike below amendment, offered by the bill sponsors. So that is the intent. It is to clarify, again, the discussion in the committee was the implication that the task force recommendations could somehow go forward and not have to, that DHS would, would implement and it didn't have to come back to the legislature for action. This makes that express. It is not the same thing, members, just to do a report to certain committees and then to go forward and implement recommendations. No. No. Any alternate system of dealing with crimes committed by 10, 11, and 12-year-olds must come back in every respect, every substantive provision of this alternate system to a juvenile justice system must come back to the legislature for full legislative vetting, for amendment, for committee hearings, for public testimony, our full legislative process. And that's what this does. It makes that explicit. And again, um, Assistant Majority Leader, um, I know this was a topic of conversation in committee as I was reading through the strike below and perhaps I missed it. It still, I still did not see this explicit language of the recommendations having to come back to the General Assembly and for action. And so if, if, I, have, um, if I have missed that, I apologize. This makes it explicit. Representative Bacon. Thank you, members. I'd like to, again, encourage a no vote on this amendment. I'd like to bring your attention to the first two lines. This amendment says to strike page 1, 6 through 38, which is the whole page, and then strike the rest of the bill, where it says strike, I'm sorry, the rest of the amendment, where it says strike pages 2 through 5 and page 6. So what would be left are these paragraphs that you see here. It also strikes who is on the task force. Which, what the membership is on the task force. Um, and I do want to reiterate um, the point that we made. Some of these decisions that the task force will look into do not, may not be necessarily uh, need to be made at the state level as counties can weigh in on um, things that they want to change. And for anything that would change at the state level, including any of the state agencies, the funding, and the purview, and literally the age of delinquency, will have to come before the legislature. So um, because of um, how agencies and current law is written, we know 
we will have to hear these things in the legislature. And again, I just want to point out the remainder of the amendment strikes everything else in it. So um, please, again, vote no for this amendment. Any further discussion on amendment L29? Oh, Representative Carver. Um, uh, thank you, uh, bill sponsors, for the discussion. Um, you know, as I mentioned in committee, um, I never have a problem with looking at an alternate way to address a problem. And we have dealt with juvenile justice as an alternate system for minors who commit crimes. And we, uh, in my eight years here, have dealt with many v bills to reform the juvenile justice system. And as I stated in committee, uh, I think we should always be open to alternate approaches um, and a fresh look at how we handle um, this whole range of uh, criminal conduct, uh, some of them quite serious, um, in the state of Colorado and see if that needs to be an alternate system to juvenile justice uh, or uh, if we need changes within the juvenile justice system itself to address whatever we think those shortcomings are. So um, I do appreciate the, um, the conversation um, and would offer a uh, substitute amendment to L029. I move L033 and ask that it be displayed. Amendment L033 is properly before us. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is the same amendment, uh, but it clarifies that we are amending a certain section of the strike below. Again, to clarify that all of these recommendations need to come back to the full General Assembly. It is not just committees that have an interest in how we deal with criminal activity by 10, 11, and 12-year-olds. It's the entire General Assembly. Um, it is uh, a very um, critically important issue. And this also replicates the kind of process we see with CCJJ. There is to be no implementation of an alternate system from these recommendations um, until the legislature acts on the recommendations. Vote yes, vote no, do a modification after the full legislative process. And that's what the uh, substitute amendment would clarify. And um, if that's the bill sponsor's intent, uh, respectfully, I think this language does make it crystal clear in a report to the General Assembly, very similar to how we substantively require CCJJ to submit their legislative recommendations back to the General Assembly. Ask for an I vote. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, I am going to ask for a no vote on this amendment L33 that is substitute. And I think it's pretty clear why we stated in our remarks with regards to the underlying strike below uh, L27. Um, we stated the reason as to why 
it is not appropriate for this task force to live under the CCJJ. And as my co-prime mentioned earlier, you all should have received a document on your desks, every single one of you, that explains the thought behind that. I just want to reiterate the fact that this, what this amendment will do is will require it to go not only through CCJJ, but then I also um, have the underlying part of our strike below, which was the task force under CDHS, to also look at this. And so I think that's very duplicative of, of our systems, of what we're asking them to do. Um, secondly, as a member of CCJJ, I will tell you that I am one of three members on the commission that have expertise specifically working with youth. And I can say that with confidence, as I am well aware there have been several times that I am usually the one that asks the question, does this apply to youth? How does this apply to juveniles? And folks usually don't have an answer. So I, I know that the CCJJ includes the words juvenile justice, but I want to remind folks that the purpose of this task force is to look at how we can serve these youth outside of the juvenile justice system, which means we want to pull from expertise of our schools, the people that are working with our children directly, from treatment providers that have experience working with our children directly, from restorative justice partners that have been doing this work for years, from our law enforcement partners that also have interaction for, with our youth, from our probation officers that work with youth on their caseloads. So they're working with youth. We're asking for our county departments of human services, our child welfare departments to be a part of this task force. So I just want to remind you of why this must be under the Department of Human Services to vote no on Amendment L33 because this will just create an additional process that is unnecessary. And I will remind you, in the strike below, we do have the, the task force coming back to report to the legislature. Nothing will be implemented. They will be reporting back their recommendations to the legislature, to both the judiciary and the public health and human services, sorry, public and behavioral health and human services committees which is completely appropriate given the subject matter. So I ask for a no on L33, and I ask for an S yes on L27. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's an honor to serve with you. Honor to serve with you as well. So just uh, going back to the amendment, uh, first of all, members, it's incredibly important that we've already created a structure, the CCJJ, and I am going to push back here a little bit. Um, the, the sponsor of this bill it, you know, is a commissioner on the CCJJ, and she did eloquently point out that she does bring the voice, uh, along with several others, of juveniles to the commission. And that's also why you're there, is to have that voice, along with others on the commission. That's why it's called the Colorado Criminal and Juvenile Justice Commission. It has been around for a number of years, has been very effective at working uh, to create model legislation that then is handed to members of either the House or Senate to then be able to carry. But on top of that, we know that the CCJJ is the most appropriate place to look at bills like this because House Bill 19-1149, um, uh, which directed the CCJJ to look at 18 to 24 year olds in the juvenile justice and criminal justice systems, that was referred to the CCJJ and they took a deep dive into it. Uh, 18 to 24. And what we have here with Amendment L33 that we're uh, currently talking about, it directs the CCJJ to look both inside and outside the juvenile justice system, which is very important. That's a very specific and targeted direction to the CCJJ. Uh, this you know, I, uh, I briefly sat on the CCJJ myself, and I can tell you uh, from firsthand experience, the experts that are involved there, uh, the brain power is incredible. Uh, there's representatives from victims, representatives uh, who uh, represent those on probation who've committed crimes, 
uh, those who are victims of crimes. We, we have uh, district attorneys. We have judges on the commission. We have um, uh, parole on the commission. Uh, we also have um, DOC on the commission. We also have um, public defenders. Uh, the ACLU is on the commission. It's a very broad and diverse group. It's the ultimate stakeholder group that's been in place and they work together. One of the hardest things when looking at um, policy in the future is that you have to bring stakeholders together. And so it's the question of who do you invite to come to the table? And you may lay it out in statute as, uh, as One Direction has pointed out in this bill. But then there's hurdles and challenges that comes with that, such as the stakeholders may not know each other. They may not work well with each other. Or you may <laughs> decide to only go with people that you know that are going to produce the outcome that you want, rather than experts in the field. Having a commission that has already been set up in law, one that's already been functional, one that has a proven track record of success, and one that we as a General Assembly refer stuff to all the time, that's the most appropriate commission to look at this. I can't stress that enough. And uh, I like Amendment uh, 33, just because of the instruction it gives to the CCJJ. It's the instruction to look at the juvenile justice system both inside and outside. And that is very important. Members, I would encourage a yes vote on this amendment. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on Amendment L033? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Amendment L033. All those in favor say aye. 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 Those opposed, no. no. The noes have it. Amendment L033 fails. Back to Amendment L029, Representative Carver. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I withdraw L029 and instead move L031. Amendment L029 will be withdrawn. And ask that it be displayed. Amendment L031 is properly before us. Please proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. While the previous amendment uh, attempted to clarify the process, this amendment does uh, the changes that would directly go through the strike below and make it clear that this is a task that should be at the CCJJ. I will tell you that in my eight years here, my first year was 2015, the bulk of the legislative recommendations that we received from CCJJ dealt with the juvenile justice system. And you have members on the CCJJ that are expert I have also seen during my time on the CCJJ that when we go down to individual work groups that it is uh, not unusual at all to reach out to uh, in other individuals that are not members of the CCJJ to be involved in that work, in that discussion, in offering um, additional perspectives, recommendations, etc. And quite frankly, I have found the CCJJ members to be very open to new ways, new approaches, and with the flexibility to pull in uh, additional uh, folks with expertise and perspectives and an alternate way to deal with uh, minors 10, 11, and 12 who have committed crimes. The CCJJ structure is the best structure with that flexibility to examine these tasks. And you'll see in L031 
that we would have the commission look at all of the issues uh, that are in the strike below. The, the full range of, of uh, options and perspectives and alternatives. But let's utilize the, the tried and true method of CCJJ, which has come out with some extraordinary reform bills. And they are open to fresh thinking. Um, and so I do believe that this is the best approach, and under their established approach, we know those legislative recommendations are going to come back to the General Assembly as for an I vote. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, members, this essentially does Again, it, we've heard it that this would put it under CCJJ. I just want to say that the intent of our stakeholders, um, folks that have been working with us on this bill, um, and the intent of, of the sponsors with our own expertise as well in working with young people involved in these systems and outside of these systems, um, I will just say that the intent is to have this housed under the Department of Human Services, not under the CCJJ, for all the reasons that I went through earlier um, that are very well spelled out in the document that you have all received. I ask for a no vote on this amendment. Is there any further discussion on Amendment L031? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Amendment L031. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The noes have it. Amendment L031 is lost. We are now back to Amendment L027. Representative Bacon. Thank you, members. Again, this is the strike below as we proposed. We urge an I vote. Is there any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Amendment L027. All those in favor say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Amendment L027 passes. To the bill. Amendment L027 was a strike below and struck the appropriations report and the judiciary report, so we are now to the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to make sure we were on the right um, path with the process. Uh, I just want to um, you know, thank the Judiciary Committee for the work that they did in, in committee. And you know we're on the bill, but a lot of the work has been done as we've gone through all of the committees. I want to um, you know, turn the floor over um, to some of our colleagues here who may have something to say before you know, we make uh, some fi final remarks on this. Uh, Representative Amabile. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I guess I'm just going to do what I always do, which is to say that a lot of kids actually are really suffering with various mental illnesses, and uh, they've experienced trauma. And it makes sense to me that we should not be running kids, 10-year-old kids, through the criminal justice system. But instead, we should be getting them to care, and we shouldn't be um, altering their life in a way that is really hard to unalter uh, when, they're, when they're so young. Uh, last year, we ran a bill that talked about juveniles on the sex offender registry. And we, I met with parents who had 10-year-old kids who did things like mooning a kid on the playground. And they got charged with a sex offense when they were 10 years old. And they were forced to register. Their families are ripped apart because they can't live with their siblings anymore. And that is a wrong that that piece of legislation was trying to write, but it was really only just about one very narrow part, which was the registry. But really, we should be looking at what are we doing? Why are kids 
committing crimes when they're 10 or 11 or 12 years old? And how do we as a society fix that? And I don't believe that's by running them through the criminal justice system. And if it was, then we would have the most healthy kids in the entire world, and we don't. So I urge an I vote on this bill. Is there any further discussion? Uh, Representative Carver. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, bill sponsors. Uh, and as always, so appreciate how both of you engage on the issues. And you do, in committee and on the floor, and it is greatly appreciated. Um, you know, I, I do have some pause um, because in creating this alternate task force uh, with the reports to the committees, it simply does not have the same kind of express procedural language as CCJJ. I just don't see it in this strike below. Now maybe that's the implication, but it is not in this strike below the way it is in the structure of CCJJ. Um, and so, you know, it, it talks about, uh, which, is, which is fine, you know, identifying existing programs and funding that could be repositioned, that's fine. It, of course you're going to analyze that. But I don't want there to be any implication, which I found in the introduced bill, that we can move forward in implementing an alternate approach within existing programs and existing funding and do that diversion without express legislative authorization and vetting of those recommendations. So um, I would just, if it is your intent, if it is your intent that this task force operate procedurally like CCJJ, uh, then I would certainly encourage, uh, as the bill is likely to move forward, putting that in the bill. Um, the absence of that language, um, as well as I, I am comfortable with CCJJ. So those are the two reasons why I am a no. I could be a yes if we were just going to do a hard look at an alternate approach. Look at what the data is. Look at what other states are doing. Is there a better way to deal with 10, 11, and 12-year-olds that are doing low-level crimes up to very, very serious felonies? Of course we should be willing to look at that and see if there is a better way forward. But I have to say, I think the task force is not balanced. The membership is not balanced. I think they're predisposed to come up with a conclusion. Um, and it is not in any way balanced between further reforms to juvenile justice versus an entirely new alternate system. And I don't think it has the right level, the right kinds of expertise with the right balance, which I think we could accomplish with CCJJ. Um, but I just want to put on the record and um, always appreciate the straightforward uh, way that the sponsors deal with their bills that if, in fact, it is the intent that these recommendations come back, that they are not to be implemented, even if the agency thinks they, they have authority, that they're not to be implemented with an alternate approach until vetted and approved by the legislature. And so uh, I am a no on the current bill and 
with enough changes um, should it come back to the House uh, would like to be a yes, but I am not there yet. Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I also uh, rise in opposition of uh, the current bill uh, as amended by Amendment 27 that struck out the appropriate report and the Judiciary Report. I um, happen to be uh, serving uh, on Judiciary Committee the day uh, that at least the amendment package was heard. And I was promised by someone that would be a short day in Judiciary, but uh, apparently it wasn't true. <laughs> no, it's a little bit of a tongue in cheek there. I, I do appreciate the, the work that you've done and the fact that at every step of the way, uh, there has been a lot of efforts to amend this. What greatly concerns me is, is creating a new structure in government, an, uh, another commission that then creates more recommendations, but instead of it coming back to the General Assembly to take the form of a bill, it instead would be implemented by the department, or at least it, that's how it appears uh, in the text is what is leading to happen. And that's of concern because not knowing what the recommendations are going to be, at least under the underlying bill, the introduced bill, I mean, we're, we're talking thousands of serious offenses that um, a, a juvenile um, between 10 and 13 could be committing. The other thing I want to point out is that even going back to the statute of Glanville, which is the oldest uh, statute known to the uh, Anglo peoples, 10 was that, that cutoff for criminal responsibility. And so for the first time in almost 2,000 years, we're now looking at moving that up to 13. <laughs> and while, while that's what was proposed under the um, original bill, I do find that it's troubling the, the direction we've gone. Um, I do appreciate the number of amendments that um, you've, you've both added and taken off and now added again. But I will be a no today. And uh, like my colleague from El Paso County, uh, I, I would like to get to a point where, where I could be a yes. But for me, the real key is any recommendations must come back to the General Assembly. And, and that must be spelled out. Thank you. Is there any? Representative Benavides. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, you know, members, um, my colleague reminded me of that meeting that evening. And it was a very long meeting in judiciary when we first heard this bill. And we heard from families, and we heard from children. Um, and a lot of what people said all takes place. But we're still talking about kids from 10 years old till 13 years old. And the biggest issue in that committee was um, if we made a change right away to 10 years, what would happen for those 10 to 13 year olds if there was no system set up to deal with the issues they were presenting that in the past they had been charged as a crime and went into the criminal justice system. And that was the biggest concern of both sides um, when we had that hearing. Is, and it was referred to as a gap, a gap in our system of how you address that. And I think that the strike below um, that, and the bill now that we're voting on addresses that. We are not trying to address how 13 years old and above are functioning in the criminal justice system. And we heard a lot of good testimony. We heard from DAs that talked about their diversion that they use with young people, that the things they have in place so these charges don't follow these young people. But all of those things were coming from the criminal justice arena. They weren't coming from the behavioral, um, well not behavioral health, the human services part as to if, if you have an 11 year old that does something that maybe in the past they would have been charged criminally, we don't have a system of how you address it. So that's what this bill is about. It's saying if we're contemplating 
lowering the age. It doesn't lower it now, but it says if we're going to contemplate that, we have to have a system in place for between 10 years old and under 13. We don't have that. There was full agreement on that. What this says is let's get people together that can figure out what that system should be. And I get perplexed because at the page six, it says the task, task force report will come back to the judiciary committees of both the House and the Senate. There is nothing to say it t takes final action. It has to come back to us. The bill says it does that. So when people come up and say it doesn't, I, I don't understand that because it's very clear. It just says we're going to look at this system from 10-year-olds to 13-year-olds that we don't have in place now. And when we look at, I, I mean, I, I don't think CCJJ is equipped for that. I got this nice little chart from the proponents, and there was only one person under um, treatment providers, uh, schools, and restorative justice, one. And I'm not saying CCJJ doesn't do good work on the criminal justice system, but we're talking about the non-criminal justice system, and we need different people to figure out what that system will be. So I think the proposed um, uh, structure of the task force is what's needed to look at that pre-criminal justice area, and that's what this bill does. So I think it's a great bill, and I support it. Representative Bockenfeld. Representative Bockenfeld, did you want to go? It's an honor to serve with you, Madam Chair. Honor to serve with you. Seems like there's a lot of confusion in regards to this bill. I ask for the bill to be read at length. Uh, you've heard the motion. The bill will be read at length. Second regular session, 73rd General Assembly State of Colorado introduced. LLS No. 22-488.01 Jacob Boss X 2173 House Bill 22 to 1131. House Committees, Senate Committees, Judiciary. A bill for an act. 101 concerning measures to reduce justice involvement for. 102 young children, and, in connection therewith, focus on 103 prevention and age-appropriate interventions. Bill summary. Note, this summary applies to this bill as introduced and does not reflect any amendments that may be subsequently adopted. If this bill passes third reading in the House of Introduction, a bill summary that applies to the re-engrossed version of this bill will be available at http colon slash slash leg.colorado.gov. The bill changes the minimum age of a juvenile who is subject to the juvenile court's jurisdiction. Under current law, juveniles who are 10 years of age and older can be prosecuted in juvenile court. The bill removes juveniles who are 10, 11, and 12 years of age from the juvenile court's jurisdiction and increases the age for a prosecution in juvenile. House Sponsorship Gonzalez Gutierrez and Bacon, Joe Day, Sirota, Woodrow. Senate Sponsorship Quorum and Gonzalez. Shading denotes House Amendment. Double underlining denotes Senate Amendment. Capital letters or bold and italic numbers indicate new material to be added to existing statute. Dashes through the words indicate deletions from existing statute. Court to 13 years of age, except in the case of a homicide, then the juvenile court's jurisdiction extends to juveniles who are 10, 11, and 12 years of age. The bill changes the minimum age of a county court's concurrent original jurisdiction with the district court in criminal actions that constitute misdemeanors or petty offenses to a person who is 13 years of age. The bill changes the minimum age of a municipal court's jurisdiction for a charge of a municipal offense to a person who is 13 years of age. The bill clarifies that juveniles who are 10, 11, and 12 years of age may be taken into temporary custody by law enforcement for safety and then may be referred to appropriate services. Existing funding used to serve children who are 10, 11, and 12 years of age through the Colorado Youth Detention Continuum may continue to serve those children. Under current law, a juvenile court may transfer the juvenile to district court for criminal proceedings under certain conditions. The bill eliminates the ability for the juvenile court to transfer the juvenile to the district court for juveniles who are 12 or 13 years of age. Furthermore, for a juvenile who is 14 years of age or older, the bill changes the current authority of the juvenile court to transfer the juvenile's case for any delinquent act that constitutes any felony to only any delinquent act that constitutes a class 1 or class 2 felony or a crime of violence. The bill extends certain sentencing limitations that are currently provided to juveniles who are 10 or 11 years of age to juveniles who are 13 or 14 years of age. One be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Colorado. 
2. Section 1. Legislative Declaration. 1. The General Assembly. 3. Finds and declares that. 4. A. Children who are charged with crimes and subjected to the 5. Juvenile justice system are more likely to enter the criminal justice system. 6. As adults, more likely to present a future threat to community safety, more. 7. Likely to face mental health challenges, and less likely to graduate from. 8. High school. 9. B. Younger children who are in the juvenile justice system are at. 10. A higher risk of becoming victims of violence within the juvenile justice. Dash 2. HB 22-1131. 1. System. 2. C. Children of color are more likely to be referred to the juvenile free justice system and detained in juvenile justice facilities than white four children, and 5. D. Existing systems, including behavioral health programs, six schools, child welfare systems, and other local programs and services, are 7 better equipped than the juvenile justice system to address the needs of 8 young children and to provide developmentally appropriate services to 9 improve community safety by reducing the risk that these children tend to commit future crimes as adults. 11. 2. Therefore, the General Assembly declares its intent to empower 12 community-based responses in the health, education, and child welfare 13 systems to serve children who are under 13 years of age. The General 14 Assembly supports evidence-based and promising practices and programs 15 that improve outcomes for children and community safety, and reduce 16 and eliminate racial and ethnic disparities. 17. Section 2. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 13-6-106, Amend. 18.1a, as follows, 1913 6 106 Original Criminal Jurisdiction 1. The County Court 20 shall have concurrent original jurisdiction with the District Court in the 21 following criminal matters. 22. A. Criminal actions against a person who is 13 years 23 of age or older for the violation of state laws which constitute 24 misdemeanors or petty offenses, except those actions involving children 25 over which the Juvenile Court of the City and County of Denver or the 26 District Courts of the State, other than in Denver, have exclusive 27. Jurisdiction Dash 3 HB 22-1131 1 Section 3 in Colorado Revised Statutes, Amend 13-10-103 as two follows, 313-10-103. Applicability. This Article 10 applies to and governs for the operation of municipal courts in the cities and towns of this state. 5. Except for the provisions relating to the method of salary payment for six municipal judges, the incarceration of children pursuant to Sections 719-2.5-305 and 19-2.5-1511, the appearance of the parent, guardian, or eight lawful custodian of any a child who is 13 years of age or older 9 but under 18 years of age who is charged with a municipal offense 10 as required by Section 13-10-111, the right to a trial by jury for petty 11 offenses pursuant to Section 16-10-109, rules of Procedure promulgated 12 by the Supreme Court and appellate procedure. This article may 10th be 13 superseded by charter or ordinance enacted by a home rule city. 14 section 4. In Colorado revised statutes 13-10-111 amend 15 5 as follows. 1613-10-111. Commencement of actions process. 5 upon the 17 request of the municipal court, the prosecuting municipality, or the 18 defendant, the clerk of the municipal court shall issue a subpoena for the 19 appearance, at any and all stages of the court's proceedings, of the parent, 20 guardian, or lawful custodian of any child who is 13 years of 21 age or older but under 18 years of age who is charged with a 22 municipal offense. Whenever a person who is issued a subpoena pursuant 23 to this subsection, 5, fails, without good cause, to appear, the court may 24th issue an order for the person to show cause to the court as to why the 25 person should not be held in contempt. Following a show cause hearing, 26, the court may make findings of fact and conclusions of law and may enter 27 an appropriate order, which may include finding the person in contempt. Dash 4 HB 22-1131. 1 Section 5. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 13-10-113, Amend 2, 4, and 5, as follows, 313-10-113. Fines and penalties. 4. Notwithstanding any four provision of law to the contrary, a municipal court has the authority to 5 order a child who is 13 years of age or older but under 6 18 years of age confined in a juvenile detention facility operated or 7 contracted by the Department of Human Services or a temporary holding 8 facility operated by or under contract with a municipal government for 9 failure to comply with a lawful order of the court, including an order to 10 pay a fine. Any confinement of a child for contempt of municipal court 11 shall must not exceed 48 hours. 12. 5. Notwithstanding any other provision of law, a juvenile, as 13 defined in section 19-2.5-102, a child who is 13 years of age 14 or older but under 18 years of age who is arrested for an 15 alleged violation of a municipal ordinance, convicted of violating a 16 municipal ordinance or probation conditions imposed by a municipal 17 court or found in contempt of court in connection with a violation or 18 alleged violation of a municipal ordinance must not be confined in a jail, 19 lockup, or other place used for the confinement of adult offenders but May 20th be held in a juvenile detention facility operated by or under contract 21 with the Department of Human Services or a temporary holding facility 22 operated by or under contract with a municipal government that shall 23 receive and provide receives and provides care for the juvenile child 24 who is 13 years of age or older but under 18 years 25 of age. 
A municipal court imposing penalties for violation of probation 26 conditions imposed by such court or for contempt of court in connection 27 with a violation or alleged violation of a municipal ordinance may confine. Dash 5 HB 22 dash 1131. One, a juvenile child who is 13 years of age or older, but under 2 18 years of age pursuant to section 19-2.5-305 for up to 348 hours in a juvenile detention facility operated by or under four contract with the Department of Human Services. In imposing any jail five sentence upon a juvenile for violating any municipal ordinance when the six municipal court has jurisdiction over the juvenile pursuant to section 719-2.5-103-1A2, a municipal court does not have the authority to eight order a juvenile child who is under 18 years of age to a juvenile nine detention facility operated or contracted by the Department of Human 10 Services. 11 section 6. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 17-1-103, repeal 12, 1N, as follows, 1317-1-103. Duties of the Executive Director. 1. The duties of the 14 Executive Director are, 15 N, to contract with the Department of Human Services to house 16 in a facility operated by the Department of Human Services any juvenile. 17. Under the age of 14 years who is sentenced as an adult to the 18 Department of Corrections, and to provide services for the juvenile 19 pursuant to Section 19-2.5-802, 1 E, 20 Section 7. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-103, Amend 21, 1, A, Introductory Portion and, 5, and add, 1, I C, as follows, 22 2219-2.5-103. Jurisdiction. 1. Except as otherwise provided by 23 law, the juvenile court has exclusive original jurisdiction in proceedings. 24. A. Concerning any a juvenile 10 who is 13 years of age 25 or older who is violated. 26. C. Concerning a juvenile who is 10 years of age or older 27 who has violated an offense pursuant to Part 1 of Article 3 of. Dash 6 HB 22 dash 1131. 1 Title 18. 2. 5. Notwithstanding any other provision of this section to the three contrary, the juvenile court and the county court have concurrent for jurisdiction over a juvenile who is 13 years of age or older but 5 under 18 years of age and who is charged with a violation of section 618-13-122, 18-18-406, 5-B-I, and 5-B-2, 18-18-428, 18-18-429, 718-18-430, or 42-4-1301, except that, if the juvenile court accepts 8 jurisdiction over such a juvenile, the county court jurisdiction terminates. 9 Section 8. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-208, Amend 10, 1, A, Introductory Portion as follows, 1119-2.5-208. Petty Tickets, Summons, Contracts, Data. 12, 1, A, If a law enforcement officer contacts a juvenile 10 who is 13, 13 years of age or older for a delinquent act that would be a petty 14 offense if committed by an adult or a municipal ordinance violation, the 15 officer may issue the juvenile a petty ticket that requires the juvenile to 16. Go through an assessment process or procedure as designated by the 17. Municipal, county, or district court, including assessment by a law 18 enforcement officer, assessment officer, or a screening team, referred to 19 in this section as the screening entity. When a petty ticket is issued, and 20 assessment officer or screening team officer shall offer a petty offense 21 contract to the juvenile and the juvenile's parent or legal guardian if 22 section 9. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-303, Amend 23, 1, and add, 2, G, as follows, 2419-2.5-303. Duty of Officer, Screening Teams, Notification, 25 Release or Detention. 1. When a juvenile who is 13 years of 26 age or older is taken into temporary custody and not released pending 27 charges, the officer shall notify the screening team for the Judicial District. Dash 7 HB 22-1131. 1. In which the juvenile is taken into custody. The screening team shall to notify the juvenile's parent, guardian, or legal custodian without three unnecessary delay and inform the juvenile's parent, guardian, or legal for custodian that, if the juvenile is placed in detention or a temporary five holding facility, all parties have a right to a prompt hearing to determine six whether the juvenile is to be detained further. Such notification may be seven made to a person with whom the juvenile is residing if a parent, guardian, eight or legal custodian cannot be located. If the screening team is unable to nine make such notification, the notification may be made by any law 10 enforcement officer, juvenile probation officer, detention center 11 counselor, or detention facility staff in whose physical custody the 12 juvenile is placed. 13. 2. G. I. Nothing in this section prohibits a law 14 enforcement officer from taking a child who is under 13. 15 years of age into temporary custody pursuant to section. 16. 19-3-401 or placing a child who is under 13 years of age 17 out of the home pursuant to section 19-3-402. 18. 2. A child is considered abandoned pursuant to sections 1919-3-102 and 19-3-401 if the child's parent, guardian, or legal 20 custodian refuses to take the child into his or her home after 21 contact with law enforcement. 22. Section 10. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-304, repeal 23, 2, as follows, 2419-2.5-304. Limitations on Detention. 
2. A juvenile court shall 25 not order a juvenile who is 10 years of age and older but less than 26 13 years of age to detention unless the juvenile has been arrested for 27 a felony or weapons charge pursuant to section 18-12-102, 18-12-105. Dash 8 HB 22 dash 1131. 118-12-106, or 18-12-108.5. A pre-adjudication service program created to pursuant to section 19-2.5-606 shall evaluate a juvenile described in this three subsection, 2. The evaluation may result in the juvenile, 4, a, remaining in the custody of a parent or legal guardian, 5, b, being placed in the temporary legal custody of kin, for six purposes of a kinship foster care home or non-certified kinship care 7 placement, as defined in section 19-1-103, or other suitable person under eight such conditions as the court may impose, 9 C, being placed in a temporary shelter facility, or 10 D, being referred to a local county department of human or social 11. Services for assessment for placement. 12 Section 11. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-305, Amend 13, 3, A, V, Introductory Portion and, 6, as follows, 1419-2.5-305. Detention and shelter hearing time limits, 15 findings, review confinement with adult offenders, restrictions. 16, 3, A, V, a court shall not order further detention for a juvenile who is 17, 10 years of age and older, but less than 13 years of age, unless the 18 juvenile has been arrested or adjudicated for a felony or weapons charge 19 pursuant to section 18-12-102, 18-12-105, 18-12-106, or 18-12-108.5. 20, the court shall receive any information having probative value regardless 21 of its admissibility under the rules of evidence. In determining whether 22 a juvenile requires detention, the court shall consider the results of the 23 detention screening instrument. There is a rebuttable presumption that a 24 juvenile poses a substantial risk of serious harm to others if 25, 6, except for a juvenile described in section 19-2.5-304, 2, the 26 court may also issue temporary orders for legal custody pursuant to 27 section 19-1-115. 9 HB 22-1131. 1 section 12. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-802, Amend 2, 1, A, I, and Repeal, 1, E, as follows, 319-2.5-802. Transfers. 1, A, the juvenile court may enter in four order certifying a juvenile to be held for criminal proceedings in the 5, district court if, 6, I, a petition filed in juvenile court alleges the juvenile is, 7, A, 12 or 13 years of age at the time of the commission 8 of the alleged offense and is a juvenile delinquent by virtue of having 9 committed a delinquent act that constitutes a class 1 or class 2 felony or 10 a crime of violence as defined in section 18-1.3-406, or 11, b. 14 years of age or older at the time of the commission 12 of the alleged offense and is a juvenile delinquent by virtue of having 13 committed a delinquent act that constitutes a class 1 or class 2 felony 14 or a crime of violence, as defined in section 18-1.3-406, and 15, e, whenever a juvenile under the age of 14 years is. 16 sentence pursuant to section 18-1.3-401 is provided in subsection 1, d. 17 of this section, the Department of Corrections shall contract with the 18 Department of Human Services to house and provide services to the 19 juvenile in a facility operated by the Department of Human Services until 20 the juvenile reaches the age of 14 years. On reaching the age of 21-14 years, the juvenile must be transferred to an appropriate facility 22 operated by the Department of Corrections for the completion of the 23 juvenile sentence. 24 Section 13. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-1108, 25 Amend, 1, A, as follows, 2619-2.5-1108. Probation terms, release, revocation, 27 graduated responses, system rules, report, definition. 1. A. The. Dash 10 HB 22 dash 1131. 1. Terms and conditions of probation must be specified by rules or orders of 2. The court. The court, as a condition of probation for a juvenile who is 10 3 13 years of age or older, but less than 18 years of age on the four date of the sentencing hearing, may impose a commitment or detention. 5. The aggregate length of any such commitment or detention, whether 6 continuous or at designated intervals, must not exceed 45 days, 7 except that such limit does not apply to any placement out of the home 8 through a county department of human or social services. Each juvenile 9 placed on probation must be given a written statement of the terms and 10 conditions of the juvenile's probation and have the terms and conditions 11 fully explained. 12 Section 14. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-1117, 13 Amend, 1, A, and, 6, C, as follows, 1419-2.5-1117. Sentencing Commitment to the Department of 15 Human Services Definitions 1, A, except as otherwise required in 16 Subsection, 6, of this section in Section 19-2.5-1127 for an aggravated 17 juvenile offender, the court may commit a juvenile to the Department of 18 Human Services for a determinate period of up to two years if the juvenile 19 is adjudicated for an offense that would constitute a felony or a 20 misdemeanor if committed by an adult, except that, if the juvenile is 21 younger than 12 under 15 years of age and is not adjudicated 22 an aggravated juvenile offender, the court may 
Commit the juvenile to the 23 Department of Human Services only if the juvenile is adjudicated for an 24 offense that would constitute a Class 1, Class 2, or Class 3 felony if 25 committed by an adult. 26. 6C. The juvenile court may commit any juvenile who is not 27 adjudicated an aggravated juvenile offender pursuant to Section 11 HB 22-1131. 119-2.5-1127 but who is adjudicated for an offense that would constitute two a felony or a misdemeanor to the Department of Human Services, and the three determinate period of commitment must not exceed two years, except for that. If the juvenile is 10 or 11 13 or 14 years of age 5 and is not adjudicated an aggravated juvenile offender pursuant to section 619-2.5-1127, the juvenile may be committed to the Department of Human 7 Services only if the juvenile is adjudicated for an offense that would 8 constitute a class 1, class 2, or class 3 felony if committed by an adult. 9 section 15. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-1123, 10 Amend, 2, Introductory Portion as follows, 1119-2.5-1123. Sentencing, Mandatory Detention Weapons and 12 Crimes of Violence. 2. A juvenile who is less than 13 under 13-15 years of age may not be sentenced to detention unless the 14 juvenile has been adjudicated for a felony or weapons charge pursuant to. 15 Section 18-12-102, 18-12-105, 18-12-106 or 18-12-108.5. As in 16 alternative, the juvenile probation department may conduct a pre-sentence 17 investigation pursuant to section 19-2.5-1101. The investigation may 18th result in the juvenile, 19 section 16. In Colorado revised statutes, 19-2.5-1126, 20 amend, 1 ACIA, as follows, 21 19-2.5-1126. Sentencing, special offenders. 1. The court shall 22 sentence a juvenile adjudicated as a special offender as follows, 23, c. Violent juvenile offender. i. a. Upon adjudication as a 24 violent juvenile offender, as described in section 19-2.5-1125, 3. The 25 juvenile must be placed or committed out of the home for not less than 26 one year, except that this subsection, 1, c. Does not apply to a juvenile 27 who is 10, 13 years of age or older, but less than 12 under. Dash 12, HB 22-1131. 115 years of age, when the court finds that an alternative sentence or two a commitment of less than one year out of the home would be more three appropriate. 4. Section 17. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-1404, 5 Amend, 1, B, V, 1, B, 6, B, and 1, B, 6, C, and add 6, 1, B, 6, D, as follows, 719-2.5-1404. Working Group for Criteria for Placement of 8 Juvenile Offenders Establishment of Formula Review of Criteria 9 Report. 1. B. The working group shall carry out the following duties. 10. V. To establish a formula for the purpose of allocating funds by 11 each judicial district in the state of Colorado for alternative services to 12 placing juveniles who are 10 years of age or older in the physical 13 custody of the Department of Human Services or in the legal custody of the 14 Department of Human Services. The allocation must take into 15 consideration such factors as the population of the judicial district, the 16 incidents of offenses committed by juveniles in such judicial district, and 17 other factors as deemed appropriate. The working group shall consider 18 and take into account whether any federal money or matching funds are 19 available to cover the costs of juveniles within the system, including 20 parent fees and third-party reimbursement as authorized by law or 21 reimbursements under Title 40 of the Federal Social Security Act, as 22 amended. 23, 6, before January 1, 2021, to establish criteria for juveniles 24 served through alternative services funded pursuant to subsection 25, 1, B, V, of this section. The criteria must prioritize 26 b juveniles who are in secure detention and 27 se juveniles under the supervision of probation when the results dash 13 hb 22 dash 1131 one of a detention screening instrument indicate that the juvenile is eligible to for detention and 3 d children who are 10 years of age or older but under 4 13 years of age who are at risk of entering detention at an five older age if they do not receive alternative services 6 section 18 in Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-1407, 7 Amend, 2, as follows, 819-2.5-1407. Appropriations to Department of Human Services 9 for services to juveniles, definition. 2. For the purposes of this 10 section, a juvenile also includes a youth 10 person who is 13 11 years of age or older but less than under 17 years of age who is 12 habitually truant, as defined in section 2233-102, 3.5, and who the court 13 has ordered to show cause why the juvenile should not be held in 14, contempt of court pursuant to section 2233-108, 7, when funds are 15 expended for services that are intended to prevent the youth juvenile. 16 from being held in detention or sentenced to detention. 17 section 19. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 19-2.5-1511, 18 Amend, 1, A, and Repeal, 1, A, C, as follows, 1919-2.5-1511. Juvenile Detention Services and Facilities to be 20 provided by Department of Human Services Education Expenses, 21 Definition. 1, A, except as set forth in subsection, 1, C, of this section, 22 The Department of Human Services shall provide detention services for 23 temporary care of a juvenile, pursuant to this Article 2.5.
The Department 24 of Human Services shall consult on a regular basis with the court in any 25 district where a detention facility is located concerning the Detention 26 program at that facility. The Department of Human Services may use staff 27 secure facilities to provide pre-adjudication and post-adjudication detention. Dash 14 HB 22 dash 1131. 1 Services. 2 C. The Department of Human Services is not required to receive 3 and provide care for any juvenile who is 10 years of age and older but for less than 13 years of age, unless such juvenile has been arrested or 5 adjudicated for a felony or weapons charge pursuant to Section 618-12-102, 18-12-105, 18-12-106, 18-12-107, 18-12-108, 18-12-109, 18-12-110, 18-12-111, 18-12-112, 18-12-113, 18-12-114, 18-12-115, 18-12-116, 18-12-117, 18-12-118, 18-12-119, 18-12-120, 18-12-121, 18-12-122, 18-12-123, 18-12-124, 18-12-125, 18-12-126, 18-12-127, 18-12-128, 18-12-129, 18-12-130, 18-12-131, 18-12-132, 18-12-133, 18-12-134, 18-12-135, 18-12-136, 18-12-137, 18-12-138, 18-12-139, 18-12-140, 18-12-141, 18-12-142, 18-12-143, 18-12-144, 18-12-145, 18-12-146, 18-12-147, 18-12-148, 18-12-149, 18-12-150, 18-12-151, 18-12-152, 18-12-153, 18-12-154, 18-12-155, 18-12-156, 18-12-157, 18-12-158, 18-12-159, 18-12-160, 18-12-161, 18-12-162, 18-12-163, 18-12-164, 18-12-165, 18-12-166, 18-12-167, 18-12-168, 18-12-168, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169, 18-12-169
In making such a finding, the court shall 24 consider the following factors, including that 25 section 25. Effective date applicability. This act takes 26 effect January 1st, 2023, and applies to offenses committed on or after said 27 date and to confinement or detention ordered on or after said date. Dash 17 HB 22 1131. 1 section 26. Act subject to petition effective date. This Act 2 takes effect at 12.01 a.m. on the day following the expiration of the 390-day period after final adjournment of the General Assembly, except for that, if a referendum petition is filed pursuant to Section 1, 3, of Article V5 of the State Constitution against this Act or an item, section, or part of the 6 Act within such period, then the Act, item, section, or part will not take 7 effect unless approved by the people at the general election to be held in November 8, 2022. And, in such case, will take effect on the date of the 9 official declaration of the vote thereon by the Governor. Dash 18 HB 22-1131 any further questions? Seeing none, the passage before us is the adoption of House Bill 1131. All those in favor say aye. Aye. The, the question before us is the passage of 1131 as amended. I apologize. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no? No. The ayes have it. House Bill 1131 as amended passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 1119. House Bill 1119 by Representatives Gray and Weissman, also Senator Winter, concerning civil liability per presenting, for presenting false claims for payment to the state. Representative Weissman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move 1119 in the committee reports from Judiciary Finance and Appropriations. To the Appropriations Report. Appropriations Report makes an appropriation of about $13,500. I ask for your support. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage. Representative Bachenfeld, you've got to be in the well first. I've been in the well, ma'am. The question is the appropriations. The question is the, to, we're to the appropriations report. Can you speak on the appropriations report? I'll stand down for a second. Seeing no further discussion, um, the question before us is a passage of the appropriations report. Um, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The, the ayes have it. The appropriations report passes. To the finance report, Representative Weissman. Thank you. The finance report does two things. Uh, we provide that where local government or political subdivision funds are implicated in a false claim action, recovery of proceeds should go to the political subdivision. It only makes sense. We also set forth uh, an alternative, more moderate remedy in the form of uh, an assurance of discontinuance. Uh, that is kind of a, a more moderate yeah. sanction than otherwise provided for. I ask for your support for the finance report. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the finance report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. The finance report passes. To the Judiciary Report, Representative Weissman. Uh, thank you, members. The Judiciary Committee report reflects three weeks of stakeholder work subsequent to when we initially heard the bill in Judiciary Committee and then laid it over. Uh, some of the provisions in the Judiciary Committee report include a uh, higher threshold before an action or investigation may proceed. Uh, we clarify penalty provisions by setting forth specific amounts rather than a reference to federal law. We add some additional language about investigation of UI claims because we know that has been an issue in our state. Uh, we lower uh, maximum penalty provisions. This is something that was sought by uh, business community uh, stakeholders. Uh, we limit uh, contingent fees where a private attorney uh, is proceeding uh, in the way of a key Tom action, we clarify confidentiality provisions about in information that might be surfaced in a false claim investigation, and we require a detailed annual uh, report to come back to us here at the General Assembly from the Attorney General's Office who is uh, proceeding with these false claim actions, uh, the work of the Judiciary Committee report, and subsequently brings a number of stakeholders who were initially opposed to a neutral position. I ask for your support on the Judiciary Committee report. Any further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of the Judiciary Report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The Judiciary Report passes to the bill, Representative Weissman. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, this is one of the more important bills I think that we're going to do here uh, this year. It is a fiscal responsibility bill. In Colorado, we do not have a general false claims act to protect taxpayers and tax dollars against fraudulent activity that uh, might 
improperly obtain those dollars. We do have this for Medicaid. Uh, that's important. We do not have it more broadly. 23 other states in the District of Columbia have some kind of broader false claims uh, act uh, that they can use for general recovery of taxpayer proceeds. These range all the way from blue California to purple Florida to red Utah. Uh, so this is not a partisan or political issue. This is frankly just a good government issue. A ton of work has been done in committee uh, to address some concerns that existed with the introduced text. Happy to say we passed out of the Judiciary Committee with a 9-2 bipartisan vote. Ask for your support on this good government measure. Representative Bockenfeld. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's still an honor to serve with you. Honor to serve with you. This is a, a fairly complicated bill, and I think it's important that we clearly understand what we're voting on, so I'd ask for the bill to be read at length. You have heard the motion. The bill will be read at length. Second regular session, 73rd General Assembly State of Colorado introduced. LLS No. 22 to 204.01 Conrad Imel X 2313 House Bill 22 to 1119. House Committees, Senate Committees, Judiciary. A bill for an act. 101 concerning civil liability for presenting false claims for. 102 payment to the state. Bill summary. Note, this summary applies to this bill as introduced and does not reflect any amendments that may be subsequently adopted. If this bill passes third reading in the House of Introduction, a bill summary that applies to the re-engrossed version of this bill will be available at http colon slash slash leg.colorado.gov. The bill establishes the Colorado False Claims Act, the Act. Pursuant to the Act, a person is liable to the state or a political subdivision of the state for a civil penalty if the person commits, conspires to commit, or aids and abets the commission of any of the following, collectively, false claims. Knowingly presenting, or causing to be presented, a false. House Sponsorship Gray. Senate Sponsorship Winter. Shading denotes House Amendment. Double underlining denotes Senate Amendment. Capital letters or bold and italic numbers indicate new material to be added to existing statute. Dashes through the words indicate deletions from existing statute. Or fraudulent claim for payment or approval. Knowingly making, using, or causing to be made or used a false record or statement material to a false or fraudulent claim. Having possession, custody, or control of property or money used, or to be used, by the state or political subdivision and knowingly delivering, or causing to be delivered, less than all of the money or property authorizing the making or delivery of a document certifying receipt of property used, or to be used, by the state or political subdivision and, with the intent to defraud the state or political subdivision, making or delivering the receipt without completely knowing that the information on the receipt is true. Knowingly buying, or receiving as a pledge of an obligation or debt, public property from an officer or employee of the state or political subdivision who lawfully may not sell or pledge the property, or knowingly making, using, or causing to be made or used. A false record or statement material to an obligation to pay or transmit money or property to the state or political subdivision, or knowingly concealing or knowingly and improperly avoiding or decreasing an obligation to pay or transmit money or property to the state or political subdivision. A person who makes a false claim is liable to the state or a political subdivision for the same amount provided in the Federal False Claims Act, as adjusted for inflation, plus three times the amount of the damages sustained by the state or political subdivision, and the costs incurred for the investigation and prosecution of the false claim. The bill requires the Attorney General or a local prosecutor to investigate false claims. The Attorney General, prosecuting authority of a political subdivision, or a private individual, relator, may bring a civil action against a person who made a false claim. The bill permits the Attorney General or prosecuting authority of a political subdivision to intervene in an action brought by a relator. A relator may be awarded up to 30% of the proceeds from a false claims action based on the extent the relator contributed to the investigation and prosecution of the false claim. If the relator is an employee of the state or political subdivision and learns information about the false claim in the course of the relator's work, the court will award that amount to the relator's employer. The bill authorizes the state auditor to share information about potential false claims with the attorney general and a political subdivision. A court cannot hear a false claim action brought against a serving member of the General Assembly. Dash 2 HB 22-1119. A member of the state judiciary or an elected official in the executive branch of the state of Colorado acting in the member's or official's official capacity or based on the same allegations or transactions that are the subject of a different civil or administrative proceeding. The bill prohibits retaliatory action against an individual because of the individual's efforts in furtherance of investigating, prosecuting, or stopping false claims. A court hearing a false claims action may hear a claim for retaliation against the individual. 1. Be it enacted by the General Assembly of the State of Colorado, 2. Section 1. In Colorado Revised Statutes, 2431-101, Amend 3, 1, P, and 1, Q, and add 1, R, as follows, for 2431-101. Powers and Duties of Attorney General. 
1. The five attorney general. 6. P. May bring a civil action to enforce the provisions of section 72431-113. And 8. Q. May bring a civil action to enforce the provisions of section 92431-307-2. Or a criminal action to enforce the provisions of section 102431-307-3. And 11. R may bring or intervene in a civil action, conduct 12 investigations, and issue civil investigation demands pursuant 213 the Colorado False Claims ACT, Part 12 of this Article 31. 14 Section 2. In Colorado Revised Statutes, add Part 12 to Article 1531 of Title 24 as follows, 16 Part 1217 Colorado False Claims ACT 1824-31-1201. Short Title. The short title of this Part 12 is the 19 Colorado False Claims Act. 2024-31-1202. Definitions. As used in this part 12, unless the dash 3 HB 22 1119. One context otherwise requires 2. 1. A. Claim means a request or demand, whether under 3. A contract or otherwise, for money or property, and whether or for not the state or a political subdivision has title to the money or 5 property, that is, 6. I. Presented to an officer, employee, or agent of the 7 state or political subdivision, or 8. 2. Made to a contractor, grantee, or other recipient, if 9. The money or property is to be spent or used on the states or 10 political subdivisions behalf or to advance a government 11 program or interest, and if the state or political subdivision, 12, a, provides or has provided any portion of the money or 13 property requested or demanded, or 14, b, will reimburse such contractor, grantee, or other 15 recipient for any portion of the money or property that is 16 requested or demanded. 17, b, claim does not include a request or demand for 18 money or property that the state or a political subdivision has 19 paid. 20, i, to an individual as compensation for employment by 21 the state or political subdivision, 22, 2, as an income subsidy with no restrictions on that 23 individual's use of the money or property, 24, 3, to an individual as part of a government assistance 25 program in an amount less than $5,000 in a 26 calendar year, or 27, 4, to an individual under the Colorado Medical. Dash 4 HB 22-1119. One Assistance Act, Articles 4, 5, and 6 of Title 25.5. 2, 2, Department means the Department of Law. 3, 3, Fund means the False Claims Recovery Cash Fund for created in Section 2431-1209. 5. 4. A. Knowing or knowingly mean that a person, with 6. Respect to information about a claim. 7. I. Has actual knowledge of the information. 8. 2. Acts in deliberate ignorance of the truth or falsity of 9. The information. Or 10. 3. Acts in reckless disregard of the truth or falsity of 11. The information. 12. B. Knowing or knowingly does not require proof of 13. Specific intent to defraud. 14. 5. Material means having a natural tendency to 15 influence, or be capable of influencing, the payment or receipt 16 of money or property. 17. 6. Obligation means an established duty, whether or 18 not fixed, arising from an express or implied contractual, 19 grant or grantee, or license or licensee relationship, from a 20 fee-based or similar relationship, from statute or regulation, or 21. From the retention of any overpayment. 22. 7. Person means any individual, corporation, business 23 trust, estate, trust, limited liability company, partnership, 24 association, or other non-governmental legal entity. 25. 8. Political subdivision means a town, city, county, or 26 city and county. 27. 9. Proceeds means all money, property, damages. Dash 5 HB 22 dash 1119. One double damages, treble damages, civil penalties, and payments two for costs of compliance, including reasonable costs and three attorney fees, realized by the state or a political subdivision, for whether as a result of any settlement of or judgment entered 5 in any action brought pursuant to this Part 12. 6. 10. Prosecuting authority means the county attorney, 7. City attorney, or other local government official, including a 8. Duly elected district attorney, charged with investigating, 9. Filing, and conducting civil legal proceedings on behalf of, or in 10. The name of, a particular political subdivision. 11. 11. Relator means a natural person who brings a civil 12 action for a violation of this Part 12 on behalf of himself or 13 herself and the state or a political subdivision. Relator 14 includes a government employee other than a prosecuting 15 authority who, in the course of the employee's work for the 16 state or a political subdivision, gains knowledge of any. 17 information that forms, in whole or in part, the basis of the civil. 18 action. 1924-31-1203. False claims civil liability for certain acts, 20 penalty, exception. 1. Subject to subsection, 2, of this section 21 and except as otherwise provided in subsection, 5, of this section, 22 a person is liable to the state or a political subdivision for a 23 civil penalty in amounts established in the Federal False Claims 24 Act, 31 U.S.C. S.E.C., 3729 E.T.C., as amended, as adjusted for 25 inflation pursuant to 31 U.S.C. S.E.C., 3729, plus three times the 26 amount of damages that the state or political subdivision 27 sustains because of the act of that person, if that person. Dash 6 HB 22-1119.
1. A. Knowingly presents, or causes to be presented, a false to or fraudulent claim for payment or approval. 3. B. Knowingly makes, uses, or causes to be made or used a for false record or statement material to a false or fraudulent 5 claim. 6. C. Has possession, custody, or control of property or 7 money used, or to be used, by the state or political subdivision 8 and knowingly delivers, or causes to be delivered, less than all 9 of the money or property. 10. D. Authorizes the making or delivery of a document 11 certifying receipt of property used, or to be used, by the state or 12 political subdivision and, with the intent to defraud the state or 13 political subdivision, makes or delivers the receipt without 14 completely knowing that the information on the receipt is true, 15 e, knowingly buys, or receives as a pledge of and 16 obligation or debt, public property from an officer or employee 17 of the state or political subdivision who lawfully may not sell, 18 or pledge the property, 19. F. Knowingly makes, uses, or causes to be made or used a 20 false record or statement material to an obligation to pay or 21 transmit money or property to the state or political subdivision. 22. Or knowingly conceals or knowingly and improperly avoids or 23. Decreases an obligation to pay or transmit money or property to 24 the state or political subdivision. Or 25. G. Conspires to commit a violation of subsections 1. A. 226. 1. F. Of this section or aids and abets the commission of a 27 violation of subsections 1. A. 2. 1. F. Of this section. Dash 7 HB 22 dash 1119. 1, 2, notwithstanding the amount of damages authorized 2 I in subsection 1 of this section, for a person who violates 3 subsection 1 of this section, the court may assess not less than 4 twice the amount of damages that the state or a political 5 subdivision sustains because of the ACT of the person if the court 6 finds that 7 A, the person who committed the violation furnished 2 8 the officials of the state or political subdivision responsible for 9 investigating false claims. Violations all information about the 10 violation known to the person and furnished said information 11 within 30 days after the date on which the person first 12 obtained the information. 13. B. At the time the person furnished the information about 14 the violation to the officials of the state or political 15 subdivision, a criminal prosecution, civil action, or 16 administrative action had not commenced with respect to the 17 violation and the person did not have actual knowledge of the 18. Existence of an investigation into the violation, and 19. C. The person fully cooperated with any investigation of 20. The violation by the state or political subdivision. 21. 3. Any information furnished pursuant to subsection 2. 22 of this section is exempt from disclosure pursuant to the 23 Colorado Open Records Act, Part 2 of Article 72 of this Title 2424. 25. 4. A person who violates this section is also liable to the 26 state or a political subdivision for reasonable attorney fees 27 and the costs incurred during the enforcement of this Part 12. Dash 8 HB 22 dash 1119. 1. 5. This section does not apply to claims, records, or two statements made pursuant to Title 39. 324 31 1204. Civil actions for false claims, claims for four retaliation, definitions. 1. Responsibility of Attorney General. 5. A. The Attorney General shall diligently investigate a six violation of Section 2431 1203. If the Attorney General finds seven that a person has violated or is violating Section 2431 1203, the aid attorney general may bring a civil action against the person 9 pursuant to this section. 10. B. If the attorney general brings a civil action pursuant 11 to this section on a claim involving political subdivision money 12, as well as state money, the attorney general shall serve by 13 mail, with return receipt requested, a copy of the complaint on 14 the subdivision's appropriate prosecuting authority within 15-14 days after the date that the complaint is filed in the 16 action. 17. C. Within 63 days after receipt of the complaint. 18. Pursuant to subsection 1. B. Of this section, and subject to. 19 subsection 2 d of this section the prosecuting authority shall 20 have the right to intervene in an action brought by the 21 attorney general pursuant to this section or may permit 22 the political subdivision to intervene thereafter upon a showing 23 that all of the requirements of the colorado rules of civil 24 procedure have been met 25 2 responsibility of prosecuting authority a a prosecuting 26 authority for a political subdivision shall diligently 27 investigate a violation of section 2431-1203 involving a claim dash 9 hb 22-1119 one filed with that political subdivision. If the prosecuting two authority finds that a person has violated or is violating 3 section 2431-1203, the prosecuting authority may bring a civil for action against the person pursuant to this section. 5. B. If a prosecuting authority brings the civil action 6 pursuant to this section on a claim involving state and political 7 subdivision money, the prosecuting authority shall serve by 8 mail, with return receipt requested, a copy of the complaint on 9 the Attorney General within 14 days after the date that 10 the complaint is filed in the action. 11 C. Within 63 days after receiving the complaint 12 pursuant to subsection 2 B of this section, the Attorney 13 General shall either 14 I. Notify the court that the Attorney General intends to 15 proceed with the action, in which case the Attorney General 16 shall assume primary responsibility for conducting the action. 17 And the prosecuting authority has the right to continue as a 18 party, or 19, 2, notify the court that the Attorney General declines 20 to take over the action, in which case the prosecuting authority 21 has the right to conduct the action. 
22. D. Notwithstanding any other provision of this section, 23. A political subdivision is not permitted to bring an action 24 pursuant to this subsection, 2, or intervene in an action 25 pursuant to subsection, 1 C, or 4, B, of this section without the 26 consent of the Attorney General or the Attorney General's 27 designee. Dash 10 HB 22 1119. 1. 3. Role of the Office of the State Auditor. 2. A. Notwithstanding any other state law requiring the State 3 Auditor TO keep information confidential, if in the course of ITS for Audit Authority, the Office of the State Auditor identifies 5 information of potential false claims submitted to the State or 6 A political subdivision, the State Auditor may share any 7 information with the Attorney General or the political 8 subdivision. The State Auditor may participate, with the consent 9 of the Attorney General, in any subsequent investigation or 10 prosecution of that false claim. 11. B. If the state auditor elects T.O. participate in any 12 investigation and prosecution of a false claim, the state 13 auditor's interests will be represented by the Attorney General. 14. 4. Actions by private persons. A. A relator may bring a 15 civil action for a violation of section 2431-1203 for the relator 16 and for the state or a political subdivision that is affected by. 17. The violation. The action must be brought in the name of the 18 state or political subdivision. A relator may not dismiss in 19, action unless the court and the Attorney General Oregon, the 20 prosecuting authority, give written consent to the dismissal and 21 their reasons for consenting. 22. B. The relator shall serve on the state or political 23 subdivision, pursuant to Rule 4 of the Colorado Rules of Civil 24 Procedure, a copy of the complaint and written disclosure of 25 substantially all material evidence and information the 26 relator possesses. The complaint must be filed in camera, must 27 remain under seal for at least 63 days, and must not be. Dash 11 HB 22-1119. One served on the defendant until the court so orders dot the state, or two a political subdivision with the consent of the Attorney General, may third elect to intervene and proceed with the action within 463 days after it receives both the complaint and the five material evidence and information. If both the state and six political subdivision intervene, the Attorney General shall seven assume primary responsibility for conducting the action. 8. C. The state or political subdivision may, for good cause 9 shown, move the court for extensions of the time during which 10 the complaint remains under seal pursuant to subsection 4, B, 11 of this section. The motion may be supported by affidavits or 12 other submissions in camera. The defendant is not required to 13 respond to any complaint filed pursuant to this section until 14 21 days after the complaint is unsealed and served 15 upon the defendant pursuant to Rule 4 of the Colorado Rules of 16 Civil Procedure. 17. D. Before the expiration of the 63 day period. 18. Pursuant TO subsection 4. B. Of this section and any extensions 19 obtained pursuant TO subsection 4. C. Of this section, the state 20 or political subdivision shall 21. I. Proceed with the action, in which case the state or 22 political subdivision shall conduct the action, or 23. 2. Notify the court that it declines TO take over the 24 action, in which case the relator has the right TO continue the 25 action. 26. E. When a relator brings an action pursuant to this 27 subsection, 4. Only the state or a political subdivision with the dash 12 HB 22 1119. One consent of the Attorney General may intervene or bring a two-related action based on the facts underlying the pending three action. 4. 5. Rights of parties to private actions. A. If the state or a five political subdivision proceeds with an action brought pursuant 6-2 subsection, 4. Of this section, IT has the primary responsibility 7 for prosecuting the action and is not bound by an ACT of the 8 relator. The relator has the right to continue AS a party to the 9 action, subject to the limitations set forth in subsection 4. B. Of 10 this section. 11. B. I. The state or political subdivision may dismiss the 12 action notwithstanding the objections of the relator if the 13 relator has been notified by the state or political subdivision of 14 the filing of the motion and the court has provided the relator 15 with an opportunity for a hearing on the motion. 16. 2. The state or political subdivision may settle the 17 action with the defendant notwithstanding the objections of the 18. Relator if the court determines, after a hearing, that the 19 proposed settlement is fair, adequate, and reasonable under all 20 the circumstances, upon a showing of good cause, the court may 21st hold the hearing in camera. 22. 3. Upon a showing by the state or political subdivision 23 that unrestricted participation during the course of the 24 litigation by the relator would interfere with or unduly delay 25 the state's or political subdivision's prosecution of the case, or 26 would be repetitious, irrelevant, or for purposes of harassment, 27, the court may, in its discretion, impose limitations on the dash 13 HB 22 dash 1119. One relator's participation, including but not limited to, 2. A. Limiting the number of witnesses the relator may third call. 4. B. Limiting the length of the testimony of the witnesses 5 called by the relator. 6. C. Limiting the relator's cross-examination of witnesses. 7 and 8. D. Otherwise limiting the participation by the relator in 9 the litigation. 10. 4. Upon a showing by the defendant that unrestricted 11. Participation during the course of the litigation by the relator 12 would be for purposes of harassment or would cause the 13 defendant undue burden or unnecessary expense. The court may 14th limit the participation by the relator in the litigation AS 15 described in subsection 5. B. 3. Of this section. 16. C. If the state or political subdivision does not proceed 17 with an action and the relator continues the action, the court 18 shall not draw an adverse inference from the fact that the 19 state or political subdivision has elected not to proceed with. 
20. The action. The fact that the state or political subdivision has 21. Elected not to proceed with the action is not a basis for a motion 22 to dismiss, motion for determination of a question of law, or 23 motion for summary judgment, nor is it a basis to deny the court 24 jurisdiction over the action, the state or political subdivision 25 so requests, IT must be served with copies of all pleadings filed 26 in the action and, at the state's or political subdivision's 27 expense, be supplied with copies of all deposition transcripts. Dash 14 HB 22 dash 11 19. 1. When a relator proceeds with the action, the court, without too limiting the status and rights of the relator, may nevertheless 3. Permit the state or political subdivision to intervene at a later 4 date upon a showing of good cause. 5. D. Regardless of whether the state or political 6 subdivision proceeds with the action, upon a showing by the state 7 or political subdivision that certain actions of discovery by the 8 relator would interfere with the state's or political 9 subdivision's investigation or prosecution of a criminal or civil 10 matter arising out of the same facts, the court may stay the 11 discovery for a period of not more than 63 days. The 12 showing by the state or political subdivision must be conducted 13 in camera. The court may extend the 63 day period upon 14a further showing that the state or political subdivision has 15 pursued the criminal or civil investigation or proceedings with 16 reasonable diligence and that any proposed discovery in the 17 civil action will interfere with the ongoing criminal or civil 18 investigation or proceedings. 19. E. Notwithstanding subsection, 4. Of this section, the 20 state or political subdivision may elect to pursue ITS claim 21 through any alternate remedy available to the state or 22 political subdivision, including any administrative proceeding to 23 determine a civil money penalty. If an alternate remedy is 24 pursued in another proceeding, the relator has the same rights 25 in that proceeding as the relator would have had if the action 26 had continued pursuant to this section. Any finding of fact or 27 conclusion of law made in the other proceeding that has become. Dash 15 HB 22 dash 11 19. One final is binding on all parties to an action brought pursuant to two this section. For purposes of this subsection, 5, e, a finding or three conclusion is final if it has been finally determined on appeal 2 4, the appropriate court of the state, if all time for filing such an 5 appeal with respect to the finding or conclusion has expired, or 6 if the finding or conclusion is not subject to judicial review. 7, 6, award to relators. A, I, subject to subsection, 6, A, 2, 8 of this section, if the state or a political subdivision proceeds 9 with an action brought by a relator pursuant to subsection, 4, 10 of this section, the court shall award the relator at least 11, 15%, but not more than 25% of the 12 proceeds received from the action or settlement of the claim, 13 depending upon the extent to which the relator substantially, 14 contributed to the investigation and prosecution of the action. 15, 2, if the court finds the action to be based primarily on 16 disclosures of specific information, other than information 17 provided by the relator, relating to allegations or 18 transactions in a criminal, civil, or administrative hearing, in a 19 legislative, administrative, or formal audit report, hearing, or 20 investigation, or from the news media, the court may award to 21 the relator such sums as it considers appropriate but in no case 22 more than 10% of the proceeds. In making its 23 determination, the court shall consider the significance of the 24 information provided by the relator and the role of the relator 25 in advancing the case to litigation. 26 to 3, any payment to a relator made pursuant to this 27 subsection, 6, A, must be made from the proceeds. In addition to, dash 16 HB 22 dash 11 19. 1 an award made pursuant to subsection, 6, A, I, or, 6, A, 2, of this 2 section, the court shall award the relator an amount for 3 reasonable expenses that the court finds to have been 4 necessarily incurred, plus reasonable attorney fees and costs. 5, the court shall award all of the expenses, fees, and costs 6 against the defendant. 7. 4. If the relator is a government employee who, in the 8 course of the relator's work for the state or a political 9 subdivision, gains knowledge of any information that forms, in 10 whole or in part, the basis of the relator's claim, the court 11 shall award to the state or political subdivision that employs 12 the relator the amount that would otherwise be awarded to the 13 relator pursuant to this subsection. 6. 14. B. If the state or political subdivision does not intervene 15 ion and proceed with an action pursuant to subsection, 4. B. Of 16 this section, the relator prevailing in the action or settling the 17 claim must receive an amount that the court decides is 18 reasonable for collecting the civil penalty and damages. The 19 amount must be at least 25%, but not more than 20-30% of the proceeds received from the action or 21 settlement and must be paid out of the proceeds. Court shall 22 award the relator an amount for reasonable expenses that the 23 court finds to have been necessarily incurred, plus reasonable 24 attorney fees and costs. The court shall award all of the 25 expenses, fees, and costs against the defendant. 26. C. Regardless of whether the state or a political 27 subdivision intervenes in and proceeds with an action pursuant. Dash 17 HB 22 dash 11 19. Chair. 1 TO subsection 4 B of this section, if the court finds that the two action was brought by a relator who planned and initiated the three violation of section 2431-1203 upon which the action was Representative brought, the court may, to the extent the court considers five appropriate, reduce the share of the proceeds of the action that six the relator would otherwise It's an honor to serve with you, new seven. Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you, Representative Bockenfeld. Thank you very much. Uh, I have a better understanding of the bill at this point. I'd ask for the uh, reading at length to cease. Thank you. 
Glad that was helpful. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 1119? Representative Gray. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, and thank you, Representative Weissman, for uh, joining me on this bill. It has been a really big journey. I apologize. I had some medical appointments I had to uh, attend to, but um, and so I'm sorry I can't be there, but um, it, this has been an incredible journey, and there's been an incredible amount of work. I just want to take a moment to say thank you to the Attorney General's office, um, specifically Kurt Morrison, and most specifically Jeff Reister. The, the amount of work that Jeff Reister has put into this bill um, and the work that we've done together has been um, amazing when you're trying to create a new whole structure for something. Um, it can be really hard. And the work with the business community, the work with the legal community, and the work with the folks in this um, in the building has been amazing. So I want to say thank you to all those folks involved, and I'd ask you to vote yes. Is there any further discussion on House Bill 221119? Seeing none, all those in favor of House Bill 1119 say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no? The ayes have it. House Bill 1119 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of House Bill 221205. House Bill 1205 by Representatives Kennedy and Weissman, also Senators Hansen and Coleman, concerning the creation of an income tax credit to help income qualified seniors afford housing. Representative Weissman. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1205 and the committee reports from Finance and Appropriations. To the Appropriations Report. The Appropriations Committee made a general fund appropriation so that the Department of Revenue can implement what we're doing here, which is an income tax credit for seniors to help them afford the cost of living in Colorado. I ask for your support. Is there any further discussion on the Appropriations Report? Seeing none, all those in favor of the Appropriations Report say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no? No. The appro Appropriations Report passes. To the Finance Report. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the Finance Committee, we did two principal things. Uh, one is to clarify language by which the Division of Property Taxation sends information to the Department of Revenue uh, to dedupe those eligible for this tax credit from the existing senior homestead exemption. Uh, we also provide that if you are very low income and uh, are claiming the property tax heat rent credit, uh, which is another form of low income support, that you're eligible for the full amount uh, of this additional credit because folks under the PTC are very, very low income. Indeed, we ask for your support for the Finance Committee report. Any further discussion on the finance report? Seeing none, all those in favor of the finance report say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The finance report passes. To the bill, Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Madam Chair. Members, uh, we're really excited about this bill that we're bringing forward today. Um, you know, there are a lot of seniors in Colorado that benefit from the senior homestead exemption. But if you're a senior who hasn't owned your home for 10 years, or if you're a senior who rents your home, you are not getting that kind of housing assistance in Colorado. This bill is designed to fill in that gap, provide the other seniors in Colorado some help to afford their housing this year. We ask for an I vote. Is there further discussion on House Bill 22-1205? Seeing none, all those in favor of House Bill 1205 say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, 1205 passes. Mr. Schievel, please read the title of House Bill 22-1387. House Bill 1387 by Representatives Tatone and Bradfield, also Senators Fields and Priola, concerning measures to ensure that a common interest community has adequate reserve funds. Representative Tatone. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move House Bill 1387 and the uh, Transportation and Local Government Report. To the Transportation and Local Government Report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, we added, uh, we changed a couple of dates in the appropriate in the uh, transportation local government report. Uh, ask for a yes vote on the report. Any further discussion on the transportation local government report? Seeing none, all those in favor of the transportation local government report say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The transportation local government report passes. To the bill, Representative Tatone. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, House Bill 1387 is about HOA reserve studies. And uh, the, this bill kind of came about, uh, I don't know, it was a year or so ago, there was a uh, condo complex in Florida. And that 
complex uh, in the middle of the night. It collapsed and killed almost 100 people. Why did that happen? Um, well, there was a, an investigation that is still ongoing, but there, a lot of the information that's come about from that uh, showed that when they tried to get the money to fix a lot of these structural components in the building, the HOA board couldn't get the people in that community to go along with raising that money and getting the assessments. They couldn't get the quorum, they couldn't get enough people. So they kept kicking the can down the road and then uh, eventually the building ended up collapsing from uh, neglect of the building. So what this build does, it does a couple different things. Uh, when an HOA is a new HOA, uh, the developers, they develop a real pretty looking community but a lot of the things that they put in place, we don't really know how much it's gonna to cost to maintain. They're gonna to have to do a reserve study on all of the shared components of that community and then hand it over to the community when they get control over the community. Uh, this way they can plan and budget a little bit better. Uh, what the bill also does is it sets up a whole bunch of different ways of, of doing different um, reserve studies uh, we talk about uh, emergent life circumstances, which pertains to what the, uh, that, that structural component that could cause damage to people. And we get a whole bunch of different things about how people can do this with their budget. We're not mandating that they fund the reserves. We're not mandating uh, how they do it. We're not saying that they, sh they have to have a professional even do it. Although, you know, we do recommend that when there's a lot of shared components. But the bill is important to uh, getting the conversation started with the board and the members of the community to get these reserve studies funded to plan ahead for when they have to paint the buildings, when they have to fix the elevator, when they have to do a lot of things that are really going to be impactful to the community. Uh, one other thing that is in the bill that uh, I don't like giving HOAs more power, but in the case of when that uh, building collapsed, the, the HOA board was not able to get the funds for the uh, assessment. This bill does allow the uh, HOA to be able to get that money and do an assessment or something when there is an emergent life circumstance. If there's people going to be in danger because of this, they will be able to uh, do an assessment to, to help make sure that that housing stays in place. And this is a housing bill. This is a bill that preserves housing, keeps housing in circulation because if the housing gets condemned, if the housing comes out of circulation, we lose that. And there's a community in my district that is in a situation like that where they're going to have to sell out to a developer uh, who wants to buy that piece of property and all those uh, all those people are going to get pennies on the dollar, barely going to be able to make their payments on their mortgage because the building is in such bad repair. So this is a, a good bill, uh, has support of a lot of industry people, uh, and I would ask for your I vote on the bill. Further discussion, Assistant Majority Leader, Minority Leader, sorry, <laughs> Geithner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so I just had a question for the sponsor. Um, and it had to do specifically, I know that the bill requires mandatory reserve studies uh, for common interest communities that have major shared components. Um, I'm just wondering, so is this strictly just the, the latitude to conduct um, a study uh, to determine whether or not there are adequate funds? Does it also authorize reserve funds to be um, levied, so to speak? If you could speak a little bit about the study and then the reserve fund, and then specifically, how does the reserve fund build itself if that is truly a component of this? Does that make sense? Yeah. Representative Tatone. All right, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question. So if you look at uh, you know, the, the, the heart of the bill, it, it outlines what different reserve studies are and what's in those reserve studies. If you go to section five, that's really where the reserve studies are actually put into place. Uh, we talk about when they should be doing it. Uh, in section five on page nine, we're talking about at least every 30 years, an association with major shared components shall get the level one study. And then they're gonna do updates on those uh, with the level two or level three every five years. You can do that uh, more frequently if you want, 
uh, you know, with the price of some building materials going up, uh, you might want to look at, you know, your, you know your fence is going to be up and that's on your reserve study. You might want to take a look at that price and, and look at that more frequently, and you can do that. Uh, on the bottom of page nine, we talk about the budget. And we say here there's a few things that should be included in a budget, uh, including the reserve study. And then if you go to section F and G on page 10, we talk about what the association will need to have the funds for the reserve study if they need to. Uh, it's not saying that they have to, uh, but this is having the conversation about how we're going to do it. Now, um, my HOA, when I was president of, of my HOA, we had a hail policy that was 2% of the value of the community, which was $16 million. So our deductible was $720,000. We didn't have that in our reserve funds. We never will get that high in our reserve funds. It, it, we, it's just too much. So how do we pay for that? And that's what, this, that's what Section F is all about. And Section G is to notify people who are in the community how they were, you know, what, what's their plan? How are they going to do it? If they can't fund it, what are they going to do for that? Now, um, Section 7 in, in um, page 11 talks about fiscal responsibility. And when you have a reserve fund, this is a separate fund, it says in the bill that this is a separate fund outside of operating funds. This uh, says that you can't have your reserve funds in anything that's not a, a government uh, uh, insured type of financial instrument. And that's to make sure that people aren't investing the reserve funds in any kind of uh, risky investments uh, that, that might be a problem. So, hope that answers your question. Uh, still asking for a yes vote on the bill. Is there further discussion on House Bill 12, 1387? Uh, yes, Representative Van Winkle. Hey, Madam Chair, and this, this is a bill that actually did come somewhat contentious out of committee yesterday. It's not simply just a requirement for a reserve study. It actually goes into a lot more detail, a lot more micromanagement of these private associations, which are not uh, government associations, they're private associations entered in a contract among the citizens or the, the, the homeowners of a particular area of Colorado. Some are very small, some are 100, over 100,000, which is the case of Highlands Ranch. And one of the things that the bill does is in addition to the reserve study, it actually tells an HOA, which is again a private organization, exactly what they must do with those um, with those funds. It says, in reliance upon the advice of a qualified professional investment advisor, so I don't know if that's a, a certified financial planner uh, who is CFP certified. It doesn't actually say what a qualified professional advisor is, but anyway, in, in re, so it says, one, they must work in conjunction with them, a, a professional investment advisor. Uh, again, not defined in the bill what that actually means because there's a whole slew of professional financial advisors out there. Uh, an association may not invest more than 25% of the association reserve funds in conservative instruments, which isn't defined. It includes equities, which I'm not sure how conservative those are at this given time in our, in our nation's history, but including equities and mutual funds um, that are not insured by a federal agency. So on one hand, it's, it's putting further requirements and burdens on the association, but on the other, saying that you can't invest in historically uh, successfully financial instruments on the other end. So it goes much farther in detail than simply um, ensuring a common interest community. And the net result of what all this is, is increased costs for the people of Colorado that are in HOAs. It's not the first bill we've seen on this. 2.7 million Coloradans, including every single person in Highlands Ranch that owns a home, uh, will see albeit slightly, but they will see a higher cost of living because of this bill and the other HOA bills um, brought by um, this body. Representative Tatone. Thank you, Madam Chair. And I just want to respond to that. So it, what, what uh, uh, my colleague from uh, Douglas County is talking about here is uh, section seven on page 11. And this is about financial responsibility. This is about 
telling people that they shouldn't put their money, that they're reserving for the future to take care of their community, that they shouldn't gamble with it by putting it into something that's going to be at risk of losing value. Now, I think that's something we should consider when we're talking about reserve studies, the rainy day fund, that we're not putting it into something volatile, that we're not going to have it there for the future. That's what this section's about. That's what we're dictating here, and it's 25% is the maximum that we're talking about that can be put into this. You can put something into more volatile stuff, but you have to have government-insured stuff. This is, you know, something that's backed, that you're going to have, there's a guarantee to have. That's what this is about. This is not forcing anybody to do anything other than have the plan, to have the discussion, and to force people to think about the future. Because if we don't think about the future, there's going to be more and more and more of these communities that are going to be underwater and we're going to have to be condemned from lack of maintenance, which is happening in a community in my district. And I hope that doesn't happen to communities in your districts, but it's happening. So this prevents that from happening. It puts this plan in place and it gets these studies, people thinking about it from day one in the new communities and getting people who are in this, these communities now to start thinking about it. It doesn't say you have to do anything other than just follow a good plan and this is a framework that works and the reserve study people who do this work full time, which are not called out in here to do this work, say that this is sound policy as well as uh, many other uh, industry partners that worked on this the, uh, the HOA managers, as well as the Community Association Institute, uh, who are endorsing this as well. So, Still Representative Pico. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. I rise in opposition, not because <clears throat> I think financial planning is a bad idea, but precisely because I think financial planning is a good idea, but we don't need to be outlining to the list level of detail in legislation how they need to be doing this. Currently, HOAs are already doing much of this. Are all of them? No. <clears throat> and, and so to that, I see the reason for the bill. I agree with the premise that there should be this kind of financial planning. I disagree we should be telling them specifically, talking about what kind of percentages should be done in all of these things. Interest rates, Inflation rates, all of these things are highly flexible. The plans are going to vary considerably from HOA to HOA. This is not something the state needs to be diving into and telling in detail these professional organizations who do this for a living, who employ competent financial planners, just as all of us have some sort of financial planning involved, or else we wouldn't have gotten here. We don't need to be doing this. We don't need to tell them to this level of detail, and I ask for a no for the bill. Assistant M Minority Leader Geithner. Thank you, Madam Chair. And so my question to the sponsors, having just heard some of that debate, um, I guess I'm curious, <clears throat> is there anything currently in statute that prohibits uh, one of these communities from embarking upon this study? Um, what, what, is, what is the prohibitions that we're trying to work through in statute? If you could speak to those specifically, that would be incredibly helpful. Meaning, does statute allow for this type of activity to happen? Like, is there anything that prohibits this type of activity, activity from happening in statute right now? Is there, is there a, uh, some sort of barrier that would prevent a study and these sorts of things from happening? That, that's what I'm trying to understand. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Chair. So, uh, Representative Geithner, the, there is some language in statute already around reserve funds, uh, reserve funds uh, and reserve studies, but it's very vague and it's very open-ended. This gives a better framework to be going through, and especially when you have major components that could cause people uh, to, to be out all of their investment, this is going to help a lot of people stay on track. So there's nothing really concrete that's going to help people. This is going to help you. Representative Van Weekle. Thank you, Madam Chairman. I, and I won't belabor the point. I know 
We have a very busy schedule ahead, but just to reemphasize exactly what is happening here. There's a very well-meaning, very good part of the bill, and then it twists and says exactly to the nth degree that an HOA cannot invest more than 25% of the association's reserve funds in conservative instruments, which is not defined, including equities and mutual funds, which I understand what those are. I assume it would I would also probably throw in ETFs if you're going to be talking about this, but that's not even in the bill. It doesn't define what a qualified professional advisor is that they should be meeting with, and it probably shouldn't. It is not my job to use the role and power of government to go and say, Representative Pico, you need to invest your pair account in not more than 25% of this. You need to invest your you and your wife's retirement account in this or that. That is not our job. These are private organizations we're talking about, 100% private, under contract, self-managed organizations, and it is not the role to, of the state government to use its power and force to say this how is how you shall be investing your money. Representative Sandridge. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I, too, have questions about the clarification of the equity portions. I'm guessing I'm guessing it's a large cap um, equities, or d does that include moderate, micro cap, penny stocks, leverage ETFs? Um, that's what I'm kind of curious because if you have a um, equities or can be um, somewhat low risk, or they can tank in two days. So I, I don't know if there was, if there's some type of clarification um, on that as well. So thank you. Assistant Minority Leader Geithner. <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And so uh, I'm looking at statute now, what's currently there, um, and there's quite a bit. Responsible governance policies due process for imposition of fines, procedure for collection and delinquent accounts. And then it gives a, a, it gives a, a laundry list, quite frankly, um, it says, to promote responsible government associations shall. It says, maintain, an accurate, maintain accurate and complete accounting records. Adopt policies, procedures, and rules and regulations concerning collection of unpaid assessments, handling of conflicts. Mm -hmm. This continues. And then it says in Roman numeral 9 under B, where it says, adopt policies, procedures, rules, regulations concerning when the association has a reserve study prepared for portions of the community maintained, repaired, replaced, and improved by the association, whether there is a funding plan for any work recommended by the reserve study, and if so, the projected sources of funding for the work, and whether the reserve study is based on a physical analysis and financial analysis for the purposes of this subparagraph 9, and internally conducted reserve studies shall be sufficient. So it's pretty specific as to reserve study, which I think is what this bill um, relates to. Again, I come back to the underlying question of why is this bill even needed? It's outlined in statute currently that not only is a reserve study something referenced, but then it also says that the community may adopt policies, procedures, and rules and regulations concerning when the association has a reserve study prepared. So it's already here. I, I, again, I come back to the question. I don't understand why we have, why we have the bill. I, I don't know what additionally is going to be added to statute um, that somehow is, is somehow lacking. So if we, could, if we could address that, I think that would really, I think that would be incredibly helpful. There's not, no response from sponsors? I mean, I, I understand, I, I think the sponsor said that there might have been some ambiguity or some vagueness, but I think that's pretty straightforward. When the association has a reserve study prepared for the portions of the community maintained, repaired, replaced, and, and approved by the association, whether there is funding plan for any work recommended by the reserve study, and if so, the projected sources of funding for the work, and whether the reserve study is based on a physical analysis and financial analysis. I mean, that's pretty, for the purpose of this subparagraph 9, an internally conducted reserve study shall be sufficient. So I... I don't see where there's ambiguity. I think it's pretty clear as to what statute currently outlines when it comes to a reserve study um, specifically. Further discussion on House Bill 1387. Seeing none, the question before us is passage of, the ho of House Bill 1387. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. no. The ayes have it. 1387 is passed. 
Mr. Schiebel, please read Senate Bill 2. Senate Bill 2 by Senators Janal and Story, also Representatives Cutter and Will, concerning increasing the resources available for fire protection services provided by volunteer and seasonal firefighters and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Representative Cutter. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we need to move the appropriations report to House Bill, uh, Senate Bill 002. To the appropriations report. To the transportation and local government report. Wait. Oh, no. Move them both. There's not two. Oh, okay. okay. All right. We'd like to move the um, uh, appropriations and transportation and local government report. And the bill. And the bill. <laughs> Any discussion on the appropriations report? Seeing none, the question before us is the adoption of the appropriations report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The appropriations report passes to the transportation and local government report. Representative Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. That, it was just a technical. It was uh, striking of four to, and substitute three in parentheses. It was, uh, that's all they did in the committee, so. Any further discussion on the transportation and local government report? Nothing. Question before us is the adoption of the transportation and local government report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. The transportation and local government report is passed. To the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you, Representative Cutter. Um, so I love working on wildfire, wildfire bills, and especially with my uh, colleague, Representative Will. Um, when I was first, I think my first term as a legislator, I remember one of the volunteer firefighters in my district reached out and um, asked me about getting reimbursement for mileage. Like, I discovered that volunteer firefighters don't get reimbursed for some basic expenses. Um, last year in our wildfire committee, we explored all of these issues, and it, it really became apparent that they don't, they don't have the proper equipment, they don't have access to behavioral health, things that are really um, not okay to, to uh, hamstring our volunteers and not provide them with the tools they need to succeed. So this bill does that. I'm really excited that we're going to be able to provide um, not only money for uh, the resources that they need and the proper fitting equipment, um, but also behavioral health supports specifically for um, for what volunteer firefighters who uh, see get have a lot of trauma in their daily jobs. So I ask for your support. Representative Will. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this 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 Senate Bill Two really is landmark legislation for uh, especially for those that are doing the daily fire service and delivery to our citizens of Colorado. And uh, it'll this will be in for the next several years for these firefighters and especially our volunteers. You know, there's over 300 registered fire departments in this state. 149 of them, of those departments, are all volunteer. And uh, so it's, you know, 56% 50, of those have no program to maintain firefighter health and, and fitness. 41% don't have adequate training in structure firefighting. 36% uh, do not have adequate uh, breathing equipment for firefighters. So this bill is going to help. Also, the mental health aspect of firefighters is going to be a million dollars for that. And if that million dollars isn't spent on mental health uh, issues for firefighters, it goes right back, rolls right back into the fund and used for equipment and training. This is, like I say, a landmark legislation. I'm very proud to be on it with Representative Cutter. And uh, this is an easy eye vote for the great, <laughs> great bill. Thank you. Representative Titone. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, you know, I used to be a volunteer firefighter back in the day, and uh, we often struggled. Uh, and this was in a different state, but still the struggles for uh, volunteer firefighters are, are real everywhere. We had a truck uh, that was from 1976 because we didn't have a lot of money to, to move through our trucks in a, in a better way. And we had it break down uh, during a fire trying to pump water out of a pond. So, you know, when it comes to equipment and, and our personal equipment, making sure that we replace that kind of stuff and uh, keep, keep those volunteers safe 
is critical. So I support this bill wholeheartedly. I think that our volunteers, uh, we really need to give them a hand uh, and, a, and some applause uh, for volunteering their time, putting themselves in dangerous situations all the time for the good of the community. And uh, urge a yes vote on the bill. Representative D. Valdez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the bill sponsors for bringing this bill. We heard this in committee and not only hearing from our director, Mike Morgan, and others, how the importance of our firefighters and need now more than ever for equipment, for education, but more importantly, mental health. Members, last, last week at the Monta Vista fire that happened, I've not only talked to first responders, to the chief, and others, how they continue to look for resources but also those who are involved in the community coming in and helping and putting out that fire was extremely. That not only continue to make sure that resources are needed now more than ever, especially for health, whether it be health physically, but more importantly, mentally. This is a good bill, and I want to thank Representative Will and Representative Cutter for bringing this bill, as we need now more than ever resources, but also to stop fires before they happen. And in this state, and for future, the fuels and the risk now is higher than ever, especially in rural Colorado. In 2018, the Spring Creek fire was devastating in two counties, from Huerfano to Costilla, started in Costilla County all the way down in Huerfano County. Burned over 110,000 acres and over 150 homes. And we're still seeing the, def the impacts from that. So I thank you so much for bringing this bill, and I'll be supporting it moving it forward. Thank you. Further discussion? Rep <laughs> Representative McCluskey. Thank you, Madam Chair. It is an honor to serve with you. It's an honor to serve with you, Representative McCluskey. Members, I did want to expand um, on my support for Senate Bill 2. Uh, this year, the Joint Budget Committee was made aware of the dire need of many of our smaller volunteer fire uh, firefighting departments across the state, particularly for personal protective equipment. So as you may recall, during the supplemental process, we brought $5 million forward then to be sure we got the purchase of personal protective equipment, including self-contained breathing apparatus, so that we could get those out the door quickly for what we thought might be an early start to the fire season. We've now seen that fire season is year-round in Colorado. And I'm glad that we got the jump start then on this program by investing $5 million in January. Glad that we're doing another million for this grant program this next year. And also pleased to see that we will continue that $5 million commitment in out years. I'm uh, very supportive and just want to give a shout out to all of the many firefighters in my district and across this state who do such an exceptional job, who give so much of their time, their energy, and their heart to protect all of us from wildfire. Vote yes. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is passage of Senate Bill 2. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no? The ayes have it. Senate Bill 2 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 28. Senate Bill 28 by Senator Simpson and Sonnenberg, also Representatives Roberts and Catlin, concerning the creation of the Groundwater Compact Compliance and Sustainability Fund. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 28, the Appropriations Committee Report, and the Agriculture, Livestock, and Water Committee Report. To the Appropriations Report. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. In the Appropriations Committee, they appropriated funds uh, to fund the bill. Ask for an I vote. Any further discussion on the Appropriations Report? Seeing none, the question before us is adoption of the Appropriations Report. All those in fav favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The Appropriations Report passes to the Agriculture, Livestock, and Water Report. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. In the Agriculture, Livestock, and Water Committee, we adopted a pretty substantive amendment which turned this bill uh, from just the mere creation of a fund to comply with the uh, groundwater compliance issues in the Republican and Rio uh, Grande River basins uh, to add funds that we've received from the federal government uh, <coughs> to help those basins actually implement this program. So uh, that was the basis of the, the large amendment in the Ag Committee. Um, I do have one more amendment to the committee report, so with that I move L003, 
to the committee report and ask that it be displayed. That has been properly moved and is displayed um, to the amendment. Thank Representative you. Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. This amendment just further clarifies that uh, the most that could ever be sent back to the department and to the water plan fund was, would be $20 million. We don't expect this to happen, but this is clarifying language to make sure that no more than $20 million gets sent back to the department. Is there further discussion on L003? Seeing none, the question before us is adoption of L003. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, L003 passes. Back to the Agriculture, Livestock, and Water Committee report. Further discussion, Representative Catlin? No, not about the report. All right, the question before us is adoption of the Agriculture, Livestock, and Water report. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it, the Agriculture, Livestock, and Water Committee report passes. To the bill, Representative Catlin. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's an honor to serve with you. It is an honor to serve with you, Representative Catlin. It was an honor to have you as the chairman of the Ag Committee. And it's an honor to have you as my vice chair. <laughs> oh, thank you. Okay, we're going steady. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm proud to be here today for a number of different reasons. I love getting razzed like that. I'm proud to be here with Representative Roberts, who is the co-prime co on this bill, because what we're trying to do is to go to the Republican Basin and to the Rio Grande Basin and make a difference in the future of those basins. Right now, they're having a struggle with groundwater compliance targets. This bill will allow them to start buying either land and retiring it or wells and retiring them so that they can meet the compliance requirements of their compacts on both of those rivers. If we don't meet those compliant, dead, those compliant targets by 2029, there's a good chance that both, res, both of these will be shut completely off until we meet compliance. That's like somebody coming to your store or to your business and saying either you'll do this or we will close you down. In these communities, this is the foundational stone of their economies, is their agriculture. Without that agriculture, there's not much point in being out there. You know, both these districts, the, Re the Republican and the Rio Grande Conservation Districts, have invested significant money of their own in funding water users how to address the problem. They've demonstrated the commitment of these communities to controlling their own destinies. Today, it's time for the state of Colorado to step up next to these people and say, we are with you rather than standing behind you. This is a good bill. Vote yes. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair, uh, and thank you, Representative Catlin, for your leadership on this and your work on this. I also want to thank the work of the Water Resources Review Committee. This is a bill that came out of that committee uh, all the way last summer uh, at the urging of uh, Senator Simpson and Senator Sonnenberg, so I want to thank them as well. This bill is critical. This is an absolutely appropriate use of our American Rescue Plan dollars to help the agriculture communities in the Re Republican and Rio Grande basins and make sure that we are doing everything we possibly can to comply with the compacts we are under, but also honoring the businesses and families that work in those basins. This is a very smart investment for the General Assembly to make, and I urge an I vote. Representative D. Valdez. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I want to thank the bill sponsors, not only in the House, but also in the Senate, for bringing this bill forward. This is a good bill to continue to look at preservation and conservation and sustainabilities in our basins in the state of Colorado. Members, the Rio Grande Basin aquifer is depleted by over a million acre feet, and we're in a drought in southern Colorado. What does that mean? that we're short on water, on irrigation water, for our agriculture, for our crops. Most importantly, whether it be potatoes, alfalfa, or small grains, we're going to be short again to make sure that we have a full, full harvest this coming fall. Our snowpack has been devastated over the years. 
with shortage of surface water to, to replenish our aquifer in the Rio Grande Basin. And that goes the same with the Republican Basin. And that goes every basin in the state. And this bill will help retire agricultural lands in our communities, especially in the Rio Grande Basin. Back in the late 70s, the state of Colorado appropriated too many permits for irrigation wells. And we need to make sure that we're sustainable with our, aquifer, with our water levels, not only aquifer, aquifer, but our surface water. And this bill will help those landowners, the farmers and ranchers, retire some of that acreage so we can try and get sustainability and conservation back in our basins. And with that, yeah, my full support. Thank you, Representative Roberts, Representative Catlin, and Senator Simpson and Senator Son Sonnenberg for bringing this bill forward. Thank you. Minority Leader McKean. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. <clears throat> Madam Chair, Madam Chair, Mr. Vice Chair. Um, folks, th this is not only important for what it does, but it's also important for the message that it sends. We are currently in negotiations with the lower Colorado, the, the folks downriver from us, on what the future of the Colorado River looks like. And when we talk about what the future of the Colorado River looks like, and when we talk about the 1922 Colorado River Compact, you have to remember that, that it, was, it was based on a fluctuating resource. We know that. And we know that there are things that we need to do here, both in basins even outside the Colorado, both in the Republican and the, and the Rio Grande, to, to show the, the desire to make sure that we are conserving where we can, that we are shepherding and stewarding these resources as we must. Because it's not just a conversation about the water and the tributaries that flow into the Colorado River. It's also a conversation about how we are best using the water that we have for a state into which no water flows. Our state gives away all of the water that we have. And so when we set up these kinds of systems, when we set up these kinds of programs, they're very important because what they really ought to speak to is the ethic that we have in conservation, the ethic we have in resource stabilization in Colorado at the headwaters of the Colorado River. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Madam Chair. And, and I gladly let the minority leader go in front of me, but this bill is very important. The Republican River uh, focus zone is in my district. There might be a little bit in representing Holtorf's district too. Whenever they cannot get into compliance, the state engineer only has one option. He can't shut down one or two wells or 10. He's got to shut them all off. With this program, with the state helping uh, with the compliance, the, the districts are already doing a lot on their own. And they've got so many people wanting to buy in to this that we need this extra shot of uh, uh, capital to get that done. But if they just go in and shut them all down at once, our economies will crash out there. But with an uh, approach like this and converting the, the lands over to dry land or uh, to pasture land, it helps it still be productive and help our economies out on the plains still be viable, still, still get things done. So uh, I'm in full support of this bill. I, I, I heard about it being an interim committee last uh, off session, and I got behind it then. I'm fully behind it now, so I'd ask for your support of this bill. Representative Holtor. Thank you, Madam Chair, and I too stand with uh, Representative Catlin, Representative Pelton, and others in my caucus um, in full support of Senate Bill 22028. I want to talk to my colleagues in the chamber about how important this investment is, not only this year, but also in the out years. You see, with the requirement to meet compacts, and the reduction in acreage, irrigated acres, I kind of equate this to an airplane that is coming in for landing. We want that airplane to come in on a nice glide slope 
and have a gentle landing so we meet the compact requirements and the reductions that are necessary. If we don't, what can happen if we're not meeting the compact requirement? And there's a ruling, not some of the irrigation wells get retired, but perhaps all. And that is what we're facing. This bill begins that journey so farmers can retire acres, can be compensated for the retirement of those acres, and we over time, if we continue and invest, both in the Republic and the Rio Grande, the Republican and the Rio Grande river basins, both of these river basins can have a gentle, smooth landing, we can meet those compact requirements, and when 2029 comes, there will be no economic impact on those communities because the adjustments will be made. And I'm very thankful that the sponsors have brought this bill, and I'm in complete support of Senate Bill 28. Thank you. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 28. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 28 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 55. Senate Bill 55 by Senators Cook and Hanson, also Representatives Robertson McKean, concerning increased alcohol monitoring for impaired driver, driving offenders and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 55 and there are no committee reports. To the bill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, colleagues, I'm really uh, happy to be here with Representative Mr. Minority Leader McKean to uh, present Senate Bill 55. This is a bill that I think will go a tremendous way at reducing the number of DUIs that happen in our state and on our roads. Uh, it do, we've worked very closely with Mothers Against Drunk Driving, the State Patrol, law enforcement, to craft a, uh, a bill here that will make some pretty transformational changes. It does, in, in, uh, in total, two main things. First, it will give people who are convicted or charged with DUIs uh, the ability to get an interlock device immediately. Uh, we know, and I know from my experience, and we heard plenty of testimony in committee, that too many times people are charged or convicted of DUI and still drive even uh, before their mandatory waiting period to get an interlock has passed. People need to go to work, people need to care for their families, uh, and they continue to drive. With an, by giving them an interlock sooner than later, we can ensure that when they do drive, they're doing so soberly. Um, the second part of this bill uh, allows judges in our state to grant or uh, require continuous alcohol monitoring after a second offense. It, may, it says the judge may after a second offense. And then for a third offense, the judge must uh, impose continuous alcohol monitoring as condition of uh, somebody's sentence. This is very important to make sure that people um, who are multiple offenders of DUI are um, complying with their probation, staying sober, and staying sober behind the wheel, most importantly. Um, I did just want to say we heard some pretty powerful testimony in committee. I know this is an issue that's personally important to both the minority leader and myself, um, but there was a father, I don't think he's here, he had planned to, to be here, but may, I, maybe he's watching, a father who came to tell his story about his son who was killed not too far from this building by a repeat DUI offender. And if a bill like this had been in place, it's possible that that person may not have been driving. This is important, the, of the utmost importance to keep our roads safe and to make sure that no more people in this state die because of driving under the influence. I ask for an I vote. Minority Leader McKean. Uh, thank you very much, Madam Chair. And, and Representative Roberts, thank you. Thank you for everything you did on this bill. Thanks to Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Thanks to all the stakeholders. But, but you know, really, this is partly just where we ought to get with bills, where it's common sense. We want to make sure that people can not only get the treatment they need that's effective, but, but also that their life doesn't end at this moment. It gives them a chance to turn that around. That's actually one of the more important things in this bill for a lot of people who don't live in a metropolitan area, is that this bill says, look, we know that your life needs to stay knit together. You need to get to work. You need to do all the things you need to do. Let's do that as a sober drivers. Let's do that as people who take this responsibility seriously. And let's make sure we give you that avenue to move your life out of the dark place it is and into the light. So I'd ask for an I vote. Further discussion? 
Seeing none, the question before us is passage of Senate Bill 55. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no? The ayes have it. Senate Bill 55 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 2257. Senate Bill 57 by Senators Cook and Fields, also Representative Weissman, concerning measures to support victims of violent crimes who suffer brain injuries as a result and in connection therewith making an appropriation. Representative Weissman. Uh, thank you. I move Senate Bill 57. Thank you. To the bill. Uh, members, this is a modest bill uh, to improve uh, support for those who incur brain injuries in our state as a result of surviving a crime. Uh, brain injuries, frankly, are something that we are still improving our understanding of. They can be hard to diagnose. They can be even harder uh, to treat. Uh, the concept here is simple. We're going to pull together uh, an interim work group of uh, more than a dozen uh, folks with relevant experience and substantive understanding. Uh, there is a specific charge, some things to look at. They are to bring back a report to us here in the General Assembly by January 1 with the hope of motivating uh, further legislation and framing up a pilot program that we can stand up, at least in a few jurisdictions in the state. This is an area in which we need to do uh, more work, uh, but this is intended as a first start. Happy to say this bill has been unanimous through four committees and the Senate, and I ask for your ongoing support of Senate Bill 57. Further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is passage of Senate Bill 57. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 57 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 147. Senate Bill 147 by Senators Kolker and Sonnenberg, also Representatives Young and Pelton, concerning behavioral health care integration services for children and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move uh, Senate Bill 147 and the uh, Appropriations Committee report. No report? Okay, no report. To, so I yeah. move the bill. To the bill, yes. Representative Pelton. Thank you, Madam Chair. It, this bill en enacts the recommendations made by the Behavioral Health Transformation Tax Force regarding school and pediatric care, behavioral health, integrations. Task Force uh, recommended in its final report the expansion of behavioral health investments in schools, including school-based health centers, school-based services, and school mental health resources. It also recommended that funding build workforce capacity and expertise through short-term support of the Colorado Pediatric Psychiatric Pediatric Psychiatric Psychiatry Consultation and Access Program, COPCAP, and the School Health Professionals Grant Program. COPCAP is currently operating in Colorado and has received both state and federal grant funding. The bill will formally create the program in state law. Representative Young. My co-prime has said it all. This is a result of the Behavioral Health Transformational Task Force. As a professional in this area, I think these funds are very well designated and will address the ongoing concerns of mental health for our youth as a result of the pandemic. I urge and I vote. Is there further discussion on Senate Bill 147? Representative Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm sorry I didn't get to listen to last night's um, hearing um, on, on our side of the, uh, um, the building. Uh, I was in another uh, committee, but I listened in um, when it was over on the, on the Senate side. And I've just got some questions, and maybe you, you can all help me um, you know, understand it. I know this was a part of the big task force um, that was all, all put together um, last summer or the summer before, and you've been working on, on all of that. And, and of course, it's a great um, program, and it's, it's things um, that we need. Um, my concerns are that the problems that we have with mental health and then off from mental health, um, the suicides that we have, um, the deaths um, that um, come um, from this. Um, we're not going to be able to talk our way out of it. 
um, we're not going to be able to do it with therapy and, and pharmaceuticals, and that we're not talking about the number one killer of children between the ages of 1 and 19, which is firearms. And I listened to the, the, the people that spoke on the Senate side. Um, there was a bunch of doctors. Um, so, I mean, one of my questions are when um, someone goes to the doctor, will the doctor have the ability um, to ask um, that person, uh, is, there, is there a firearm in the house? Um, and uh, I mean, I'm not sure if, if that's allowed, you know, through through this program, um, because we know, you know, that you know, firearms account for better than 53 percent of of all suicides. And so, if we don't ask that question, we can't bring the numbers down of where we at um, in 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 2020. Um, here in the state of Colorado, we had 1,302 suicides. By definition, by definition, that is a mass shooting every day in the state of Colorado. Now imagine that as a headline in, in, on, on the newspaper or somebody talking about that on, on a, a radio talk show or uh, in, in the, uh, um, on TV, that there was a mass shooting every day in the state of Colorado, and we're just going to try to talk our way out of it and have therapy and pharmaceuticals. The thing that's killing people, by and large, a majority of the time, better than 50% of the time, is firearms. And we have to make sure, and that's why here we, you know, I've supported you know, um, safe storage. I, I talked about this before, the last time I saw a number that maybe the state of Colorado, we might have moved up to number five in suicides. In Oregon, they passed the same type of law that we did, and they got support from both sides. They were able to come out and talk about the subject of safe storage. And in Oregon, their number dropped. They were seven at the time. They are now 13. Okay, and that's from talking about it. Um, I listened in on the Senate side when they were talking about it. I was disappointed to hear one of the prominent members of the minority party who was on that committee who didn't seem to know about the suicide problem that we're having in our rural uh, areas. One of the other senators talked about being on the Eastern Plains and how it was affecting his community. And this prominent senator thanked him for telling him. I mean, I know that, that we have the number one county in the United States for suicides. We have two of the top 15 in the United States. My hope through all of this is that we flush it out some more, make sure that the doctors can talk to the people about safe storage in their homes, provide them with what they need to keep those firearms safe, to keep these kids and these family members alive. So thank you for your work on this, and I look forward uh, to following along. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 147. All those in, pa in favor of Senate Bill 147 say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 147 passes. Mr. Schiebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 1. Senate Bill 1 by Senators Buckner and Henriksen, also Representatives Ricks and Tipper. Concerning crime preven prevention through safer streets, utilizing design management strategies, and in connection therewith, making an appropriation. Representative Tipper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 1 and the House Judiciary Report. To the House Judiciary Report. We made some changes in House Judiciary to kind of streamline um, the grant program um, and the collection of data. 
Overall, the goal of this legislation is to give money to local communities uh, who have identified areas of high crime or areas that are susceptible to crime, and they are proposing some environmentally based solutions. Um, and so the, uh, actually I also see an appropriations report, so I'll move the, no? Uh, just, just judiciary. Okay, just judiciary. All right, further discussion on the judiciary report. Seeing none, the question before us is adoption of the judiciary report. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes, the ayes have it, the judiciary report passes. To the bill, Representative Tipper. Um, I have two amendments that I'd like to move, um, and then I think my co-prime will maybe talk a little bit about the bill, or actually maybe we should talk about, well, yeah, I'll move, we'll okay, I'll move amendment L12 and ask that it be displayed. That is a proper moment, a uh, movement, <laughs> motion, I'll get it right. <laughs> and it has been, been displayed, Representative Tipper. Thank you, Madam Chair, can um, we have the uh, amendment, can we zoom in on the amendment a little? The geezers in the front can't see it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so what this, uh, amendment does is it clarifies some language. There was some concern that though the bill talks about getting community input, um, whether that's from local law enforcement or um, other local governmental agencies or community-based organizations, that they wanted it to be meaningful input that was considered throughout the process. Um, and with that, I ask for a yes vote. Further discussion, Minority Leader McKean. I'm in the well then. I was gonna say. I wasn't in the well then. Get out of the well. Minority Leader McKean. Thank you so much. So I have, I have a question or two. Get your own copy. I know. Well, I had my own copy up there, and I was a geezer in the front row, and I couldn't read it. Go for it. But thank you for zooming in, because that really helped. I'm going to take my glasses off now that I'm close. You, you mentioned sufficient consultation and collaboration, sufficient indication of community support, and a sufficient plan. That seems a little broad. So what do you mean? I, I guess sufficient consultation and collaboration, maybe we could tighten that up a little bit, but sufficient indication of community support, what is that? What does that look like? And then what is a sufficient plan? Representative Tipper. Thank you, Madam Chair. Well, typically, um, and I don't mean to sound flippant, so please don't take it this way, um, words have their ordinary meaning in statute, so we could look up the word sufficient. It's going to be enough. enough, yeah, something that articulates enough definition, both for you know local law enforcement, the local community-based organizations, and then the grant program. This is a, a an amendment that everyone in the process agrees on. So I confess not being the author of the, the nouns and verbs, but some something that everyone thought was workable. Minority Leader McKean. Uh, thank you, and, and you weren't being flippant. I mean, it does, it means enough, but I wanted to make sure that there's some, that there's some bracket around that, that, that everybody's comfortable with, that, that it means something. Because you know, we, we've actually, I've been on the phone for the last few days within my own community about a problem with, with unhoused folks, with homeless folks down at King's Corner, and, and it's a really big problem. And so then at what point do you say, well, there's sufficient input here that, that doesn't impact them harmfully? Well, maybe to some people, just get them out. Maybe to some people it's like get these folks the help that they need and do this, right? Sufficient might mean really different things. So I appreciate that this has been stake, stakeholder. I know, that, we hate that, that stakeholders word. have had a chance to have input on this. There we go. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I asked for a yes vote on Amendment L12. Further discussion on Amendment L12. Seeing none, the question before us is adoption of Amendment L12. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. L12 passes to, to the bill. Representative Tipper. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Amendment L16 and ask that it be displayed. That is a proper motion. We're waiting to get it displayed. And it is displayed to the amendment. Thank you, Madam Chair. This was an amendment that... Um, I owe my great respect to Representative Benavidez. This is one of those um, moments where you get Benavidez in committee uh, where she identified some kind of problematic language with um, what was uh, sort of the process by which entities would ask for information or, or, and would, would give information to the grant program about um, what 
what the issues were in the community, what their proposed solution was, and what the funding was for. Um, again, something that everyone agreed to, and I, I mean it, my gratitude to Rep. Benavidez. She found an issue and then resolved it with this. And I asked for a yes vote on Amendment L16. Further discussion on L16. Seeing none, the question before us is adoption of Amendment L16. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. L16 passes. To the bill, Representative Ricks. Thank you, Madam Ch um, Speaker. <laughs> Chair, sorry. Um, so the, this bill is, I moved the committee report. Right. We're to the bill. To oh, just to the bill. Okay. So let me talk about this bill, members. Um, what this bill does is it creates the Crime Prevention Through Safer Streets grant program in the Department of Public Safety. The grant program is intended to assist the uh, Public Safety Department and local governments to evaluate and design safer streets and neighborhoods model um, to discourage crime. The Public Safety uh, Department must issue a request for proposals to local governments and to the local, and, and the department must also obtain an analysis identifying areas in the state where the crime is most prevalent. Once these areas are identified, local governments must submit an application to Department of Public Safety for a grant to pay for improvements to design safer streets. DPS must develop policies and procedures for applications to uh, applications to and disbursements from the grant program before August 31st, 2023. Local government grantees must report grant activity to DPS and must summarize grant activity and report to the General Assembly by October 1st, 2023. This bill will create the Crime Prevention Through Safer Streets Advisory Committee with members appointed by the Executive Director of Public Safety. At a minimum, committee membership must include representatives from law enforcement, experts in situational crime prevention, members of community organizations, in individuals with expertise in urban transportation planning, and an architect with experience in environmental design. Members serve without compensation or reimbursement of expenses. The advisory committee makes recommendations to the Public Safety Department for grantees and grant awards. The General Assembly is required to appropriate $10.3 million from the general fund for the grant program. And this bill is going to repeal in November 1st, 2023. Further discussion, a Representative Tipper. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. I'll just add that what this bill does is it identifies um, ways that community can come together and say, hey, if we have better lighting in this particular area, or if we had gates um, or those storefront fences, or if we had these um, environmental, basically, investments that um, are often um, informed by architects, really interesting way, and the data on this is staggering. It reduces incidents of crime dramatically, um, and just kind of creating safe spaces uh, that are free from crime. So with that, I ask for your support on Senate Bill 1. 1. Is that what I said? Yeah, Senate Bill. You didn't finish. 1. <laughs> Assistant Minority Leader Geithner. Thank you, uh, Madam Chair. And just a question for the sponsors. I, I noticed in one of the amendments that we adopted, um, there was a sensitivity to displacement of potential homeless communities. And so as you look at the, the bill, it talks about lighting and whatever else that may be needed to make a community particularly a little bit safer with illuminating a certain area that may be more prevalent to crime. How, how would one go about um, even putting in lighting? Whatever that infrastructure may, le may, may be uh, requested through the proposal um, if that infrastructure would ultimately, upon its its build out, displace a homeless uh, situ a homeless community. H how do you reconcile both of those, knowing that infrastructure is specifically a piece called for this? I would argue lighting is infrastructure, and knowing that you have to clear ground, poor footers, run utility, all of these sorts of things. How do you balance those two? I'm just I'm just curious. 
Representative Tipper. Yeah, I think that's a great question. Thank you, Representative. I think that's for the community organizations, for our local law enforcement, for our local governments to figure out. I mean, that's there's part of part of this is the flexibility in the bill. Mm -hmm. So, to the extent that the issue, the particularly the particular issue that that community is dealing with is what you described, I agree. I don't know how you. I think you have to find solutions outside of the environmental changes to address that issue. But really, we're we're not we're not just talking about that. We're talking about, you know, dark street corners, rundown buildings. We're talking about um, areas that are um, that communities are seeing cr a lot of crime in, and that we can make these changes to improve that space. Um, and like I said, the data shows us that, that it reduces the rate of crime significantly. So I don't have a great answer to your question other than that they're tasked with thinking about that and working through that. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the, the question before us is passage of Senate Bill 1. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The aye have it. <laughs> <laughs> Senate Bill 1 passes. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 212. Senate Bill 212 by Senators Lee and Cook, also Representatives Herod and Soper, concerning the non substantive oh, revision of statutes in the Colorado Revised Statutes as amended and in connection therewith, amending or repealing obsolete, imperfect, or inoperative law to preserve the legislative intent, effect, and meaning of the law. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate. House bill. No, Senate bill. Senate bill. Uh, Senate 12. bill 212. Uh, and the Judiciary Committee report. To the Jus Judiciary report. Representative Soper. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So there were actually a couple of minor typos that we added in the Judiciary Committee. One was to correct the website to add the HTTPS. And the other one was. Um, a, a if-then provision, if a House, or sorry, House Bill 22-1242 uh, passes or fails, there's a provision in here uh, so that the statute reads correctly no matter what. Further discussion on the Judiciary Report. Seeing none, all those in favor of passing the Judiciary Report say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The Judiciary Report passes. To the bill, Representative Soper. Thank you, Madam Chair, and it's uh, great to be on another bill with uh, Representative Herod. It's our annual revisers bill. Uh, this is probably one of the best bills of the year if you're a grammar um, aficionado because this fixes uh, the mistakes such as uh, should healthcare be one word or two words, uh, making sure that manufactured home is lowercase rather than capital case. We um, also uh, repealed some obsolete provisions, such as the reference to the regulation of private investigators, uh, made sure that references to federal law are actually cor correct, and that the dates in Senate Bill 21250 are actually the correct dates that um, were actually talked about here in the legislature, and uh, then made sure that typos were cleaned up. would ask for a yes vote. Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. And I want to just call members' attention to making sure if they write bills that the URLs are correct, Representative Tipper. Uh, the URLs are correct in your Ooh. bill so the reviser doesn't have to go back and fix them. Um, but in all, in all seriousness, I just want to... <laughs> I just want to thank the staff at Legal Services, especially Ms. Gilroy, for all her work uh, on this revisor's bill and what she does for the state of Colorado. I ask for an I vote. Further discussion on Senate Bill 212. Seeing none, the question before us is passage of Senate Bill 212. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 212 passes. Mr. Shebel, please read the title of Senate Bill 144. Senate Bill 144 by Senator Zenzinger, also Representatives Kip and Rich, concerning the provision of transportation services by a transportation network company not in connection with a business operated for profit. Uh, Representative Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. I move Senate Bill 22-144 and the committee report. To the committee report. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. We uh, made a number of changes through um, this process over the last month working on the committee report, and we have a few more to make today, and I'm going to um, hold on, hand these amendments over. Um, so I, I move... Hang on um, one second. Is this okay. Representative Kip. 
Thank oh, wait, you. we I don't have it displayed yet. Uh, all right. I move L0. Oh, you need to move the um, amendment, please. I move L012 to the committee report. That is a proper motion to the, to the uh, amendment. So, um, folks, this has been a very challenging bill, frankly, um, and we have worked hard with um, the disability community and with um, many of our other stakeholders to get to a place where I think most people at least find that we're going to make sure that we are keeping people safe as um, their children are being transported. Any further discussion on L012? Seeing none, the question before us is adoption of L012. All those in favor say aye. 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 All those opposed, no. The amendment passes. To the committee report. Any further discussion on the committee report? The question before us is the adoption of the State Civic Military and Veterans Affairs report. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All those opposed, no. The committee report passes. Do you want to, talk about the to the bill. Uh, Representative Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, I want to just uh, talk to you a little bit about Senate Bill 22144. Uh, a recent PUC administrative decision indicated that any service a transportation network company provides. Members, excuse me, uh, Representative Rich, it's getting a little loud and I can't hear the people in the well, so please bring it down. Thank you, Representative Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. Oh, let's see. <laughs> I want to tell you why this, uh, this bill matters. All TNCs in Colorado perform some form of public benefit service, including through contracts with nonprofit organizations, school districts, and other governmental entities. And without Senate Bill 144, these critical services fall into a regulatory no man's land. Senate Bill 22144 simply clarifies that TNCs can provide service under contract with tax exempt entities and political subdivisions per existing. Public Utility Commission regulatory authority. This maintains the status quo and allows TNCs to continue providing critical public benefit services. I ask for an I vote. Representative Kip. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. So, folks, um, back in 2014, when these um, statutes regarding transportation network companies, think companies like Uber and Lyft, et cetera, were developed, um, there was um, an exemption written into the law saying that political subdivisions and nonprofits, and also in another part of statute, school districts could not um, be regulated, and um, the TNCs could not be regulated um, when they had contracts with those folks. But because of this recent administration, stuff happens, right? And sometimes people don't always remember that a law is there and get it followed. So these contracts have been happening, stuff has been going on, children are getting transported, and what we're doing in this bill, because of the administrative law judge decision, we need to ensure that these services can be continued so that people, young people, old people, and everybody in in the middle who have contracts again with nonprofits or political subdivisions can continue receiving those services. That's why it's important to do this. We've worked a lot on this bill to establish a safety floor to make sure that people will be safe when they are, um, are transported. So I would ask for an I vote on this bill. Further discussion, Representative Froelich. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, bill sponsors who have uh, really endeavored on this bill to put in some safety safeguards. The main problem is the administrative judge agreed, and I philosophically believe that when you're transporting students to and from school using school money, that that should be regulated by the school. That's a school determination. So thank you for putting in these safety um, provisions, which outline the real fears of folks, especially when we consider the people who are being talked about being transported are some of our most vulnerable youth. 
So it's foster youth. Um, they've talked about uh, transporting children with disabilities. Um, and so the amendment had to specify that the folks driving people had to pass a criminal background check. They had to specify that they couldn't have a previous conviction of sex crimes. All of that should be properly regulated by a school, and it's the school's responsibility to transport its students. I understand we're in a terrible situation where we don't have enough bus drivers and these folks do not have transportation, but that doesn't mean we privatize that and put these most vulnerable people into a private contract situation. Um, these companies have assault in other states. Um, I just don't feel comfortable privatizing this aspect of school transportation. Representative Sullivan. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yeah, and I, I'm not going to be able to support this. You see, um, my wife um, has been a special needs uh, bus driver uh, in Cherry Creek for 23 years. Um, she takes a lot of pride um, in, in the service that she performs every single day, um, picking these kids up, um, getting them uh, to school, getting them um, to events and, and all of that, watching um, these, these children grow up. Um, and move on to transition um, schools and, and and all of that kind of uh, of stuff and um, there's in 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 this I, I believe that there's there's enough drivers so I, this is what's been happening and we see that a lot and course a labor guy is going to tell you it's not the workers fault um, we need better management we, we need better management to schedule these people because we've got um, you know some of these special needs buses um, that are going around where they have space for four kids and they're just taking one um, and and they're there I mean they can do this stuff we used to be able to schedule you know how to pick somebody up and how to drop somebody off um, and we still should be able to do that um, so I'm just not going to be able to support this. Um, we shouldn't be privatizing, um, you know, our most uh, vulnerable students. Um, we should have, um, you know, people uh, in the school district um, who have gone through all of the proper vetting um, that we as um, parents um, and citizens of the state of Colorado ask for. Thank you. Representative Kipp. Um, thank you, Madam Chair, and I certainly respect the opinions of my colleagues here. Um, I just want to say a few things. Um, first of all, the administrative law judge decision was based on what's in statute now. As we all know, we are the people who make the statute, and statute can change. Um, so that is what we are doing here. Um, I understand there there are... So what happens is like these... Um, TNCs can have a contract with a school district. I understand that's the most contentious part of this bill, really. And really, I think the main um, difference of opinion now is whether these um, TNCs that do this school district-based transportation should be regulated under the PUC or under the Colorado Department of Education. Ultimately, what we determined was it would be very confusing for the people who are making those trips to be regulated by multiple companies or multiple um, divisions and have different rules here and different rules there. So what we did instead is we have everybody being regulated through the PUC, but we set a floor. We are telling them they must coordinate with the Colorado Department of Education when um, making all of the rules that are surrounding this. We will have emergency rules in place by the beginning of September under this bill. And I think we've done a really good job of, um, you know, w w walking the line here. So happy to chat more with anybody about this. Representative Ortiz. I do want to start off by commending and thanking the bill sponsor for working with the community that lives with a disability. So I do want to give you credit there. I still have concerns with the bill. Um, it's no secret that we in the disabled community have had issues with Uber, Lyft, and other TNCs like that. I, I'm just going to have a hard time getting over concerns um, when I am not convinced that they're going to be held by the same standards when it comes to serving the community with a disability. We're already kind of an afterthought, uh, even more so with private entities. 
And so uh, although there were amendments brought forward uh, that do make us feel more comfortable with the bill, I'm just not sure if I'm there yet. Because then I feel like I'm going to have to come back and now try and regulate TNCs, which I don't want to have to do. I would like them to try and serve the community with a disability on their own. But now that they're going to be taking students uh, to school, I feel like that's something else that I'm going to have to tend to. So I do appreciate the work by the bill sponsor. I'm just not sure I'm there yet. Minority Leader McKean. Madam Chair, thank you very much. And Rep. Kep and Rep. Rich, thank you very much for bringing this bill. So, so, you know, we have tried a whole bunch of different things with TNCs to try to help different groups. You know, non-emergency medical transport. Um, we, had, we had dialysis patients being left at clinics because we couldn't get some of the contracted providers there. And so opening this up, is, is one of the more remarkable features of this bill, of making available this, this type of service to a lot more people. I, I bring up Colton Elijah Parks up in this, this well a lot. My little friend Colton almost has to have his own bus because his distance to school is such that when he gets on the bus, he has to get to school and get home in a certain amount of time. And that means that, that maybe one driver, one bus is the only one that can serve him, even though there might be two or three other kids that go to schools nearby who could be served by a service like this at far, greater, far less cost and, and a greater convenience to parents and families. So this is, this is a remarkably good solution. I thank you both for bringing it. And, and truly, I think this is something to support. And thank you for your amendments as well. Representative Larson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and thank you uh, both bill sponsors, Representative Kip, Representative Rich, for bringing this. I just wanted to come up and lend my voice uh, to, in support of this bill. Uh, and, and to some of the folks that have come up and spoken in opposition, I hear you. Um, you know, if we were in a situation where we had districts that had drivers that were willing to drive these routes and where they had you know, the capital and the buses in their fleets to provide these services, I think this would be a very different conversation. But unfortunately, uh, long-term trends that have indeed been exacerbated over the last two years give us a very different picture here. And indeed, TNCs have become a necessary part of the transportation landscape when it comes to getting kids to school, particularly kids with disabilities and kids who need to go to a, a school that maybe might not be their neighborhood school. And this is an innovative uh, solution to it. This is, frankly, putting another tool in the toolbox to ensure that our kids can get to the school, get the education that they're entitled to. Uh, and I think it's been very thoughtful in including safety mechanisms, taking into account the very real concerns when we're dealing with our, our most vulnerable and most precious uh, individuals in this state. But I think the sponsors have done a great job of that. They've heard it. They've addressed those concerns. They've brought that in. This is not going to be the Wild West. And I think this is a very well-crafted bill, and I would just encourage you all to support it and, and really think about what the real situation is on the ground, not what we'd like it to be, but in reality, what we can accomplish and whether this is going to actually make the situation better or if it's going to make it worse. So thank you. Representative Kip. Um, thank you, members. You know, I, I understand that there are problems um, that people have with transportation network companies. And, you know, we cannot fix all of the problems that people have with those companies under those bills. That's another bill for another day. Today, we are trying to preserve the transportation that, for instance, foster youth from out of district have from getting to their school. Um, counties use this for transporting older people and for youth. So there are legitimate um, reasons that these pieces of part, transportation is being, types of transportation are being used, and we just can't leave people without transportation. That's not to say there aren't other problems to be solved, but those are problems for another day. Representative Rich. Thank you, Madam Chair. And uh, I, you know, Representative Kip really couldn't have said it any better than I could. Uh, but I want to tell you that this bill will accomplish important objectives. It ensures these TNCs can continue to provide, continue to provide, these critical public benefit services just as they have been. It ensures these services continue to be regulated by the PUC and not fall into the regulatory void. It maintains local control 
by ensuring counties and other municipal, municipal organizations can continue to choose the service providers that are best suited to meet the needs of their communities. This is a good bill. I ask for an I vote. Is there further discussion? Representative Bradfield. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, we heard this bill in committee. I was reluctant. I didn't think it was uh, something that which, uh, we needed to legislate, but I now understand the reasoning behind it. And um, I, I know that there are needs for parents who have children that need to go to schools that are not a block and two away, and they have work. And let's make, if we need to make something easier for people, this is something that can be done. Um, it's regulated, it's got rules, and people have to meet standards. Uh, uh, let's not make it too difficult so that we make it so difficult that nobody will help, uh, will, will take these jobs. I urge an I vote on this bill. Is there further discussion? Seeing none, the question before us is the passage of Senate Bill 144. All those in favor say aye. aye. All those opposed, no? no. The ayes have it. Senate Bill 144 passes. Madam Majority Leader. Thank you, Madam Chairman. The committee rise and report. Seeing no discussion, the committee will rise and report. House will come to order. Mr. She will please read the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Speaker, your Committee of the Whole begs leave to report as under consideration the following touch bills being the second reading thereof and making the following recommendations thereon. House Bill 1119 as amended, 1131 as amended, 1149 as amended, 1205 as amended, 1327 as amended, 1367 as amended, 1369 as amended, 1380 as amended, 1387 as amended, 1394 as amended, passed on second reading and ordered in gross and placed on the calendar for third and final passage. Senate Bill 1 is amended, Senate Bill 2 is amended, 28 is amended, 55, 57, 144 is amended, 147, 212 is amended. Pass on second reading in order to revise and place on the calendar for third reading and final passage. Representative McCormick.
Very good. That is a proper motion. Members, we do have amendments at the desk. They are on different bills, and so I will go in alphabetical order by sponsor, but I will call out the bill number. So, Mr. Sheeble, please read the Carver Amendment, which is L031 to House Bill 1131 to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Representative Carver moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee in not adopting the following Carver Amendment L31 to House Bill 1131 to show that said amendment passed and that House Bill 1131 is amended passed. Representative Carver. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the Carver Amendment to the Committee of the Whole. It has been properly moved and displayed to the amendment, Representative Carver. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. This amendment would um, require that alternatives, as we're looking at alternatives to uh, juvenile justice, um, current jurisdiction over crimes committed by 10, 11, and 12-year-olds, that that be placed within the CCJJ, where we have historically analyzed these issues. Uh, and again, CCJJ um, typically with their work groups invite uh, other participants, non-members, people with expertise and perspectives to be an active part of the work group and it follows the CCJJ process of bringing those legislative recommendations back to the full assembly. It is an established process. Ask for an I vote. Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Members, I um, just want to implore upon you to vote no on this cow amendment. And for the reasons that we talked about during debate, and I realize that some people were not in here when we talked specifically about why this is not going under CCJJ and is most appropriately suited to go under the, uh, the State Department of Human Services. Not only because the counties believe that, because the counties are the ones that are going to be serving these children, not the DAs. Because we know that that is who is asking for this. And I will say that the CCJJ Yes, it has a comprehensive body of folks, but as I have said in, during debate, we uh, provided everyone with a very nice uh, infographic showing who would sit on, uh, who currently sits on CCJJ, which includes myself and other members of this body, and who would be on our CDHS task force. And when you look at those differences, I want to point out a few things. There are treatment providers on the CDHS task force, treatment providers that work with youth, that understand youth development. Schools, schools are not part of CCJJ. Restorative justice partners. We do have law enforcement also part of this, recognizing that we need to have that balance. Judicial. We have probation officers that work with youth. We have community members, and we have our state and county representatives, as well as elected officials. Yes, it is true that members can be brought in onto CCJJ. However, when it comes back to the whole body of CCJJ, I will tell you there are three members of CCJJ that have expertise as it relates to youth, and I am one of them. Therefore, I do not see it being the appropriate place where there can be discussions around how we serve these children, and we're talking about children, outside of the juvenile justice system. We cannot have that go into the hands of folks that are working on criminal justice and juvenile justice matters. We need this to be looked at by people that know how to serve these children and to look at how to serve them outside of the juvenile justice system. I ask for a no on this cow. Assistant Minority Leader Geithner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just a question for the sponsor. I know that it was just asserted uh, that the counties have requested this, but I'm just wondering if you could speak to uh, the position of CCI, Colorado Counties Incorporated. 
Assistant Majority Leader Gonzalez Gutierrez. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank you, uh, Mr. Minority, uh, Assistant Minority Leader. I will say that we are still in conversations with CCI. What I will say is that as we were, before making this strike below that we made during the cow, CCI has been, to my knowledge, what they, has been told to me is that they wanted this to live under CDHS. And if people are being told different, then I have grave concerns of the information that was communicated to me. Assistant Minority Leader Geithner. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. And just for members in the, in the um, chamber, currently on Secretary of State's website does say the Colorado Counties Incorporated is opposing. Representative Bacon. Representative Bacon. Thank you. I just want to point out we are on the amendment, um, not talking about the bill, not talking about the past bill. We have brought a strike below amendment. We are now voting on an amendment brought to the strike below. I hope we can focus on that. It is under the purview of the sponsors to be able to address how they would like these things to move forward. And we have decided and said that we would like to, it to be under behavioral health and not CCJJ. And that is what we're asking for support on. So we hope that you vote no on this amendment. See no further discussion. The question before us is the adoption of the Carver Amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. She will please open the machine and members please proceed to vote. <clears throat> Representative Gray. No. Representative Gray votes no. Please close the machine. With 29 I votes, 35 no votes, and one excuse, the cover amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole is lost. We will move to the luck amendments. There's three of them. Uh, Mr. Schiebel, please read the uh, title, or please read the first luck amendment, which is L005 to House Bill 1367 to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Representative Luck moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee and not adopting the following Luck Amendment L5 to House Bill 1367 to show that said amendment passed and that House Bill 1367 as amended passed. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. So as we discussed during the committee meeting, this set, series of amendments just help to provide some procedural safeguards for the respondent in these matters. Because once again, we're not talking about a business anymore. We're talking about an individual mom who might put an ad out on a social media platform for a babysitter or for someone to provide home care or someone to provide gardening services. And so what this does is it helps to um, alert folks to how the commission has ruled in the past so that they might be able to know what behavior is appropriate under this provision and what behavior is not appropriate. I ask for an I, um, an I vote, but I don't think I actually moved it, did I? Oh, yeah. Thanks, Representative Luck. Go ahead. So, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move um, the first Luck Amendment to the Committee of the Whole and ask for a favorable vote. Thank you. It has been properly moved and displayed, Representative Lantin. Uh, thank you, members, um, and i asking for a no vote. Um, I just saw this language today, um, haven't had a chance, because I've been here all day, um, to visit with my um, stakeholders on this idea, and so I would ask again for a no vote. Thank you. Is there any further discussion on the first look amendment to the report of the community of the whole? Seeing none, Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine, and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Gray, how do you vote? No. Nope. Representative Gray votes no. Please close the machine. With 24 I votes, 40 no votes, and one excuse, the first luck amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole is lost. Mr. Sheeble, please read the second luck amendment, L003 to House Bill 1367 to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Representative Luck moves to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the Committee and not adopting the following luck amendment, L3 to House Bill 1367, show that said amendment passed and that House Bill 1367 has amended passed. Representative Luck. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Again, this is just a protection. So what this would do is allow for the prevailing party to receive costs back. So under the current statute, only the plaintiff can receive costs back if they, if they prevail in the matter. Under this, both parties could could receive their attorney's fees um, back from the other party. And it was noted during the committee meeting that this is already covered by friv frivolous claim language at the, at the bottom, which is in current statute, but not all claims that are brought are frivolous, right? The, the respondent could indeed be the prevailing party of a just complaint. And again, we're talking about individual folks. We're not talking about those in the business community, which is what this statute was initially created for. It was for businesses that have structure that have the the insurance and have all of those other pieces that can help to offset those costs here we're talking about your neighbor and so i think that it's only fair that if they prevail in these cases that they can get that cost back and so i move the second luck amendment to the committee of the whole and ask for a favorable record or favorable vote thank you that has been properly moved and displayed representative wanteen uh <clears throat> excuse me thank you mr speaker um so this amendment would be detrimental to um, a claimant um, where they could face bankruptcy if they don't prevail, and it would also um, possibly prevent um, the pursuit of justice and uh, put a dampering effect on people bringing claims. And so I ask for a no vote. Thank you. Seeing so, you no know, further discussion on the question before us is the adoption of the second luck amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. She will please open the machine and members please proceed to vote. Representative Gray, how do you vote? No. Representative Gray votes no. Please close the machine. With 24 aye votes, 40 no votes, and one excuse, the second luck amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole is lost. Mr. Sheeble, please read the third luck amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole, which is L006, the House Bill 1367. Representative Luck moved to amend the report of the Committee of the Whole to reverse the action taken by the committee to not adopting the following Luck Amendment L6 to House Bill 1367 to show that said amendment passed and that House Bill 1367 as amended passed. Representative Luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move the third Luck Amendment to the Committee of the Whole and ask for an aye vote. Um, this would allow for the respondent to bring it directly to court as opposed to going through the commission process, this would enable them to a jury trial because um, that is an important consideration when facing these types of matters. Um, I know that they do have the right once the commission has already gone through all of that process to then appeal it into the court system. However, uh, there is a variety of, of costs that are associated with doing that. And so if they would like to just go directly to the court, I think that that option should be available to them in the same way that it is available to the one making the claim. Again, we're talking about two individuals, right? Two equally positioned individuals. We're not talking about an individual facing some business entity. These are two, two of your neighbors that are in the midst of a dispute. And so I think that it's only fair to treat them equitably. Thank you. It has been properly moved and displayed, or is it on team? Um, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I uh, asked for a no vote on this as well. Um, I'm a little confused by some of the statements just made because a jury trial is the more expensive option. Um, one of the reasons for the CCRD is to make this a process that's more affordable and accessible to those who have... Um, who have a, a complaint to bring forward and to go through a mediation process um, and through the administrative process, which is more affordable to those who can't afford an attorney. And if they are not able to resolve that, as was pointed out, they can, can appeal and, and go ask for a jury trial then. But to claim that this is this money saving to go straight to jury trial is strange to me, honestly. So I ask for a no vote. Representative Neville. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Well, I ask for a yes vote. <laughs> Anybody, any further discussion? Seeing none. Question before us is the adoption of the third luck amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Sheeble, please open the machine and members please proceed to vote. 
Representative Gray, how do you vote? No. Representative Gray votes no. Please close the machine. With 27 aye votes, 37 no votes, and one excuse, the third look amendment to the report of the Committee of the Whole is lost. That brings us to the report of the Committee of the Whole. The question before us is the adoption of the report of the Committee of the Whole. Mr. Shebel, please open the machine, and members, please proceed to vote. Representative Gray, how do you vote? Yes. Representative Gray votes yes. Please close the machine. The 40 aye votes, 24 no votes, and one excuse, the report of the Committee of the Whole is adopted. Majority Leader Escar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move to lay over the balance of the calendar until tomorrow, April 28th. We'll come back and do this all over. See no objection. The balance of the calendar will be laid over until Thursday, April 28th. Brings us to announcements and introductions. I have one quick, quick one. Representative Tipper will replace Representative Woodrow and State Civic Military and Veterans Affairs Committee for today only. Representative Kennedy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Speaking of the State Civic Military and Veterans Affairs Committee, it's now 3.05. Please be there by 3.15, LSBA. Thank you. Representative Lantine. So, um, members of the Health and Insurance Committee, um, since we are just literally across the hall in the old state library, I'll give you 10 minutes to get there. So, 3.15 also. That'll give you time for a potty break. Representative Roberts. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Business Affairs and Labor Committee, same thing downstairs at 3.15. See you there. Representative McLaughlin. Guess what? Education, 315. Yay. <laughs> Representative Herod. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Members of the Appropriations Committee, we will meet tomorrow. If you have a bill up, um, it is tomorrow at 8.30. Not 8 o'clock, not 8.15, 8.30. See you there. See no further, see no further announcements or protections. That's fine. That's fine. I did ask him to do it. Represent uh, Majority Leader Esco. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move that we find both you and the Assistant Minority Leader. How about if we do it again? What? If we do it again, I'll issue fines, but. I'm not your mother. I move the House Standard Recess until later today. I didn't even hear it. I didn't even hear it. Uh, uh, I find the Majority Leader, I find the Majority Leader $5. <laughs> See no objection, the House will stay in recess till later today. <laughs> <laughs>